The Robots of Dawn by Isaac Asimov, narrated by William DeFries. Chapter 13 Amadiro 52 Bailey got back to business with a somewhat deeper baritone to his voice than was usual. He said, Mr. Gramionis, you mentioned the name of the head of the Robotics Institute earlier. Could you give me that name again? Keldon Amadiro. And would there be some way of reaching him from here? Gramionis said, Well, yes and no. You can reach his receptionist or his assistant. I doubt that you'll reach him. He's a rather standoffish person, I'm told. I don't know him personally, of course. I've seen him now and then, but I've never talked to him. I take it then he doesn't use you as a clothes designer or for personal grooming. I don't know that he uses anyone, and from the few occasions when I've seen him, I can tell you he looks it, though I'd rather you didn't repeat that remark. I'm sure you're right, but I'll keep the confidence, said Bailey gravely. I would like to try to reach him, despite his standoffish reputation. If you have a trimensic outlet, would you mind my making use of it for that purpose? Brindish can make the call for you. No, I think my partner, Daniil, should. That is, if you don't mind. I don't mind at all, said Gramionis. The outlet is in there, so just follow me, Daniil. The pattern you must use is 7530UP20. Daniil bowed his head. Thank you, sir. The room with the trimensic outlet was quite empty, except for a thin pillar toward one side of the room. It ended waist-high in a flat surface on which there was a rather complicated console. The pillar stood in the center of a circle marked off on the light green floor in a neutral gray. Near it was an identical circle in size and color, but on the second one there stood no pillar. Daniil stepped to the pillar, and as he did so, the circle on which it stood glowed with a faint white radiance. His hand moved over the console, his fingers flicking too quickly for Bailey to make out clearly what it was they did. It only took a second, and then the other circle glowed in precisely the same way. A robot appeared on it, three-dimensional in appearance, but with a very faint flicker that gave away the fact that it was a holographic image. Next to him was a console like that next to which Daniil stood, but the robot's console also flickered and was also an image. Daniil said, I am R. Daniil Oliva. He faintly emphasized the R so the robot would not mistake him for a human being. And I represent my partner Elijah Bailey, a plain clothesman from Earth. My partner would like to speak with Master Roboticist Keldon Amadiro. The robot said, Master Roboticist Amadero is in conference. Would it be sufficient to speak to Roboticist Sisis? Daniil looked quickly in Bailey's direction. Bailey nodded, and Daniil said, That will be quite satisfactory. The robot said, If you will ask plainclothesman Bailey to take your place, I will try to locate Roboticist Sisis. Daniil said smoothly, It would perhaps be better if you were first to... But Bailey called out, it's all right, Daniil. I don't mind waiting. Daniil said, Partner Elijah, as the personal representative of Master Roboticist Han Fastolf, you have assimilated his social status, at least temporarily. It is not your place to have to wait for... It's all right, Daniil, said Bailey, with enough emphasis to preclude further discussion. I don't wish to create delay by a dispute over social etiquette. Daniil stepped off the circle, and Bailey stepped on. He felt a slight tingle as he did so, perhaps a purely imaginary one, but it quickly passed. The robot's image, standing on the other side, faded and disappeared. Bailey waited patiently, and eventually another image darkened and took on apparent three-dimensionality. Roboticist Maloon Sisis here said the figure in a rather sharp, clear voice. He had the close-cut bronze hair that alone sufficed to give him what Bailey thought of as a typical spacer look, though there was a certain unspacer-like asymmetry to the line of his nose. Bailey said quietly, I am playing clothesman Elijah Bailey from Earth. I would like to speak with Master Roboticist Keldon Amadiro. Do you have an appointment, playing clothesman? No, sir. You will have to make one if you wish to see him, and there's no time slot available for this week or next. 
I am plain clothesman Elijah Bailey of Earth, so I have been given to understand. It doesn't alter the facts. Bailey said, At the request of Dr. Han Fastolf and with the permission of the World Legislature of Aurora, I am investigating the murder of robot Gender Pennell. The murder of robot Gender Pennell? asked Sises so politely as to indicate contempt. Roboticide, if you prefer, then. On Earth, the destruction of a robot would not be so great a matter, but on Aurora, where robots are treated more or less as human beings, it seemed to me that the word murder might be used. Sises said, Nevertheless, whether murder, roboticide, or nothing at all, it is still impossible to see Master Roboticist Amadero. May I leave a message for him? You may. Will it be delivered to him instantly, now? I can try, but obviously I can make no guarantee. Good enough. I will make several points, and I will number them. Perhaps you would like to make notes. Sises smiled faintly. I think I will be able to remember. First, where there is a murder, there is a murderer, and I would like to give Dr. Amadero a chance to speak in his own defense. What? said Sises. And Gramionis, watching from the other side of the room, let his jaw drop. Bailey managed to imitate the faint smile that had suddenly disappeared from the other's lips. Am I too fast for you, sir? Would you like to make notes after all? Are you accusing the master roboticist of having had anything to do with this gender Pennell business? On the contrary, roboticist. It is because I don't want to accuse him that I must see him. I would hate to imply any connection between the master roboticist and the immobilized robot on the basis of incomplete information, when a word from him might make everything clear. You are mad. Very well. Then tell the master roboticist that a madman wants a word with him in order to avoid accusing him of murder. That's my first point. I have a second. Could you tell him that the same madman has just completed a detailed interrogation of personnel artist Santirix Gramionis and is calling from Gramionis's establishment? And the third point, am I going too fast for you? No, finish. The third point is this. It may be that the master roboticist, who surely has a great deal on his mind that is of much moment, does not remember who personnel artist Santirix Gramionis is. In that case, please identify him as someone living on the Institute grounds who has, in the last year, taken many long walks with Gladia, a woman from Solaria who now lives on Aurora. I cannot deliver a message so ridiculous and offensive, Earthman. In that case, would you tell him I will go straight to the legislature and I will announce that I cannot continue with my investigation because one Maloon Sisis takes it upon himself to assure me that Master Roboticist Keldon Amadero will not assist me in the investigation of the destruction of robot Gender Pennell and will not defend himself against accusations of being responsible for that destruction. Sisis reddened. You wouldn't dare say anything of the sort, wouldn't I? What would I have to lose? On the other hand, how will it sound to the general public? After all, Aurorans are perfectly aware that Dr. Amadero is second only to Dr. Fastolf himself in expertise in robotics, and that, if Fastolf himself is not responsible for the roboticide, uh, is it necessary to continue? You will find, Earthman, that the laws of Aurora against slander are strict, undoubtedly. But if Dr. Amadero is effectively slandered, his punishment is likely to be greater than mine. But why don't you simply deliver my message now? Then if he explains just a few minor points, we can avoid all questions of slander or accusation or anything of the sort. Sises scowled and said stiffly, I will tell Dr. Amadero this, and I will strongly advise him to refuse to see you. He disappeared. Again, Bailey waited patiently, while Gramionis gestured fiercely and said in a loud whisper, You can't do that, Bailey! You can't do it! Bailey waved him quiet. After some five minutes, it seemed much longer to Bailey, Sisis reappeared, looking enormously angry. He said, Dr. Amadero will take my place here in a few minutes and will talk to you. Wait! And Bailey said at once, There is no point in waiting. I will come directly to Dr. Amadero's office, and I will see him there. He stepped off the gray circle and made a cutting gesture to Daniil, who promptly broke the connection. 
Gramionis said with a kind of strangled gasp. You can't talk to Dr. Amadero's people that way, Earthman. I just have, said Bailey. He'll have you thrown off the planet within twelve hours. If I don't make progress in straightening out this mess, I may in any case be thrown off the planet within twelve hours. Daniil said, Partner Elijah, I fear that Mr. Gramionis is justified in his alarm. The Auroran World Legislature cannot do more than evict you, since you are not an Auroran citizen. Nevertheless, they can insist that the Earth authorities punish you severely, and Earth will do so. They could not resist an Auroran demand in this case. I would not wish you to be punished in this way, partner Elijah. Bailey said heavily, Nor do I wish the punishment, Daniil, but I must take the chance. Mr. Graminus, I am sorry that I had to tell him I was calling from your establishment. I had to do something to persuade him to see me, and I felt he might attach importance to that fact. What I said was, after all, the truth. Gramionis shook his head. If I had known what you were going to do, Mr. Bailey, I would not have permitted you to call for my establishment. I feel sure that I am going to lose my position here, and, with bitterness, what are you going to do for me that will make up for that? I will do my best, Mr. Gramionis, to see that you do not lose your position. I feel confident that you will be in no trouble. If I fail, however, you are free to describe me as a madman who made wild accusations against you and frightened you with threats of slander so that you had to let me use your viewer. I'm sure Dr. Amadero will believe you. After all, you have already sent him a memo complaining that I have been slandering you, have you not? Bailey lifted his hand in farewell. Goodbye, Mr. Graminus. Thank you again. Don't worry, and remember what I said about Glodaya. With Daniil and Giscard sandwiching him fore and aft, Bailey stepped out of Graminus's establishment, scarcely conscious of the fact that he was moving out into the open once more. 53. Once out in the open, it was a different matter. Bailey stopped and looked up. Odd, he said. I didn't think that that much time had passed, even allowing for the fact that the Auroran day is a little shorter than standard. What is it, partner Elijah? asked Daniil solicitously. Well, the sun has set. I wouldn't have thought it. The sun has not yet set, sir, put in Giscard. It is about two hours before sunset. Daniil said, It is the gathering storm, partner Elijah. The clouds are thickening, but the storm will not actually break for some time yet. Bailey shivered. Dark, in itself, did not disturb him. In fact, when outside, night, with its suggestion of enclosing walls, was far more soothing than the day, which broadened the horizons and opened space in every direction. The trouble was that this was neither day nor night. Again he tried to remember what it had been like that time it had rained when he had been outside. It suddenly occurred to him that he had never been out when it snowed, and that he wasn't even sure what the rain of crystalline solid water was like. Descriptions and words were surely insufficient. The younger ones sometimes went out to go sliding or sledding, or whatever, and returned shrieking with excitement, but always glad to get within the city walls. Ben had once tried to make a pair of skis, according to directions in some ancient book or other, and had gotten himself half buried in a drift of the white stuff. And even Ben's descriptions of what it was like to see and feel snow were distressingly vague and unsatisfying. Then, too, no one went out when it was actually snowing, as opposed to having the material merely lying about on the ground. Bailey told himself at this point, that the one thing everyone agreed on was that it only snowed when it was very cold. It was not very cold now, it was merely cool. Those clouds did not mean it was going to snow. Somehow, he felt only minimally consoled. This was not like the cloudy days on Earth, which he had seen. On Earth, the clouds were lighter, he was sure of that. They were grayish-white, even when they covered the sky solidly. Here, the light, what there was of it, was rather bilious, a ghastly yellowish slate. 
was that because Aurora's sun was more orange than Earth's was? He said, Is the color of the sky unusual? Daniil looked up at the sky. No, partner Elijah, it is a storm. Do you often have storms like this? At this time of year, yes. Occasional thunderstorms. This is no surprise. It was predicted in the weather forecast yesterday and again this morning. It will be over well before daybreak, and the fields can use the water. We've been a bit subnormal in rainfall lately. And it gets this cold, too? Is that normal, too? Oh, yes. But let us get into the airfoil, partner Elijah. It can be heated. Bailey nodded and walked toward the airfoil, which lay on the grassy plot where it had been brought to rest before lunch. He paused. Wait, I did not ask Reminus for directions to Amadero's establishment or office. No need, partner Elijah, said Daniil immediately, his hand in the crook of Bailey's elbow, propelling him gently but unmistakably onward. Friend Giscard has the map of the Institute clearly in his memory banks, and he will take us to the administration building. It is very likely that Dr. Amadero has his office there. Giscard said, My information is to the effect that Dr. Amadero's office is in the administration building. If by some chance he is not at his office, but is in his establishment, that is nearby. Again Bailey found himself crammed into the front seat between the two robots. He welcomed Daniil particularly with his human-like body warmth. Although Giscard's textile-like outermost layer was insulating and not as cold to the touch as bare metal would have been, he was the less attractive of the two in Bailey's current chilly state. Bailey caught himself on the verge of putting an arm around Daniil's shoulder with the intention of finding comfort by drawing him even closer. He brought his arm down to his lap in confusion. He said, I don't like the way it looks out there. Daniil, perhaps in an effort to take Bailey's mind off the appearance outside, said, Partner Elijah, how is it you knew that Dr. Vasilia had encouraged Mr. Gromionis's interest in Miss Glodaya? I did not see that you had received any evidence to that effect. I didn't, said Bailey. I've been desperate enough to play long shots, that is, to gamble on events of low probability. Glodaya told me that Gromionis was the one person sufficiently interested in her to offer himself repeatedly. I thought he might have killed Jander out of jealousy. I didn't think he could possibly know enough about robotics to do it, but then I heard that Fastolf's daughter Vasilia was a roboticist and resembled Glodaya physically. I wondered if Gromionis, having been fascinated by Glodaya, might not have been fascinated by Vasilia earlier, and if the killing might possibly have been the result of a conspiracy between the two. It was by hinting obscurely at the existence of such a conspiracy that I was able to persuade Vasilia to see me. Daniil said, But there was no conspiracy, partner Elijah, at least as far as the destruction of Jander was concerned. Vasilia and Gramionis could not have engineered that destruction even if they had worked together. Granted, and yet Vasilia had been made nervous by the suggestion of having had a connection with Gramionis. Why? When Gramionis told us of having been attracted to Vasilia first and then to Gladaya, I wondered if the connection between the two had been more indirect, if Vasilia might have encouraged the transfer for some reason more distantly connected, but connected nevertheless to Jander's death. After all, there had to be some connection between the two. Vasilia's reaction to the original suggestion showed that. My suspicion was correct. Vasilia had engineered Grominus's switch from one woman to the other. Grominus was astonished at my knowing this, and that too was useful, for if the matter were something completely innocent, there would have been no reason to make a secret of it. And a secret it obviously was. You remember that Vasilia mentioned nothing of urging Grominus to turn to Gladaya. When I told her that Grominus had offered himself to Gladaya, she acted as though that was the first time she had heard of it. But, partner Elijah, of what importance is this? We may find out. It seemed to me that there was no importance in it to either Grominus or Vasilia. Therefore, if it had any importance at all, it might be that a third person was involved. 
If it had anything to do with the gender affair, then it ought to be a roboticist still more skillful than Vasilia, and that might be Amadiro. So I hinted to him of the existence of a conspiracy by deliberately pointing out I had been questioning Grimianus and was calling from his establishment. And that worked, too. Yet I still don't know what it all means, partner Elijah. Nor I, except for some speculations. But perhaps we'll find out at Amadiro's. Our situation is so bad, you see, we have nothing to lose by guessing and gambling. During this exchange, the airfoil had risen on its air jets and had moved to a moderate height. It cleared a line of bushes and was now once again speeding along over grassy areas and graveled roads. Bailey noticed that where the grass was taller, it was swept to one side by the wind as though an invisible and much larger airfoil were passing over it. Bailey said, Giscard, you have been recording the conversations which have taken place in your presence, haven't you? Yes, sir. And you can reproduce them at need? Yes, sir. And you can easily locate and reproduce some particular statements made by some given person? Yes, sir. You would not have to listen to the entire recording. And could you, at need, serve as a witness in a courtroom? Aye, sir. No, sir. Giscard's eyes were fixed firmly on the road. Since a robot can be directed to lie by a skillful enough command, and not all the exhortations or threats of a judge might help, the law wisely considers a robot an incompetent witness. But in that case, of what use are your recordings? That, sir, is a different thing. A recording, once made, cannot be altered on simple command, though it might be erased. Such a recording can, therefore, be admitted as evidence. There are no firm precedents, however, and whether it is or is not admitted depends on the individual case and on the individual judge. Bailey could not tell whether that statement was depressing in itself or whether he was influenced by the unpleasant, livid light that bathed the landscape. He said, Can you see well enough to drive, Giscard? Certainly, sir, but I do not need to. The airfoil is equipped with a computerized radar that would enable it to avoid obstacles on its own, even if I were unaccountably to fail in my task. It was this that was in operation yesterday morning, when we traveled comfortably, though all the windows were all pacified. Partner Elijah, said Daniil, again veering the conversation away from Bailey's uncomfortable awareness of the coming storm. Do you have hope that Dr. Amadiro might indeed be helpful? Giscard brought the airfoil to rest on a wide lawn before a broad but not very high building with an intricately carved façade that was clearly new and yet gave the impression of imitating something quite old. Bailey knew it was the administration building without being told. He said, No, Daniil, I suspect that Amadiro may be far too intelligent to give us the least handle to grasp him by. And if that is so... What do you plan to do next? I don't know, said Bailey, with a grim feeling of deja vu. But I'll try to think of something. 54. When Bailey entered the administration building, his first feeling was one of relief at removing himself from the unnatural lighting outside. The second was one of wry amusement. Here on Aurora, the establishments, the private dwelling places, were all strictly Auroran. He couldn't for a moment, while sitting in Gladiah's living room, or breakfasting in Fastolf's dining room, or talking in Vasilia's workroom, or making use of Grimianus's trimensional viewing device, have thought himself on Earth. All four were distinct from each other, but all fell within a certain genus, widely different from that of the underground apartments on Earth. The administration building, however, breathed officialdom, and that, apparently, transcended ordinary human variety. It did not belong to the same genus as the dwelling places on Aurora, any more than an official building in Bailey's home city resembled an apartment in the dwelling sectors. But the two official buildings on the two worlds of such widely different natures strangely resembled each other. 
This was the first place on Aurora where, for an instant, Bailey might have imagined himself on Earth. Here were the same long, cold, bare corridors, the same lowest common denominator of design and decoration, with every light source designed so as to irritate as few people as possible and to please just as few. There were some touches here that would have been absent on Earth, the occasional suspended pots of plants, for instance, flourishing in the light and outfitted with devices, Bailey guessed, for controlled and automatic watering. That natural touch was absent on Earth, and its presence did not delight him. Might such pots not sometimes fall? Might they not attract insects? Might not the water drip? There were some things missing here, too. On Earth, when one was within a city, there was always the vast, warm hum of people and machinery, even in the most coldly official of administrative structures. It was the busy buzz of brotherhood, to use the phrase popular among Earth's politicians and journalists. Here, on the other hand, it was quiet. Bailey had not particularly noticed the quiet in the establishments he had visited that day and the day before, since everything had seemed so unnatural there that one more oddity escaped his notice. Indeed, he had been more aware of the soft susurration of insect life outside, or of the wind through the vegetation, than of the absence of the steady hum of humanity, another popular phrase. Here, however, where there seemed a touch of earth, the absence of the hum was as disconcerting as was the distinct orange touch to the artificial light, which was far more noticeable against the blank off-white of the walls here than among the busy decoration that marked the Auroran establishments. Bailey's reverie did not last long. They were standing just inside the main entrance, and Daniil had held out his arm to stop the other two. Some thirty seconds passed before Bailey, speaking in an automatic whisper in view of the silence everywhere, said, Why are we waiting? Because it is advisable to do so, partner Elijah, said Daniil. There is a tingle field ahead. A what? A tingle field, partner Elijah. Actually, the name is a euphemism. It stimulates the nerve endings and produces a rather sharp pain. Robots can pass, but human beings cannot. Any breach, of course, whether by human or robot, will set off an alarm. Bailey said, well, How can you tell there's a tingle field? It can be seen, partner Elijah, if you know what to look for. The air seems to twinkle a bit, and the wall beyond that region has a faint greenish tinge as compared to the wall in front of it. I'm not at all sure I see it said Bailey indignantly. What's to prevent me or any innocent outsider from walking into it and experiencing agony? Daniil said, Those who are members of the Institute carry a neutralizing device. Those who are visitors are almost always attended by one or more robots who will surely detect the tingle field. A robot was approaching down the corridor on the other side of the field. The twinkling of the field was more easily noted against the muted smoothness of his metallic surface. He seemed to ignore Giscard, but for a moment he hesitated as he looked from Bailey to Daniil and back. And then, having made a decision, he addressed Bailey. Perhaps, thought Bailey, Daniil looks too human to be human. The robot said, Your name, sir? Bailey said, I am playing clothesman Elijah Bailey from Earth. I am accompanied by two robots of the establishment of Dr. Han Fastolf, Daniil Oliva and Giscard Reventlov. Identification, sir. Giscard's serial number flared out in soft phosphorescence on the left side of his chest. I vouch for the other two, friend, he said. The robot studied the number a moment, as though comparing it with a file in his memory banks. Then he nodded and said, Serial number accepted. You may pass. Daniil and Giscard moved forward at once, but Bailey found himself edging ahead slowly. He put out one arm as a way of testing the coming of pain. Daniil said, 
The field is gone, partner Elijah. It will be restored after we have passed through. Better safe than sorry, thought Bailey, and continued his shuffle till he was well past the point where the barrier of the field might have existed. The robots, showing no sign of impatience or condemnation, waited for Bailey's reluctant steps to catch up with them. They then stepped onto a helical ramp that was only two people wide. The robot was first by himself. Bailey and Daniil stood side by side behind him. Daniil's hand rested lightly but almost possessively on Bailey's elbow, and Giscard brought up the rear. Bailey was conscious of his shoes pointing upward just a bit uncomfortably and felt vaguely that it would be a little tiresome mounting this too steep ramp and having to lean forward in order to avoid a clumsy slip. Either the soles of his shoes or the surface of the ramp, or both, ought to be ridged. In fact, neither was. The robot in the lead said, Mr. Bailey, as though warning of something, and the robot's hand then visibly tightened on the railing that it held. At once, the ramp divided into sections that slid against each other to form steps. Immediately thereafter, the whole ramp began to move upward. It made a complete turn, passing up through the ceiling, a section of which had retracted, and when it came to a halt, they were on what was, presumably, the second floor. The steps disappeared, and the four stepped off. Bailey looked back curiously. I suppose it will service those who want to go down as well, but what if there is a period where more people want to go up than down? It would end up sticking half a kilometer into the sky or into the ground in reverse. That is an up helix, said Daniil in a low voice. There are separate down helices. But it has to get down again, doesn't it? It collapses at the top or the bottom, depending on which we're speaking of, partner Elijah and in periods of non-use, it unwinds, so to speak. This up helix is descending now. Bailey looked back. The smooth surface might be sliding downward, but it showed no irregularity or mark whose motion he could notice. And if someone should want to use it when it has moved up as far as it can, then one must wait for the unwinding, which would take less than a minute. There are ordinary flights of stairs as well, partner Elijah, and most Aurorans are not reluctant to use them. Robots almost always use the stairs. Since you are a visitor, you are being offered the courtesy of the helix. They were walking down a corridor again, toward a door more ornate than the others. They are offering me courtesy then, said Bailey. A hopeful sign. It was perhaps another hopeful sign that an auroran now appeared in the ornate doorway. He was tall, at least eight centimeters taller than Daniil, who was some five centimeters taller than Bailey. The man in the doorway was broad as well, somewhat heavyset, with a round face, a somewhat bulbous nose, curly dark hair, a swarthy complexion, and a smile. It was the smile that was most noticeable. Wide and apparently unforced, it revealed prominent teeth that were white and well-shaped. He said, Ah, it is Mr. Bailey, the famous investigator from Earth, who has come to our little planet to show that I am a dreadful villain. Come in, come in. You are welcome. I am sorry if my able aide, roboticist Maloon Sysis, gave you the impression that I would be unavailable, but... He is a cautious fellow and is a great deal more concerned about my time than I myself am. He stepped to one side as Bailey walked in and tapped him lightly with the flat of his hand on the shoulder blade as he passed. It seemed to be a gesture of friendship of a kind that Bailey had not yet experienced on Aurora. Bailey said cautiously, was he assuming too much, I take it you are Master Roboticist Keldon Amadero? Exactly, exactly. The man who intends to destroy Dr. Hanfastoff as a political force upon this planet. But that, as I hope to persuade you, does not really make me a villain. 
After all, I am not trying to prove that it is Fastolf who is a villain simply because of the foolish vandalism he committed on the structure of his own creation, poor Jander. Let us say only that I will demonstrate that Fastolf is mistaken. He gestured lightly, and the robot who had guided them in stepped forward and into a niche. As the door closed, Amadiro gestured Bailey jovially to a well-upholstered armchair, and with admirable economy indicated with his other arm wall niches for Daniil and Giscard as well. Bailey noticed that Amadiro stared with a moment's hunger at Daniil and that, for that moment, his smile disappeared and a look that was almost predatory appeared on his face. It was gone quickly, and he was smiling again. Bailey was left to wonder if, perhaps, that momentary change of expression was an invention of his own imagination. Amadiro said, since it looks as though we're in for some mildly nasty weather, let's do without the ineffective daylight we are now dubiously blessed with. Somehow, Bailey did not follow exactly what it was that Amadiro did on the control panel of his desk. The windows opacified, and the walls glowed with gentle daylight. Amadiro's smile seemed to broaden. We do not really have much to talk about you and I, Mr. Bailey. I took the precaution of speaking to Mr. Graminus while you were coming here. From what he said, I decided to call Dr. Facilia as well. Apparently, Mr. Bailey, you have more or less accused both of complicity in the destruction of Jander, and, if I can understand the language, you have also accused me. I merely asked questions, Dr. Amadero, as I intend to do now. No doubt. But you are an Earthman, so you are not aware of the enormity of your actions, and I am really sorry that you must nonetheless suffer the consequences of them. You know, perhaps, that Graminus sent me a memo concerning your slander of him. He told me he had, but he misinterpreted my action. It was not slander. Amadiro pursed his lips as though considering the statement. I dare say you are right from your standpoint, Mr. Bailey, but you don't understand the auroran definition of the word. I was forced to send Graminus's memo on to the chairman, and, as a result, it is very likely that you'll be ordered off the planet by tomorrow morning. I regret this, of course, but I fear that your investigation is about to come to an end. Chapter 14 Again, Amadiro. 55. Bailey was taken aback. He did not know what to make of Amadiro, and he had not expected this confusion within himself. Graminus had described him as standoffish. From what Sisis had said, he expected Amadiro to be autocratic. In person, however, Amadiro seemed jovial, outgoing, even friendly. Yet if his words were to be trusted... Amadiro was calmly moving to end the investigation. He was doing it pitilessly, and yet with what seemed to be a commiserating smile. What was he? Automatically, Bailey glanced toward the niches where Giscard and Daniil were standing, the primitive Giscard, of course, without expression, the advanced Daniil, calm and quiet, that Daniil had ever met Amadiro in his short existence was, on the face of it, unlikely. Giscard, on the other hand, in his how many decades of life, might very well have met him. Bailey's lips tightened as he thought he might have asked Giscard in advance what Amadiro might be like. He might, in that case, be now better able to judge how much of this roboticist's present persona was real and how much was cleverly calculated. Why on earth, or off it, Bailey wondered, didn't he use these robotic resources of his more intelligently? Or why didn't Giscard volunteer information? But no, that was unfair. Giscard clearly lacked the capacity for independent activity of that sort. He would yield information on request, Bailey thought, but would produce none on his own initiative. Amadiro followed the brief flicking of Bailey's eyes and said, I'm one against three, I think. As you see, I have none of my robots here in my office, although any number are on instant call, I admit. 
while you have two of Fastolf's robots, the old reliable Giscard and that marvel of design, Daniil. You know them both, I see, said Bailey. By reputation only. I actually see them, I, a roboticist, was about to say, in the flesh. I actually see them physically for the first time now, although I saw Daniil portrayed by an actor in that hyperwave show. Everyone in all the worlds has apparently seen that hyperwave show, said Bailey glumly. It makes my life, as a real and limited individual, difficult. Not with me, said Amadero, his smile broadening. I assure you I did not take your fictional representation with any seriousness whatever. I assumed you were limited in real life, and so you are or you would not have indulged so freely in unwarranted accusations on Aurora. Dr. Amadero, said Bailey, I assure you I was making no formal accusations. I was merely pursuing an investigation and considering possibilities. Oh, don't misunderstand me, said Amadero with sudden earnestness. I don't blame you. I am sure that you were behaving perfectly by Earth standards. It is just that you are up against Auroran standards now. We treasure reputation with unbelievable intensity. If that were so, Dr. Amadero, then haven't you and other globalists been slandering Dr. Fastolf with suspicion to a far greater extent than any small thing I have done? Quite true, agreed Amadero. But I am an eminent Auroran and have a certain influence, while you are an Earthman and have no influence whatever. That is most unfair, I admit, and I deplore it. But that is the way the worlds are. What can we do? Besides, the accusation against Fastolf can be maintained and will be maintained, and slander isn't slander when it is the truth. Your mistake was to make accusations that simply can't be maintained. I'm sure you must admit that neither Mr. Gromionis nor Dr. Vasilia Aliena, nor both together, could possibly have disabled poor gender. I did not formally accuse either. Perhaps not, but you can't hide behind the word formally on Aurora. It's too bad Fastolf didn't warn you of this when he brought you in to take up this investigation, this... As it now is, I'm afraid, ill-fated investigation. Bailey felt the corner of his mouth twitch as he thought that Fastolf might indeed have warned him. He said, Am I to get a hearing in the matter, or is it all settled? Of course you will get a hearing before being condemned. We are not barbarians here on Aurora. The chairman will consider the memo I have sent him, together with my own suggestions in the matter. He will probably consult Fastolf as the other party intimately concerned, and then arrange to meet with all three of us, perhaps tomorrow. Some decision might be reached then, or later, and it would be ratified by the full legislature. All due process of law will be followed, I assure you. The letter of the law will be followed, no doubt, but what if the chairman has already made up his mind— what if nothing I say will be accepted, and what if the legislature simply rubber stamps a foregone decision? Is that possible? Amadiro did not exactly smile at that, but he seemed subtly amused. You are a realist, Mr. Bailey. I am pleased with that. People who dream of justice are so apt to be disappointed, and they are usually such wonderful people that one hates to see that happen. Amadiro's glance fixed itself on Daniil again. A remarkable job, this humaniform robot, he said. It is astonishing how close to his vest Fastolf has kept things. And it is a shame that Jander was lost. There Fastolf did the unforgivable. Dr. Fastolf, sir, denies that he was in any way implicated. Yes, Mr. Bailey, of course he would. Does he say that I am implicated? Or is my implication entirely your own idea? Bailey said deliberately, I have no such idea. I merely wish to question you on the matter. As for Dr. Fastolf, he is not a candidate for one of your accusations of slander. 
He is certain you have had nothing to do with what happened to Jander because he is quite certain you lack the knowledge and capacity to immobilize a humaniform robot. If Bailey hoped to stir things up in that manner, he failed. Amadiro accepted the slur with no loss of good humor and said, In that he is right, Mr. Bailey. Sufficient ability is not to be found in any roboticist, alive or dead, except for Fastolf himself. Isn't that what he says, our modest master of masters? Yes, he does. Then whatever does he say happened to Jander, I wonder? A random event, purely chance. Amadiro laughed. Has he calculated the probability of such a random event? Yes, Master Roboticist. Yet even an extremely unlikely chance might happen, especially if there were incidents that bettered the odds. Such as what? That is what I am hoping to find out. Since you have already arranged to have me thrown off the planet, do you now intend to forestall any questioning of yourself, or may I continue my investigation until such time as my activity in that respect is legally ended? Before you answer, Dr. Amadiro, please consider that the investigation has not as yet been legally ended, and in any hearing that may come up, whether tomorrow or later, I will be able to accuse you of refusing to answer my questions if you should insist on now ending this interview. That might influence the chairman in his decision. It would not, my dear Mr. Bailey. Don't imagine you can in any way interfere with me. However, you may interview me for as long as you wish. I will cooperate fully with you, if only to enjoy the spectacle of the good Fastolf trying uselessly to disentangle himself from his unfortunate deed. I am not extraordinarily vindictive, Mr. Bailey, but the fact that Jander was Fastolf's own creation does not give him the right to destroy it. Bailey said, it is not legally established that this is what he has done, so that what you have just said is, at least potentially, slander. Well, let us put that to one side, therefore, and get on with this interview. I need information. I will ask my questions briefly and directly, and if you answer in the same way, this interview may be completed quickly. No, Mr. Bailey. It is not you who will set the conditions for this interview, said Amadiro. I take it that one or both of your robots is equipped to record our conversation in full? I believe so. I know so. I have a recording device of my own as well. Don't think, my good Mr. Bailey, that you will lead me through a jungle of short answers to something that will serve Fastolf's purpose. I will answer as I choose and make certain I am not misinterpreted. And my own recording will help me make it certain that I am not misinterpreted. Now, for the first time, there was the suggestion of the wolf behind Amadiro's attitude of friendliness. Very well, then. But if your answers are deliberately long-winded and evasive, that, too, will show up in the recording. Obviously. With that understood, uh, may I have a glass of water to begin with? Absolutely. Giscard, will you oblige Mr. Bailey? Giscard was out of his niche at once. There was the inevitable tinkle of ice at the bar at one end of the room, and a tall glass of water was on the desk immediately before Bailey. Bailey said, Thank you, Giscard, and waited for him to move back into his niche. He said, Dr. Amadero, am I correct in considering you the head of the Robotics Institute? Yes, you are. And its founder? Correct. You see, I answer briefly. How long has it been in existence? As a concept, decades. I have been gathering like-minded people for at least 15 years. Permission was obtained from the legislature 12 years ago, building began 9 years ago, and active work began 6 years ago. In its present completed form, the Institute is 2 years old, and there are long-range plans for further expansion eventually. There you have a long answer, sir, but presented reasonably concisely. Why did you find it necessary to set up the Institute? Ah, Mr. Bailey, here you surely expect nothing but a long-winded answer. As you please, sir. At this point, a robot brought in a tray of small sandwiches and still smaller pastries, none of which were familiar to Bailey. 
He tried a sandwich and found it crunchy and not exactly unpleasant, but odd enough for him to finish it only with an effort. He washed it down with what was left of his water. Amadiro watched with a kind of gentle amusement and said, You must understand, Mr. Bailey, that we Aurorans are unusual people. So are spacers generally, but I speak of Aurorans in particular now. We are descended from Earth people something most of us do not willingly think about, but we are self-selected. What does that mean, sir? Earth people have long lived on an increasingly crowded planet and have drawn together into still more crowded cities that finally became the beehives and anthills you call cities with a capital C. What kind of earth people, then, would leave earth and go to other worlds that are empty and hostile, so that they might build new societies from nothing, societies that they could not enjoy in completed form in their own lifetime, trees that would still be saplings when they died, so to speak. Rather unusual people, I suppose. Quite unusual. Specifically, people who are not so dependent on crowds of their fellows as to lack the ability to face emptiness. People who even prefer emptiness, who would like to work on their own and face problems by themselves rather than hide in the herd and share the burden so that their own load is virtually nothing. Individualists, Mr. Bailey, individualists. I see that. And our society is founded on that. Every direction in which the spacer worlds have developed further emphasizes our individuality. We are proudly human on Aurora, rather than being huddled sheep on Earth. Mind you, Mr. Bailey, I use the metaphor not as a way of deriding Earth. It is simply a different society which I find unadmirable, but which you, I suppose, find comforting and ideal. What is this to do with the founding of the Institute, Dr. Amadero? Even proud and healthy individualism has its drawbacks. The greatest minds, working singly, even for centuries, cannot progress rapidly if they refuse to communicate their findings. A naughty puzzle may hold up a scientist for a century when it may be that a colleague has the solution already and is not even aware of the puzzle that it might solve. The Institute is an attempt, in the narrow field of robotics at least, to introduce a certain community of thought. Is it possible that the particular naughty puzzle you are attacking is that of the construction of a humaniform robot? Amadero's eyes twinkled. Yes, that is obvious, isn't it? It was 26 years ago that Fastolf's new mathematical system, which he calls intersectional analysis, made it possible to design humaniform robots, but he kept the system to himself. Years afterward, when all the difficult technical details were worked out, he and Dr. Sarton applied the theory to the design of Deniel. Then Fastolf alone completed Jander. But all of those details were kept secret also. Most roboticists shrugged and felt that this was natural. They could only try individually to work out the details for themselves. I, on the other hand, was struck by the possibility of an institute in which efforts would be pooled. It wasn't easy to persuade other roboticists of the usefulness of the plan or to persuade the legislature to fund it against Fastolf's formidable opposition or to persevere through the years of effort, but here we are. Bailey said, Why was Dr. Fastolf opposed? Ordinary self-love, to begin with. And I have no fault to find with that, you understand. All of us have a very natural self-love. It comes with the territory of individualism. The point is that Fastolf considers himself the greatest roboticist in history, and also considers the humaniform robot his own particular achievement. He doesn't want that achievement duplicated by a group of roboticists individually faceless compared to himself. I imagine he viewed it as a conspiracy of inferiors to dilute and deface his own great victory. You say that was his motive for opposition to begin with. That means there were other motives. What were they? He also objects to the uses to which we plan to put the humaniform robots. What uses are these, Dr. Amadero? 
Now, now, let's not be ingenuous. Surely Dr. Fastolf has told you of the globalist plans for settling the galaxy? That he has, and for that matter, Dr. Facilia has spoken to me of the difficulties of scientific advance among individualists. However, that does not stop me from wanting to hear your views on these matters, nor should it stop you from wanting to tell me. For instance, do you want me to accept Dr. Fastolf's interpretation of globalist plans as unbiased and impartial? And would you state that for the record? Or would you prefer to describe your plans in your own words? Put that way, Mr. Bailey, you intend to give me no choice. None, Dr. Amadero. Very well. I, we, I should say, for the people at the Institute are like-minded in this, look into the future and wish to see humanity opening ever more and ever newer planets to settlement. We do not, however, want the process of self-selection to destroy the older planets or to reduce them to moribundity, as in the case, pardon me, of Earth. We don't want the new planets to take the best of us and to leave behind the dregs. You see that, don't you? Please go on. In any robot-oriented society, as in the case of our own, the easy solution is to send out robots as settlers. The robots will build the society and the world, and we can then all follow later without selection— for the new world will be as comfortable and as adjusted to ourselves as the old worlds were, so that we can go on to new worlds without leaving home, so to speak. Won't the robots create robot worlds rather than human worlds? Exactly. If we send out robots that are nothing but robots, we have, however, the opportunity of sending out humaniform robots like Daniil here, who, in creating worlds for themselves, would automatically create worlds for us. Dr. Fastolf, however, objects to this. He finds some virtue in the thought of human beings carving a new world out of a strange and forbidding planet, and does not see that the effort to do so would not only cost enormously in human life, but would also create a world molded by catastrophic events into something not at all like the worlds we know. As the spacer worlds today are different from Earth and from each other. Amadero, for a moment, lost his joviality and looked thoughtful. Actually, Mr. Bailey, you touch an important point. I am discussing Aurora only— the spacer worlds do indeed differ among themselves, and I am not overly fond of most of them. It is clear to me, though I may be prejudiced, that Aurora, the oldest among them, is also the best and most successful. I don't want a variety of new worlds of which only a few might be really valuable. I want many Auroras, uncounted millions of Auroras— and for that reason, I want new worlds carved into auroras before human beings go there. That's why we call ourselves globalists, by the way. We are concerned with this globe of ours, aurora, and no other. Do you see no value in variety, Dr. Amadero? If the varieties were equally good, perhaps there would be value, but if some, or most, are inferior... How would that benefit humanity? When do you start this work? When we have the humaniform robots with which to do it. So far, there were Fastolf's two, of which he destroyed one, leaving Daniil the only specimen. His eyes strayed briefly to Daniil as he spoke. When will you have humaniform robots? That is difficult to say. We have not yet caught up with Dr. Fastolf. Even though he is one and you are many, Dr. Amadero? Amadero twitched his shoulders slightly. You waste your sarcasm, Mr. Bailey. Fastolf was well ahead of us to begin with, and though the Institute has been in embryo for a long time, we have been fully at work for only two years. Besides, it will be necessary for us not only to catch up with Fastolf, but to move ahead of him. Daniil is a good product, but he is only a prototype and is not good enough. In what way must the humaniform robots be improved beyond Daniil's mark? They must be even more human, obviously. They must exist in both sexes, and there must be the equivalent of children. 
We must have a generational spread if a sufficiently human society is to be built up on the planets. I think I see difficulties, Dr. Amadero. No doubt. There are many. Which difficulties do you foresee, Mr. Bailey? If you produce humaniform robots who are so humaniform they can produce a human society, and if they are produced with a generational spread in both sexes, how will you be able to distinguish them from human beings? Will that matter? It might. If such robots are too human, they might melt into a roaring society and become part of human family groups, and might not be suitable for service as pioneers. Amadiro laughed. <laughs> that thought clearly entered your head because of Gladia Del Mar's attachment to gender. You see, I know something of your interview with that woman from my conversations with Grimaeus and with Dr. Vasilia. I remind you that Gladia is from Solaria, and her notion of what constitutes a husband is not necessarily a roar in, in nature. I was not thinking of her in particular. I was thinking that sex on Aurora is broadly interpreted, and that robots as sex partners are tolerated even now with robots who are only approximately humaniform. If you really cannot tell a robot from a human being, there's the question of children. Mm -hmm. Robots can neither father nor mother children. But that brings up another point. The robots will be long-lived, since the proper building of the society may take centuries. They would, in any case, have to be long-lived if they are to resemble Aurorans. And the children, also long-lived? Amadiro did not speak. Bailey said, These will be artificial robot children and will never grow older. They will not age and mature. Surely this will create an element sufficiently non-human to cast the nature of the society into doubt. Amadiro sighed. You are penetrating, Mr. Bailey. It is indeed our thought to devise some scheme whereby robots can produce babies who can in some fashion grow and mature, at least long enough to establish the society we want. And then when human beings arrive, the robots can be restored to more robotic schemes of behavior. Perhaps, if that seems advisable, and this production of babies. Clearly it would be best if the system used were as close to the human as possible, wouldn't it? Possibly. Sex, fertilization, birth? Possibly. And if these robots form a society so human that they cannot be differentiated from human, then when true human beings arrive, might it not be that the robots would resent the immigrants and try to keep them off? Might the robots not react to Aurorans as you react to Earth people? Mr. Bailey, the robots would still be bound by the three laws. The three laws speak of refraining from injuring human beings and of obeying human beings. Exactly. And what if the robots are so close to human beings that they regard themselves as the human beings they should protect and obey? They might, very rightly, place themselves above the immigrants. <laughs> My good Mr. Bailey, why are you so concerned with all these things? They are for the far future. There will be solutions as we progress in time and as we understand, by observation, what the problems really are. It may be, Dr. Amadero, that Aurorans may not very much approve what you are planning, once they understand what it is. They may prefer Dr. Fastolf's views. Indeed. Fastolf thinks that, if Aurorans cannot settle new planets directly and without the help of robots, then Earth people should be encouraged to do so. Bailey said, It seems to me that that makes good sense. Because you are an Earth man, my good Bailey. I assure you that Aurorans would not find it pleasant to have Earth people swarming over the new worlds, building new beehives, and forming some sort of galactic empire in their trillions and quadrillions, and reducing the spacer worlds to what? To insignificance at best, and to extinction at worst. But the alternative to that is worlds of humaniform robots building quasi-human societies and allowing no true human beings among themselves. There would gradually develop a robotic galactic empire, reducing the spacer worlds to insignificance at best and to extinction at worst. 
surely Aurorans would prefer a human galactic empire to a robotic one. What makes you so sure of that, Mr. Bailey? Well, the form your society takes now makes me sure. I was told on my way to Aurora that no distinctions are made between robots and human beings on Aurora, but that is clearly wrong. It may be a wished-for ideal that Aurorans flatter themselves truly exists, but it does not. You've been here, what, less than two days, and you can already tell? Yes, Dr. Amadero. It may be precisely because I'm a stranger that I can see clearly. I am not blinded by custom and ideals. Robots are not permitted to enter personals, and that's one distinction that is clearly made. It permits human beings to find one place where they can be alone. You and I sit at our ease while robots remain standing in their niches, as you see. Bailey waved his arm toward Daniil, which is another distinction. I think that human beings, even Aurorans, will always be eager to make distinctions and to preserve their own humanity. Astonishing, Mr. Bailey. Not astonishing at all, Dr. Amadero. You have lost. Even if you manage to foist your belief that Dr. Fastolf destroyed Jander upon Aurorans generally, even if you reduce Dr. Fastolf to political impotence, even if you get the legislature and the Auroran people to approve your plan of robot settlement, you will only have gained time. As soon as the Aurorans see the implications of your plan, they will turn against you. It might be better, then, if you put an end to your campaign against Dr. Fastolf and meet with him to work out some compromise, whereby the settlement of new worlds by Earthmen can be so arranged as to represent no threat to Aurora or to the spacer worlds in general. Astonishing, Mr. Bailey, said Amadero a second time. You have no choice, said Bailey flatly. But Amadero answered in a leisurely and amused tone, when I say your remarks are astonishing, I do not refer to the content of your statements, but only to the fact that you make them at all, and that you think they are worth something. 56. Bailey watched Amadero forage for one last piece of pastry and put half of it into his mouth, clearly enjoying it. Hmm, very good, said Amadero. But I am a little too fond of eating. Oh, what was I saying? Oh, yes, Mr. Bailey. Do you think you have discovered a secret? That I have told you something that our world does not already know? That my plans are dangerous, but that I blab them to every newcomer? I imagine you may think that, if I talk to you long enough, I will surely produce some verbal folly that you will be able to make use of. Be assured that I am not likely to. My plans for ever more humaniform robots, for robot families, and for as human a culture as possible are all on record. They are available to the legislature and to anyone who is interested. Bailey said, Does the general public know? Probably not. The general public has its own priorities and is more interested in the next Miu, the next hyperwave show, the next space soccer contest, than in the next century and the next millennium. Still, the general public will be as glad to accept my plans as are the intellectually minded who already know. Those who object will not be numerous enough to matter. Can you be certain of that? Oddly enough, I can be. You don't understand, I'm afraid, the intensity of the feelings that Aurorans and Spacers generally have toward Earth people. I don't share those feelings, mind you, and I am, for instance, quite at ease with you. I don't have that primitive fear of infection. I don't imagine that you smell bad. I don't attribute to you all sorts of personality traits that I find offensive. I don't think that you and yours are plotting to take our lives or steal our property. But the large majority of Aurorans have all these attitudes. It may not be very close to the surface, and Aurorans may bring themselves to be very polite to individual Earth people who seem harmless, but put them to the test, and all their hatred and suspicion will emerge. Tell them that Earth people are swarming over new worlds and will preempt the galaxy, and they will 
howl for Earth's destruction before such a thing can happen. Even if the alternative was a robot society? Certainly. You don't understand how we feel about robots, either. We are familiar with them. We are at home with them. No, they are your servants. You feel superior to them and are at home with them only while that superiority is maintained. If you are threatened by an overturn, by having them become your superiors, you will react with horror. You say that only because that is how Earth people would react. No, you keep them out of the personals. It is a symptom. They have no use for those rooms. They have their own facilities for washing, and they do not excrete. Of course, they are not truly humaniform. If they were, we might not make that distinction. You would fear them the more. Truly, said Amadiro. That's foolish. Do you fear Daniil? If I can trust that hyperwave show, and I admit I do not think I can, you developed a considerable affection for Daniil. You feel it now, don't you? Bailey's silence was eloquent, and Amadiro pursued his advantage. Right now, he said, you are unmoved by the fact that Giscard is standing, silent and unresponsive, in an alcove, but I can tell by small examples of body language that you are uneasy over the fact that Daniil is doing so, too. You feel he is too human in appearance to be treated as a robot. You don't fear him the more because he looks human. I am an Earthman. We have robots, said Bailey, but not a robot culture. You cannot judge from my case. And Glodaya, who preferred gender to human beings, she is a Solarian. You cannot judge from her case either. What case can you judge from, then? You are only guessing. To me, it seems obvious that if a robot is human enough, he would be accepted as human. Do you demand proof that I am not a robot? The fact that I seem human is enough. In the end... We will not worry whether a new world is settled by aurorans who are human in fact or in appearance if no one can tell the difference. But, human or robot, the settlers will be aurorans either way, not earth people. Bailey's assurance faltered. He said unconvincingly, What if you never learn how to construct a humaniform robot? Why would you expect we would not? Notice that I say, we... There are many of us involved here. It may be that any number of mediocrities do not add up to one genius. Amadiro said shortly, We are not mediocrities. Fastolf may yet find it profitable to come in with us. I don't think so. I do. He will not enjoy being without power in the legislature, and when our plans for settling the galaxy move ahead and he sees that his opposition does not stop us, he will join us. It will be only human of him to do so. I don't think you will win out, said Bailey. Because you think that somehow this investigation of yours will exonerate Fastolf and implicate me, perhaps, or someone else. Perhaps, said Bailey desperately. Amadiro shook his head. My friend... If I thought that anything you could do would spoil my plans, would I be sitting still and waiting for destruction? You are not. You are doing everything you can to have this investigation aborted. Why would you do that if you were confident that nothing I could do would get in your way? Well, said Amadiro, you can get in my way by demoralizing some of the members of the Institute— you can't be dangerous, but you can be annoying, and I don't want that either. So if I can, I'll put an end to the annoyance, but I'll do that in reasonable fashion, in gentle fashion even, if you are actually dangerous. What could you do, Dr. Amadiro, in that case? I could have you seized and imprisoned until you were evicted. I don't think Aurorans generally would worry over much about what I might do to an Earthman. Bailey said, You are trying to browbeat me, and that won't work. You know very well you could not lay a hand on me with my robots present. Amadiro said, Does it occur to you that I have a hundred robots within call? What would yours do against them? 
All hundred could not harm me. They cannot distinguish between earthmen and aurorans. I am human within the meaning of the three laws. They could hold you quite immobilized without harming you while your robots were destroyed. Not so, said Bailey. Giscard can hear you, and if you make a move to summon your robots, Giscard will have you immobilized. He moves very quickly, and once that happens, your robots will be helpless, even if you manage to call them. They will understand that any move against me will result in harm to you. You mean that Giscard will hurt me? To protect me from harm? Certainly. He will kill you if absolutely necessary. Surely you don't mean that. I do, said Bailey. Daniil and Giscard have orders to protect me. The first law in this respect has been strengthened with all the skill Dr. Fastolf can bring to the job and with respect to me specifically. I haven't been told this in so many words, but I'm quite sure it's true. If my robots must choose between harm to you and harm to me, Earthman though I am, it will be easy for them to choose harm to you. I imagine you are well aware that Dr. Fastolf is not very eager to ensure your well-being. Amadiro chuckled, and a grin wreathed his face. I'm sure you're right in every respect, Mr. Bailey, but it is good to have you say so. You know, my good sir, that I am recording this conversation also. I told you so at the start, and I'm glad of it. It is possible that Dr. Fastolf will erase the last part of this conversation, but I assure you I won't. It is clear from what you have said that he is quite prepared to devise a robotic way of doing harm to me, even kill me, if he can manage that, whereas it cannot be said from anything in this conversation or any other that I plan any physical harm to him whatever or even to you. Which of us is the villain, Mr. Bailey? I think you have established that, and I think then that this is a good place at which to end the interview. He rose, still smiling, and Bailey, swallowing hard, stood up as well, almost automatically. Amadiro said, I still have one thing to say, however. It has nothing to do with our little contretemps here on Aurora, Fastolf's and mine, rather with your own problem, Mr. Bailey. My problem? Perhaps I should say Earth's problem. I imagine that you feel very anxious to save poor Fastolf from his own folly because you think that will give your planet a chance for expansion. Don't think so, Mr. Bailey. You are quite wrong. Rather, arcy varcy to use a vulgar expression I've come across in some of your planet's historical novels. I'm not familiar with that phrase, said Bailey stiffly. I mean, you have the situation reversed. You see, when my view wins out in the legislature, and note that I say when and not if, Earth will be forced to remain in her own planetary system, I admit, but that will actually be to her benefit. Aurora will have the prospect of expansion and of establishing an endless empire— if we then know that Earth will merely be Earth and never anything more, of what concern will she be to us? With the galaxy at our disposal, we will not begrudge Earth people their one world. We would even be disposed to make Earth as comfortable a world for her people as would be practical. On the other hand, Mr. Bailey... If Aurorans do what Fastolf asks and allow Earth to send out settling parties, then it won't be long before it will occur to an increasing number of us that Earth will take over the galaxy and that we will be encircled and hemmed in, that we will be doomed to decay and death. After that, there will be nothing I can do. My own quite kindly feeling toward Earthmen will not be able to withstand the general kindling of a roar and suspicion and prejudice, and it will then be very bad for Earth. So if, Mr. Bailey, you are truly concerned for your own people, you should be very anxious indeed for Fastolf not to succeed in foisting upon this planet his very misguided plan. You should be a strong ally of mine. Think about it. 
I tell you this, I assure you, out of a sincere friendship and liking for you and for your planet. Amadira was smiling as broadly as ever, but it was all wolf now. 57. Bailey and his robots followed Amadiro out the room and along the corridor. Amadiro stopped at one inconspicuous door and said, Would you care to use the facilities before leaving? For a moment, Bailey frowned in confusion, for he did not understand. Then he remembered the antiquated phrase Amadiro had used, thanks to his own reading of historical novels. He said, there was an ancient general whose name I have forgotten who, mindful of the exigencies of sudden absorption in military affairs, once said, Never turn down a chance to piss. Amadiro smiled broadly and said, Excellent advice. Quite as good as my advice to think seriously about what I have said, but I notice that you hesitate even so. Surely you don't think I am laying a trap for you. Believe me, I am not a barbarian. You are my guest in this building, and for that reason alone, you are perfectly safe. Bailey said cautiously, If I hesitate, it is because I am considering the propriety of using your, um, facilities, considering that I am not an Auroran. Nonsense, my dear Bailey. What is your alternative? Needs must. Please make use of it. Let that be a symbol that I myself am not subject to the general Auroran prejudices and wish you and Earth well. Could you go a step further? In what way, Mr. Bailey? Could you show me that you are also superior to this planet's prejudice against robots? There is no prejudice against robots, said Amadiro quickly. Bailey nodded his head solemnly in apparent acceptance of the remark and completed his sentence by allowing them to enter the personal with me. I have grown to feel uncomfortable without them. For one moment, Amadiro seemed shaken. He recovered almost at once and said, with what was almost a scowl, By all means, Mr. Bailey. Yet whoever is now inside might object strenuously. I would not want to create scandal. No one is in there. It is a one-person personal, and if someone were making use of it, the in-use signal would indicate that. Thank you, Dr. Amadero, said Bailey. He opened the door and said, Giscard, please enter. Giscard clearly hesitated, but said nothing in objection and entered. At a gesture from Bailey, Daniil followed, but as he passed through the door, he took Bailey's elbow and pulled him in as well. Bailey said as the door closed behind him, I'll be out again soon. Thank you for allowing this. He entered the room with as much unconcern as he could manage, and yet he felt a tightness in the pit of his abdomen. Might it contain some unpleasant surprise? 58. Bailey found the personal empty, however. There was not even much to search. It was smaller than the one in Fastolf's establishment. Eventually, he noticed Daniil and Giscard standing silently side by side, backs against the door, as though endeavoring to have entered the room by the least amount possible. Bailey tried to speak normally, but what came out was a dim croak. He cleared his throat with unnecessary noise and said, You can come farther into the room, and you needn't remain silent, Daniil. Daniil had been on Earth. He knew the earthly taboo against speech in the personal. Daniil displayed that knowledge at once. He put his forefinger to his lips. Bailey said, I know, I know, but forget it. If Amadero can forget the Auroran taboo about robots and personals, I can forget the earthly taboo about speech there. Will it not make you uncomfortable, partner Elijah? asked Daniil in a low voice. Not a bit, said Bailey in an ordinary one. Actually, speech felt different with Daniil, a robot. The sound of speech in a room such as this, when actually no human being was present, was not as horrifying as it might be. In fact, it was not horrifying at all when only robots were present, however humaniform one of them might be. Bailey could not say so, of course. Though Daniil had no feelings a human being could hurt, 
Bailey had feelings on his behalf. And then Bailey thought of something else and felt, quite intensely, the sensation of being a thoroughgoing fool. Or, he said to Daniil, in a voice that was suddenly very low indeed, are you suggesting silence because this room is bugged? The last word came out merely as a shaping of the mouth. If you mean, partner Elijah, that people outside this room can detect what is spoken inside this room through some sort of eavesdropping device, that is quite impossible. Why impossible? The toilet device flushed itself with quick and silent efficiency, and Bailey advanced toward the wash basin. Daniil said, On earth, the dense packing of the cities makes privacy impossible. Overhearing is taken for granted, and to use a device to make overhearing more efficient might seem natural. If an earthman wishes not to be overheard, he simply doesn't speak, which may be why silence is so mandatory in places where there is a pretense of privacy, as in the very rooms you call personals. On Aurora, on the other hand, as on all the spacer worlds, privacy is a true fact of life and is greatly valued. You remember Solaria and the diseased extremes to which it was carried there, but even on Aurora, which is no Solaria, every human being is insulated from every other human being by the kind of space extension unthinkable on Earth and by a wall of robots in addition. To break down that privacy would be an unthinkable act. Bailey said, Do you mean it would be a crime to bug this room? Much worse, partner Elijah. It would not be the act of a civilized Auroran gentleman. Bailey looked about. Daniil, mistaking the gesture, plucked a towel out of the dispenser, which might not have been instantly apparent to the other's unaccustomed eyes, and offered it to Bailey. Bailey accepted the towel, but that was not the object of his questing glance. It was a bug for which his eyes searched, for he found it difficult to believe that someone would forego an easy advantage on the ground that it would not be civilized behavior. It was, however, useless, and Bailey, rather despondently, knew it would be. He would not be able to detect an auroran bug even if one were there. He wouldn't know what to look for in a strange culture. Whereupon he followed the course of another strand of suspicion in his mind. Tell me, Daniil, since you know Aurorans better than I do, why do you suppose Amadero is taking all this trouble with me? He talks to me at his leisure. He sees me out. He offers me the use of this room, something Vasilia would not have done. He seems to have all the time in the world to spend on me. Politeness? Many Aurorans pride themselves on their politeness. It may be that Amadero does. He has several times stressed that he is not a barbarian. Another question. Why do you think he was willing to have me bring you and Giscard into this room? It seemed to me that that was to remove your suspicions that the offer of this room might conceal a trap. Why should he bother? Because he was concerned over the possibility of my experiencing unnecessary anxiety? Another gesture of a civilized Auroran gentleman, I should imagine. Bailey shook his head. Well, if this room is bugged and Amadiro can hear me, let him hear me. I don't consider him a civilized Auroran gentleman. He made it quite clear that if I did not abandon my investigation, he would see to it that Earth as a whole would suffer. Is that the act of a civilized gentleman or of an incredibly brutal blackmailer? Daniil said, An Auroran gentleman may find it necessary to utter threats, but if so, he would do it in a gentlemanly manner as Amadero did. It is then the manner and not the content of speech that marks the gentleman. But then, Daniil, you are a robot and therefore cannot really criticize a human being, can you? Daniil said, It would be difficult for me to do so. But may I ask a question, partner Elijah? Why did you ask permission to bring friend Giscard and me into this room? It had seemed to me that you were reluctant earlier to believe you were in danger. Have you now decided that you are not safe except in our presence? No, not at all, Daniil. I am now quite convinced that I am not in danger and have not been. Yet there was a distinctly suspicious cast about your actions when you entered this room, partner Elijah. You searched it. Bailey said, Of course, I said I'm not in danger, but I do not say there is no danger. 
I do not think I see the distinction, partner Elijah, said Daniil. We will discuss it later, Daniil. I am still not certain as to whether this room is bugged or not. Bailey was, by now, quite done. He said, Well, Daniil, I've been leisurely about this. I haven't rushed at all. Now I'm ready to go out again, and I wonder if Amadero is still waiting for us after all this time, or whether he has delegated an underling to do the rest of the job of showing us out. After all, Amadero is a busy man and cannot spend all day with me. What do you think, Daniil? It would be more logical if Dr. Amadero had delegated the task. And you, Giscard? What do you think? I agree with friend Daniil, though it is my experience that human beings do not always make what would seem the logical response. Bailey said, For my part, I suspect Amadero is waiting for us quite patiently. If something has driven him to waste this much time on us, I rather think that the driving force, whatever it might be, has not yet weakened. I do not know what might be the driving force you speak of, partner Elijah, said Daniil. Nor I, Daniil, said Bailey, which bothers me a great deal. But let us open the door now and see. 59. Amadero was waiting outside the door for them, precisely where Bailey had left him. He smiled at them, showing no sign of impatience. Bailey could not resist shooting a quiet, I told you so glance at Daniil, who responded with bland impassivity. Amadiro said, I rather regretted, Mr. Bailey, that you had not left Giscard outside when you entered the personal. I might have known him in times past when Fastolf and I were on better terms, but somehow never did. Fastolf was my teacher once, you know. Was he? said Bailey. I didn't know that, as a matter of fact. No reason you should, unless you had been told, and in the short time you've been on the planet, you can scarcely have had time to learn much in the way of this sort of trivia, I suppose. Come now, it has occurred to me that you can scarcely think me hospitable if I do not take advantage of your being at the Institute to show you around. Really, said Bailey, stiffening a bit. I must, I insist, said Amadiro with something of a note of the imperious entering his voice. You arrived on Aurora yesterday morning, and I doubt that you will be staying on the planet much longer. This may be the only chance you will ever have of getting a glimpse of a modern laboratory doing research work on robotics. He linked arms with Bailey and continued to speak in familiar terms. Prattled was the term that occurred to the astonished Bailey. You've washed, said Amadiro. You've taken care of your needs. There may be other roboticists here whom you will wish to question, and I would welcome that, since I am determined to show I have put no barriers in your way during this short time in which you will yet be permitted to conduct your investigation. In fact, there is no reason you can't have dinner with us. Giscard said, If I may interrupt, sir. You may not said Amadiro with unmistakable firmness, and the robot fell silent. Amadiro said, My dear Mr. Bailey, I understand these robots. Who should know them better? Except for the unfortunate Fastolf, of course. Giscard, I am sure, was going to remind you of some appointment, some promise, some business, and there is no point in any of that. Since the investigation is about over, I promise you none of what he was going to remind you of will have any significance. Let us forget all such nonsense, and for a brief time be friends. You must understand, my good Mr. Bailey, he went on, that I am quite an aficionado of Earth and its culture. It is not the most popular of subjects on Aurora, but I find it fascinating. I am particularly interested in Earth's past history, the days when it had a hundred languages and interstellar standard had not yet been developed. May I compliment you, by the way, on your own handling of interstellar? Oh, this way, this way, he said, turning a corner. We'll be coming to the pathway simulation room, which has its own weird beauty, and we may have a mock-up in operation. Quite symphonic, actually. But I was talking about your handling of interstellar. It is one of the many aurora and superstitions concerning Earth that Earth people speak an all-but-incomprehensible version of interstellar. 
When the show about you was produced, there were many who said that the actors could not be Earth people because they could be understood. Yet I can understand you. He smiled as he said that. I've tried reading Shakespeare, he continued with a confidential air. But I can't read him in the original, of course, and the translation is curiously flat. I can't help but believe that the fault lies with the translation and not with Shakespeare. I do better with Dickens and Tolstoy, perhaps because that is prose, although the names of the characters are, in both cases, virtually unpronounceable to me. What I'm trying to say, Mr. Bailey, is that I'm a friend of Earth. I really am. I want what is best for it. Do you understand? He looked at Bailey, and again the wolf showed in his twinkling eyes. Bailey raised his voice, forcing it between the softly running sentences of the other. I'm afraid I cannot oblige you, Dr. Amadero. I must be about my business, and I have no further questions to ask of either you or anyone else here. If you... Bailey paused. There was a faint and curious rumble of sound in the air. He looked up, startled. What is that? What is what? asked Amadiro. I sense nothing. He looked at the robots, who had been following the two human beings in grave silence. Nothing, he said forcefully. Nothing. Bailey recognized that as the equivalent of an order. Neither robot could now claim to have heard the rumble in direct contradiction to a human being, unless Bailey himself applied a counterpressure, and he was sure he could not manage to do it skillfully enough in the face of Amadiro's professionalism. Nevertheless, it didn't matter. He had heard something, and he was not a robot. He would not be talked out of it. He said, By your own statement, Dr. Amadiro, I have little time left me. That is all the more reason that I must... The rumble again. Louder. Bailey said with a sharp cutting edge to his voice. That, I suppose, is precisely what you didn't hear before and what you don't hear now. Let me go, sir, or I will ask my robots for help. Amadiro loosened his grip on Bailey's upper arm at once. My friend, you had but to express the wish. Come. I will take you to the nearest exit, and if ever you are on Aurora again, which seems unlikely in the extreme, please return and you may have the tour I promised you. They were walking faster. They moved down the spiral ramp, out along a corridor to the commodious and now empty anteroom, and the door by which they had entered. The windows in the anteroom showed utterly dark. Could it be night already? It wasn't. Amadiro muttered to himself, Rotten weather. They've opacified the windows. He turned to Bailey. I imagine it's raining. They predicted it, and the forecasts can usually be relied on. Always when they're unpleasant. The door opened, and Bailey jumped backward with a gasp. A cold wind gusted inward, and against the sky, not black, but a dull, dark gray, the tops of trees were whipping back and forth. There was water pouring from the sky, descending in streams. And as Bailey watched, appalled, a streak of light flashed across the sky with blinding brilliance. And then the rumble came again, this time with a cracking report, as though the light streak had split the sky and the rumble was the noise it had made. Bailey turned and fled back the way he had come, whimpering. Chapter 15 Again, Daniil and Giscard 60 Bailey felt Daniil's strong grip on his arms just beneath his shoulders. He halted and forced himself to stop making that infantile sound. He could feel himself trembling. Daniil said with infinite respect, Partner Elijah, it is a thunderstorm, expected, predicted, normal. I know that, whispered Bailey. He did know it. Thunderstorms had been described innumerable times in the books he had read, whether fiction or nonfiction. He had seen them in holographs and on hyperwave shows, sound, sight, and all. The real thing, however, the actual sound and sight, had never penetrated into the bowels of the city, 
and he had never in his life actually experienced such a thing. With all he knew intellectually about thunderstorms, he could not face viscerally the actuality. Despite the descriptions, the collections of words, the sight in small pictures and on small screens, the sounds captured in recordings, despite all that, he had no idea the flashes were so bright and streaked so across the sky, that the sound was so vibratorially bass in sound when it rattled across a hollow world, that both were so sudden and that rain could be so like an inverted bowl of water endlessly pouring. He muttered in despair, I can't go out in that. You won't have to, said Daniil urgently. Giscard will get the airfoil. It will be brought right to the door for you. Not a drop of rain will fall on you. Why not wait until it's over? Surely that would not be advisable, partner Elijah. Some rain at least will continue past midnight, and if the chairman arrives tomorrow morning, as Dr. Amadiro implied he might, it might be wise to spend the evening in consultation with Dr. Fastolf. Bailey forced himself to turn around, face in the direction from which he wanted to flee, and look into Daniil's eyes. They seemed deeply concerned, but Bailey thought dismally that that was merely the result of his own interpretation of the appearance of those eyes, the robot had no feelings, only positronic surges that mimicked those feelings. And perhaps human beings had no feelings, only neuronic surges that were interpreted as feelings. He was somehow aware that Amadiro was gone. He said, Amadiro delayed me deliberately by ushering me into the personal by his senseless talk, by his preventing you or Giscard from interrupting and warning me about the storm. He would even have tried to persuade me to tour the building or dine with him. He desisted only at the sound of the storm. That was what he was waiting for. It would seem so. If the storm now keeps you here, that may be what he was waiting for. Bailey drew a deep breath. You are right. I must leave. Somehow. Reluctantly, he took a step toward the door, which was still open, still filled with a dark gray vista of whipping rain. Another step, and still another, leaning heavily on Daniil. Giscard was waiting quietly at the door. Bailey paused and closed his eyes for a moment. Then he said in a low voice, to himself rather than to Daniil, I must do it, and moved forward again. 61. Are you well, sir? asked Giscard. It was a foolish question, dictated by the programming of the robot, thought Bailey, though at that it was no worse than the questions asked by human beings, sometimes with wild inappropriateness, out of the programming of etiquette. Yes, said Bailey, in a voice he tried and failed to raise above a husky whisper. It was a useless answer to the foolish question, for Giscard, robot though he was, could surely see that Bailey was unwell and that Bailey's answer was a palpable lie. The answer was, however, given and accepted, and that freed Giscard for the next step. He said, I will now leave to get the airfoil and bring it to the door. Will it work in all this, this water, Giscard? Yes, sir. This is not an uncommon rain. He left, moving steadily into the downpour. The lightning was flickering almost continuously, and the thunder was a muted growl that rose to a louder crescendo every few minutes. For the first time in his life, Bailey found himself envying a robot. Imagine being able to walk through that, to be indifferent to water, to sight, to sound, to be able to ignore surroundings and to have a pseudo-life that was absolutely courageous, to know no fear of pain or of death, because there was no pain or death. And yet, to be incapable of originality of thought, to be incapable of unpredictable leaps of intuition, were such gifts worth what humanity paid for them? At the moment, Bailey could not say. 
He knew that once he no longer felt terror, he would know that no price was too high to pay for being human. But now that he experienced nothing but the pounding of his heart and the collapse of his will, he could not help but wonder of what use it might be to be a human being if one could not overcome these deep-seated terrors, this intense agoraphobia. Yet he had been in the open for much of two days and had managed to be almost comfortable. But the fear had not been conquered. He knew that now. He had suppressed it by thinking intensely of other things, but the storm overrode all intensity of thought. He could not allow this. If all else failed, thought, pride, will, then he would have to fall back on shame. He could not collapse under the impersonal superior gaze of the robots. Shame would have to be stronger than fear. He felt Daniil's steady arm about his waist, and shame prevented him from doing what, at the moment, he most wanted to do, to turn and hide his face against the robotic chest. He might have been unable to resist if Daniil had been human. He had lost contact with reality, for he was becoming aware of Daniil's voice as though it were reaching him from a long distance. It sounded as though Daniil was feeling something akin to panic. Partner Elijah, do you hear me? Giscard's voice from an equal distance said, We must carry him. No, mumbled Bailey. Let me walk. Perhaps they did not hear him. Perhaps he did not really speak, but merely thought he did. He felt himself lifted from the ground. His left arm dangled helplessly, and he strove to lift it, to push it against someone's shoulder, to lift himself upright again from the waist, to grope for the floor with his feet and stand upright. But his left arm continued to dangle helplessly, and his striving went for nothing. He was somehow aware that he was moving through the air, and he felt a wash of spray against his face. Not actually water, but the sifting of damp air. Then there was the pressure of a hard surface against his left side, a more resilient one against his right side. He was in the airfoil, wedged in once more between Giscard and Daniil. What he was most conscious of was that Giscard was very wet. He felt a jet of warm air cascading over him. Between the near darkness outside and the film of trickling water upon the glass, they might as well have been opacified, or so Bailey thought till opacification actually took place and total darkness descended. The soft noise of the jet as the airfoil rose above the grass and swayed muted the thunder and seemed to draw its teeth. Giscard said, I regret the discomfort of my wet surface, sir. I will dry quickly. We will wait here a short while till you recover. Bailey was breathing more easily. He felt wonderfully and comfortably enclosed. He thought, give me back my city. Wipe out all the universe and let the spacers colonize it. Earth is all we need. And even as he thought it, he knew it was his madness that believed it not he. He felt the need to keep his mind busy. He said weakly, Daniil. Yes, partner Elijah. About the chairman. Is it your opinion that Amadiro is judging the situation correctly in supposing that the chairman would put an end to the investigation? Or was he perhaps allowing his wishes to do his thinking for him? It may be, partner Elijah, that the chairman will indeed interview Dr. Fastolf and Amadiro on the matter. It would be a standard procedure for settling a dispute of this nature. There are ample precedents. But why? asked Bailey weakly. If Amadiro was so persuasive, why should not the chairman simply order the investigation stopped? The chairman, said Daniil, is in a difficult political situation. He agreed originally to allow you to be brought to Aurora at Dr. Fastolf's urging, and he cannot so sharply reverse himself so soon without making himself look weak and irresolute, and without angering Dr. Fastolf, who is still a very influential figure in the legislature. 
Then why did he not simply turn down Amadero's request? Dr. Amadero is also influential, partner Elijah, and likely to grow even more so. The chairman must temporize by hearing both sides and by giving at least the appearance of deliberation before coming to a decision. Based on what? On the merits of the case, we must presume. Then by tomorrow morning, I must come up with something that will persuade the chairman to side with Fastolf rather than against him. If I do that, will that mean victory? Daniil said. The chairman is not all-powerful, but his influence is great. If he comes out strongly on Dr. Fastolf's side, then, under the present political conditions, Dr. Fastolf will probably win the backing of the legislature. Bailey found himself beginning to think clearly again. That would seem explanation enough for Amadero's attempt to delay us. He might have reasoned that I had nothing yet to offer the chairman, and he needed only to delay to keep me from getting anything in the time that remained to me. So it would seem, partner Elijah. And he let me go only when he thought he could rely on the storm continuing to keep me. Perhaps so, partner Elijah. In that case, we cannot allow the storm to stop us. Giscard said calmly, Where do you wish to be taken, sir? Back to the establishment of Dr. Fastolf. Daniil said, May we have one moment's more pause, partner Elijah? Do you plan to tell Dr. Fastolf that you cannot continue the investigation? Bailey said sharply, Why do you say that? It was a measure of his recovery that his voice was loud and angry. Daniil said, It is merely that I fear you might have forgotten for a moment that Dr. Amadero urged you to do so for the sake of Earth's welfare. I have not forgotten, said Bailey grimly. And I am surprised, Daniil, that you should think that that would influence me. Fastolf must be exonerated and Earth must send its settlers outward into the galaxy. If there is danger in that from the globalists, that danger must be chanced. But in that case, partner Elijah, why go back to Dr. Fastolf? It doesn't seem to me that we have anything of moment to report to him. Is there no direction in which we can further continue our investigation before reporting to Dr. Fastolf? Bailey sat up in his seat and placed his hand on Giscard, who was now entirely dry. He said in quite a normal voice, I am satisfied with the progress I have already made, Daniil. Let's get moving, Giscard. Proceed to Fastolf's establishment. And then, tightening his fists and stiffening his body, Bailey added, What's more, Giscard, clear the windows. I want to look out into the face of the storm. 62. Bailey held his breath in preparation for transparency. The small box of the airfoil would no longer be entirely enclosed. It would no longer have unbroken walls. As the windows clarified, there was a flash of light that came and went too quickly to do anything but darken the world by contrast. Bailey could not prevent his cringe as he tried to steel himself for the thunder, which, after a moment or two, rolled and grumbled. Daniil said pacifyingly, The storm will get no worse, and soon enough it will recede. I don't care whether it recedes or not, said Bailey through trembling lips. Come on, let's go. He was trying, for his own sake, to maintain the illusion of a human being in charge of robots. The airfoil rose slightly in the air and at once underwent a sideways movement that tilted it so that Bailey felt himself pushing hard against Giscard. Bailey cried out, gasped out rather, Straighten the vehicle, Giscard! Daniil placed his arm around Bailey's shoulder and pulled him gently back. His other arm was braced about a hand grip attached to the frame of the airfoil. That cannot be done, partner Elijah, Daniil said. There is a fairly strong wind. Bailey felt his hair bristle. You mean we're going to be blown away? No, of course not, said Daniil. If the car were antigrav, a form of technology that does not, of course, exist, and if its mass and inertia were eliminated, then it would be blown like a feather high into the air. However, 
We retain our full mass even when our jets lift us and poise us in the air, so our inertia resists the wind. Nevertheless, the wind makes us sway, even though the car remains completely under Giscard's control. It doesn't feel like it. Bailey was conscious of a thin whine which he imagined to be the wind curling around the body of the airfoil as it cut its way through the protesting atmosphere. Then the airfoil lurched, and Bailey, who could not for his life have helped it, seized Daniil in a desperate grip around the neck. Daniil waited a moment. When Bailey had caught his breath and his grip grew less rigid, Daniil released himself easily from the other's embrace while somewhat tightening the pressure of his own arm around Bailey. He said, In order to maintain course, partner Elijah, Giscard must counter the wind by an asymmetric ordering of the airfoil's jets. They are sent to one side so as to cause the airfoil to lean into the wind, and these jets have to be adjusted in force and direction as the wind itself changes force and direction. There are none better at this than Giscard, but even so... There are occasional jiggles and lurches. You must excuse Giscard, then, if he does not participate in our conversation. His attention is fully on the airfoil. Is it... It's safe? Bailey felt his stomach contract at the thought of playing with the wind in this fashion. He was devoutly glad he had not eaten for some hours. He could not, dared not, be sick in the close confines of the airfoil. The very thought unsettled him further, and he tried to concentrate on something else. He thought of running the strips back on Earth, of racing from one moving strip to its neighboring faster strip, and then to its neighboring still faster strip, and then back down into the slower regions, leaning expertly into the wind either way, in one direction as one fastered, an odd word used by no one but strip racers, and in the other direction as one slowered, in his younger days, Bailey could do it without pause and without error. Daniil had adjusted to the need without trouble, and the one time they had run the strips together, Daniil had done it perfectly. Well, this was just the same. The airfoil was running strips. Absolutely. It was the same. Not quite the same, to be sure. In the city, the speed of the strips was a fixed quantity. What wind there was blew in absolutely predictable fashion, since it was only the result of the movement of the strips. Here in the storm, however, the wind had a mind of its own, or rather, it depended on so many variables, Bailey was deliberately striving for rationality, that it seemed to have a mind of its own, and Giscard had to allow for that. That was all. Otherwise, it was just running the strips with an added complication— the strips were moving at variable and sharply changing speeds. Bailey muttered, What if we blow into a tree? Very unlikely, partner Elijah. Giscard is far too skillful for that. And we are only very slightly above the ground, so that the jets are particularly powerful. Then we'll hit a rock. It'll cave us in underneath. We will not hit a rock, partner Elijah. Well, why not? How on earth can Giscard see where he's going anyway? Bailey stared at the darkness ahead. It is just about sunset, said Daniil, and some light is making its way through the clouds. It is enough for us to see by with the help of our headlights, and as it grows darker, Giscard will brighten the headlights. What headlights? asked Bailey rebelliously. You do not see them very well because they have a strong infrared component to which Giscard's eyes are sensitive but yours are not. What's more, the infrared is more penetrating than shorter wave light is, and for that reason is more effective in rain, mist, and fog. Bailey managed to feel some curiosity, even amid his uneasiness. And your eyes, Daniil? My eyes, partner Elisha, are designed to be as similar to those of human beings as possible. That is regrettable, perhaps, at this moment. The airfoil trembled, and Bailey found himself holding his breath again. He said in a whisper, Spacer eyes are still adapted to Earth's sun, even if robot eyes aren't. A good thing, too, if it helps remind them they're descended from Earth people. His voice faded out, 
It was getting darker. He could see nothing at all now, and the intermittent flashes lighted nothing either. They were merely blinding. He closed his eyes, and that didn't help. He was the more conscious of the angry, threatening thunder. Should they not stop? Should they not wait for the worst of the storm to pass? Giscard suddenly said, The vehicle is not reacting properly. Bailey felt the ride become ragged as though the machine was on wheels and was rolling over ridges. Deniel said, Can it be storm damage, friend Giscard? It does not have the feel of that, friend Deniel, nor does it seem likely that this machine would suffer from this kind of damage in this or any other storm. Bailey absorbed the exchange with difficulty. Damage, he muttered. What kind of damage? Giscard said, I should judge the compressor to be leaking, sir, but slowly. It's not the result of an ordinary puncture. Well, how did it happen then? Bailey asked. Deliberate damage, perhaps, while it was outside the administration building. I have known now for some little time that we are being followed and carefully not being overtaken. Why, Giscard? A possibility, sir, is that they are waiting for us to break down completely the airfoil's motion was becoming more ragged. Can you make it to Dr. Fastolf's? It would not seem so, sir. Bailey tried to fling his reeling mind into action. In that case, I've completely misjudged Amadero's reason for delaying us. He was keeping us there to have one or more of his robots damage the airfoil in such a way as to bring us down in the midst of desolation and lightning. But why should he do that? said Daniil, sounding shocked. To get you, in a way, he already had you. He doesn't want me. No one wants me, said Bailey with a somewhat feeble anger. The danger is to you, Daniil. To me, partner Elijah. Yes, you, Daniil. Giscard, choose a safe place to come down, and as soon as you do, Daniil must get out of the car and be off to a place of safety. Daniil said, That is impossible, partner Elijah. I could not leave you when you are feeling ill and most especially if there are those who pursue us and might do you harm. Bailey said, Daniil, they're pursuing you. You must leave. As for me, I will stay in the airfoil. I am in no danger. How can I believe that? Please, please. How can I explain the whole thing with everything spinning? Daniil. Bailey's voice grew desperately calm. You are the most important individual here, far more important than Giscard and I put together. It's not just that I care for you and want no harm to come to you. All of humanity depends on you. Don't worry about me. I'm one man. Worry about billions. To kneel, please. 63. Bailey could feel himself rocking back and forth. Or was it the airfoil? Was it breaking up altogether? Or was Giscard losing control? Or was he taking evasive action? Bailey didn't care. He didn't care. Let the airfoil crash. Let it smash to bits. He would welcome oblivion. Anything to get rid of this terrible fright. This total inability to come to terms with the universe except that he had to make sure that Daniil got away, safely away. But how? Everything was unreal, and he was not going to be able to explain anything to these robots. The situation was so clear to him, but how was he to transfer this understanding to these robots, to these non-men who understood nothing but their three laws, and who would let all of Earth and, in the long run, all of humanity go to hell because they could only be concerned with the one man under their noses. Why had robots ever been invented? And then, oddly enough, Giscard, the lesser of the two, came to his aid. He said in his contentless voice, Friend Daniil, I cannot keep this airfoil in motion much longer. Perhaps it will be more suitable to do as Mr. Bailey suggests. He has given you a very strong order, can I leave him when he is unwell, friend Giscard? said Daniil, perplexed. You cannot take him out into the storm with you, friend Daniil. Moreover, he seems so anxious for you to leave that it may do him harm for you to stay. 
Bailey felt himself reviving. Yes, yes, he managed to croak out. As Giscard says, <laughs> Giscard, you go with him. Hide him. Make sure he doesn't return. Then come back for me. Daniil said forcefully, That cannot be, partner Elijah. We cannot leave you alone, untended, unguarded. No danger. I am in no danger. Do as I say. Giscard said, Those following are probably robots. Human beings would hesitate to come out in the storm, and robots would not harm Mr. Bailey. Daniil said, They might take him away. Not into the storm, friend Daniil, since that would work obvious harm to him. I will bring the airfoil to a halt now, friend Daniil. You must be ready to do as Mr. Bailey orders. I, too. Good, whispered Bailey. Good. He was grateful for the simpler brain that could more easily be impressed and that lacked the ability to get lost and uncertain in ever-expanding refinements. Vaguely, he thought of Daniil trapped between his perception of Bailey's ill-being and the urgency of the order, and of his brain snapping under the conflict. Bailey thought, No, no, Daniil, just do as I say and don't question it. He lacked the strength, almost the will to articulate it, and he let the order remain a thought. The airfoil came down with a bump and a short, harsh scraping noise. The doors flew open, one on either side, and then closed with a soft, sighing noise. At once, the robots were gone. Having come to their decision, there was no hesitation, and they moved with a speed that human beings could not duplicate. Bailey took a deep breath and shuddered. The airfoil was rock-steady now. It was part of the ground. He was suddenly aware of how much of his misery had been the result of the swaying and bucking of the vehicle, the feeling of insubstantiality, of not being connected to the universe, but of being at the mercy of inanimate, uncaring forces. Now, however, it was still, and he opened his eyes. He had not been aware that they had been closed. There was still lightning on the horizon, and the thunder was a subdued mutter, while the wind, meeting a more resistant and less yielding object now than it had hitherto, keened a higher note than before. It was dark. Bailey's eyes were no more than human, and he saw no light of any kind other than the occasional blip of lightning. The sun must surely have set, and the clouds were thick. And, for the first time since Bailey had left Earth, he was alone. 64. Alone. He had been too ill, too beside himself to make proper sense. Even now he found himself struggling to understand what it was he should have done and would have done if he had had room in his tottering mind for more than the one thought that Daniil must leave. For instance, he had not asked where he now was, what he was near, where Daniil and Giscard were planning to go. He did not know of how any portion of the grounded airfoil worked. He could not, of course, make it move, but he might have had it supply heat if he felt cold or turn off the heat if there were too much, except that he did not know how to direct the machine to do either. He did not know how to opacify the windows if he wanted to be enclosed, or how to open a door if he wanted to leave. The only thing he could do now was to wait for Giscard to come back for him. Surely that was what Giscard would expect him to do. The orders to him had simply been, Come back for me. There had been no indication that Bailey would change position in any way, and Giscard's clear and uncluttered mind would surely interpret the come back with the assumption that he was to come back to the airfoil. Bailey tried to adjust himself to that. In a way, it was a relief merely to wait, to have to make no decisions for a while, because there were no decisions he could possibly make. It was a relief to be steady and to feel at rest, and to be rid of the terrible light flashes and the disturbing crashes of sound. Perhaps he might even allow himself to go to sleep. And then he stiffened. Dare he do that? 
They were being pursued. They were under observation. The airfoil, while parked and waiting for them outside the administration building of the Robotics Institute, had been tampered with, and no doubt the tamperers would soon be upon him. He was waiting for them, too, and not for Giscard only. Had he thought it out clearly in the midst of his misery? The machine had been tampered with outside the administration building. That might have been done by anyone, but most likely by someone who knew it was there. And who would know that better than Amadiro? Amadiro had intended delay until the storm. That was obvious. He was to travel in the storm, and he was to break down in the storm. Amadiro had studied Earth and its population. He boasted of that. He would know quite clearly just what difficulty Earth people would have with the outside generally, and with a thunderstorm in particular. He would be quite certain that Bailey would be reduced to complete helplessness. But why should he want that? To bring Bailey back to the Institute? He had already had him, but he had had a Bailey in the full possession of his faculties, and along with him he had had two robots perfectly capable of defending Bailey physically. It would be different now. If the airfoil were disabled in a storm, Bailey would be disabled emotionally. He would even be unconscious, perhaps, and would certainly not be able to resist being brought back. Nor would the two robots object. With Bailey clearly ill, their only appropriate reaction would be to assist Amadiro's robots in rescuing him. In fact, the two robots would have to come along with Bailey and would do so helplessly. And if anyone ever questioned Amadiro's action, he could say that he had feared for Bailey in the storm, that he had tried to keep him at the Institute and failed, that he had sent his robots to trail him and assure his safety, and that, when the airfoil came to grief in the storm, those robots brought Bailey back to Haven. Unless people understood that it had been Amadiro who had ordered the airfoil tampered with, and who would believe that, and how could one prove it? the only possible public reaction would be to praise Amadiro for his humanitarian feelings, all the more astonishing for having been expressed toward a subhuman earthman. And what would Amadiro do with Bailey then? Nothing, except to keep him quiet and helpless for a time. Bailey was not himself the quarry. That was the point. Amadiro would also have two robots, and they would now be helpless. Their instructions forced them, in the strongest manner, to guard Bailey, and if Bailey were ill and being cared for, they could only follow Amadiro's orders if those orders were clearly and apparently for Bailey's benefit. Nor would Bailey be, perhaps, sufficiently himself to protect them with further orders, certainly not if he were kept under sedation. It was clear. It was clear. Amadiro had had Bailey, Daniil, and Giscard, but in unusable fashion. He had sent them out into the storm in order to bring them back and have them again in usable fashion. Especially Daniil. It was Daniil who was the key. To be sure, Fastolf would be searching for them eventually and would find them too and retrieve them. But by then it would be too late, wouldn't it? And what did Amadiro want with Daniil? Bailey, his head aching, was sure he knew, but how could he possibly prove it? He could think no more. If he could opacify the windows, he could make a little interior world again, enclosed and motionless, and then maybe he could continue his thoughts. But he did not know how to opacify the windows, he could only sit there and look at the flagging storm beyond those windows, hear the whip of rain against the windows, watch the fading lightning, and listen to the muttering thunder. He closed his eyes tightly. The eyelids made a wall, too, but he dared not sleep. The car door on his right opened. He heard the sighing noise it made. He felt the cool, damp breeze enter the temperature drop, the sharp smell of things green and wet enter and drown out the faint and friendly smell of oil and upholstery, 
that reminded him somehow of the city that he wondered if he would ever see again. He opened his eyes, and there was the odd sensation of a robotic face staring at him and drifting sideways, yet not really moving. Bailey felt dizzy. The robot, seen as a darker shadow against the darkness, seemed a large one. He had, somehow, an air of capability about him. He said, Your pardon, sir. Did you not have the company of two robots? Gone, muttered Bailey, acting as ill as he could, and aware that it did not require acting. A brighter flash of the heavens made its way through the eyelids that were now half open. Gone? Gone where, sir? And then, as he waited for an answer, he said, are you ill, sir? Bailey felt a distant twinge of satisfaction within the inner scrap of himself that was still capable of thinking. If the robot had been without special instruction, he would have responded to Bailey's clear signs of illness before doing anything else. To have asked first about the robots implied hard and close-pressed directions as to their importance. It fit. He tried to assume a strength and normality he did not possess and said, I am well. Don't concern yourself with me. It could not possibly have convinced an ordinary robot, but this one had been so intensified in connection with Daniil, obviously, that he accepted it. He said, Where have the robots gone, sir? Back to the Robotics Institute. To the Institute? Why, sir? They were called by Master Roboticist Amadero, and he ordered them to return. I am waiting for them. But why did you not go with them, sir? Master Roboticist Amadero did not wish me to be exposed to the storm. He ordered me to wait here. I am following Master Roboticist Amadero's orders. He hoped the repetition of the prestige-filled name with the inclusion of the honorific, together with the repetition of the word order, would have its effect on the robot and persuade him to leave Bailey where he was. On the other hand, if they had been instructed with particular care to bring back Daniil, and if they were convinced that Daniil was already on his way back to the Institute, there would be a decline in the intensity of their need and connection with that robot. They would have time to think of Bailey again. They would say, the robot said, but it appears you are not well, sir. Bailey felt another twinge of satisfaction. He said, I am well. Behind the robot, he could vaguely see a crowding of several other robots. He could not count them, with their faces gleaming in the occasional lightning flash. As Bailey's eyes adapted to the return of darkness, he could see the dim shine of their eyes. He turned his head, there were robots at the left door, too, though that remained closed. How many had Amadero sent? Were they to have been returned by force, if necessary? He said, Master Roboticist Amadero's orders were that my robots were to return to the Institute and I was to wait. You see that they are returning and that I am waiting. If you are sent to help, if you have a vehicle, find the robots who are on their way back and transport them. This airfoil is no longer operative. He tried to say it all without hesitation and firmly, as a well man would. He did not entirely succeed. They have returned on foot, sir. Bailey said, Find them. Your orders are clear. There was hesitation. Clear hesitation. Bailey finally remembered to move his right foot. He hoped properly. He should have done it before, but his physical body was not responding properly to his thoughts. Still, the robots hesitated, and Bailey grieved over that. He was not a spacer. He did not know the proper words, the proper tone, the proper air with which to handle robots with the proper efficiency. A skilled roboticist could, with a gesture, a lift of an eyebrow, direct a robot as though it were a marionette of which he held the strings especially if the robot were of his own design. But Bailey was only an Earthman. He frowned. That was easy to do in his misery, and whispered a weary, Go, 
and motioned with his hands. Perhaps that added the last small and necessary quantity of weight to his order. Or perhaps an end had simply been reached to the time it took for the robot's positronic pathways to determine, by voltage and counter-voltage, how to sort out their instructions according to the three laws. Either way, they had made up their minds, and, after that, there was no further hesitation. They moved back to their vehicle, whatever and wherever it was, with such determined speed that they seemed simply to disappear. The door the robot had held open now closed of its own accord. Bailey had moved his foot in order to place it in the pathway of the closing door. He wondered distantly if his foot would be cut off cleanly or if its bones would be crushed, but he didn't move it. Surely no vehicle would be designed to make such a misadventure possible. He was alone again. He had forced robots to leave a patently unwell human being by playing on the force of the orders given them by a competent robot master who had been intent on strengthening the second law for his own purposes and had done it to the point where Bailey's own quite apparent lies had subordinated the first law to it. How well he had done it, Bailey thought with distant self-satisfaction, and became aware that the door which had swung shut was still ajar, held so by his foot, and that that foot had not been the least bit damaged as a result. 65. Bailey felt cool air curling about his foot and a sprinkle of cool water. It was a frighteningly abnormal thing to sense, yet he could not allow the door to close, for he would then not know how to open it, how did the robots open those doors? Undoubtedly, it was no puzzle to members of the culture, but in his reading on Aurora in Life, there was no careful instruction of just how one opens the door of a standard airfoil. Everything of importance is taken for granted. You're supposed to know, even though you are, in theory, being informed. He was groping in his pockets as he thought this, and even the pockets were not easy to find. They were not in the right places, and they were sealed, so that they had to be opened by fumbles till he found the precise motion that caused the seal to part. He pulled out a handkerchief, balled it, and placed it between the door and jam so that the door would not entirely close. He then removed his foot. Now to think, if he could. There was no point to keeping the door open unless he meant to get out. Was there, however, any purpose in getting out? If he waited where he was, Giscard would eventually come back for him and presumably lead him to safety. Dare he wait? He did not know how long it would take Giscard to see Daniil to safety and then return. But neither did he know how long it would take the pursuing robots to decide they would not find Daniil and Giscard on any road leading back to the Institute, Surely it was impossible that Daniil and Giscard had actually moved backward toward the Institute in search of sanctuary. Bailey had not actually ordered them not to, but what if that were the only feasible route? No, impossible. Bailey shook his head in silent denial of the possibility and felt it ache in response. He put his hands to it and gritted his teeth. How long would the pursuing robots continue to search before they would decide that Bailey had misled them or had been himself misled? Would they then return and take him in custody, very politely and with great care not to harm him? Could he hold them off by telling them he would die if exposed to the storm? Would they believe that? Would they call the Institute to report? Surely they would do that. And would human beings then arrive? They would not be overly concerned about his welfare. If Bailey got out of the car and found some hiding place in the surrounding trees, it would be that much harder for the pursuing robots to locate him, and that would gain him time. It would also be harder for Giscard to locate him, but Giscard would be under a much more intense instruction to guard Bailey than the pursuing robots were to find him. The primary task of the former would be to locate Bailey, and of the latter to locate Daniil. 
Besides, Giscard was programmed by Fastolf himself, and Amadiro, however skillful, was no match for Fastolf. Surely, then, all things being equal, Giscard would be back before the other robots could possibly be. But would all things be equal? With a faint attempt at cynicism, Bailey thought, I'm worn out and can't really think. I'm merely seizing desperately at whatever will console me. Still, what could he do but play the odds as he conceived the odds to be? He leaned against the door and was out into the open. The handkerchief fell out into the wet, rank grass, and he automatically bent down to pick it up, holding it in his hands as he staggered away from the car. He was overwhelmed by the gusts of rain that soaked his face and hands. After a short while, his wet clothes were clinging to his body, and he was shivering with cold. There was a piercing splitting of the sky, too quick for him to close his eyes against, and then a sharp hammering that stiffened him in terror and made him clap his hands over his ears. Had the storm returned? Or did it sound louder only because he was out in the open? He had to move. He had to move away from the car so that the pursuers would not find him too easily. He must not waver and remain in its vicinity, or he might as well have stayed inside and dry. He tried to wipe his face with the handkerchief, but it was as wet as his face was, and he let it go. It was useless. He moved on, hands outstretched. Was there a moon that circled Aurora? He seemed to recall there had been mention of such a thing, and he would have welcomed its light. But what did it matter? Even if it existed and were in the sky now, the clouds would obscure it. He felt something. He could not see what it was, but he knew it to be the rough bark of a tree. Undoubtedly a tree. Even a city man would know that much. And then he remembered that lightning might hit trees and might kill people. He could not remember that he had ever read a description of how it felt to be hit by lightning or if there were any measures to prevent it. He knew of no one on earth who had been hit by lightning. He felt his way about the tree and was in an agony of apprehension and fear. How much was halfway around so that he would end up moving in the same direction? Onward. The underbrush was thick now and hard to get through. It was like bony, clutching fingers holding him. He pulled petulantly, and he heard the tearing of cloth. Onward. His teeth were chattering, and he was trembling. Another flash. Not a bad one. For a moment, he caught a glimpse of his surroundings. Trees. A number of them. He was in a grove of trees, were many trees more dangerous than one tree where lightning was concerned? He didn't know. Would it help if he didn't actually touch a tree? He didn't know that either. Death by lightning simply wasn't a factor in the cities, and the historical novels, and sometimes histories, that mentioned it never went into detail. He looked up at the dark sky and felt the wetness coming down, he wiped at his wet eyes with his wet hands. He stumbled onward, trying to step high. At one point, he splashed through a narrow stream of water, sliding over the pebbles underlaying it. How strange. It made him no wetter than he was. He went on again. The robots would not find him. Would Giscard? He didn't know where he was or where he was going, or how far he was from anything. If he wanted to return to the car, he couldn't. If he was trying to find himself, he couldn't. And the storm would continue forever, and he would finally dissolve and pour down in a little stream of Bailey, and no one would ever find him again. And his dissolved molecules would float down to the ocean. Was there an ocean on Aurora? Of course there was. It was larger than Earth's, but there was more ice at the Auroran poles. Ah, he would float to the ice and freeze there, 
glistening in the cold orange sun. His hands were touching a tree again. Wet hands, wet tree, rumble of thunder. Funny he didn't see the flash of lightning. Lightning came first. Was he hit? He didn't feel anything except the ground. The ground was under him because his fingers were scrabbling into cold mud. He turned his head so he could breathe. It was rather comfortable. He didn't have to walk anymore. He could wait. Gisgard would find him. He was suddenly very sure of it. Gisgard would have to find him because... No, he had forgotten the because. It was the second time he had forgotten something. Before he went to sleep, was it the same thing he had forgotten each time? The same thing. It didn't matter. It would be all right. All. And he lay there, alone and unconscious, in the rain at the base of a tree, while the storm beat on. Chapter 16 Again Glodaya 66 Afterward, looking back and estimating times, it would appear that Bailey had remained unconscious not less than ten minutes and not more than twenty. At the time, though, it might have been anything from zero to infinity. He was conscious of a voice. He could not hear the words it spoke, just a voice. He puzzled over the fact that it sounded odd and solved the matter to his satisfaction by recognizing it as a woman's voice. There were arms around him, lifting him, heaving him. One arm, his arm, dangled. His head lolled. He tried feebly to straighten out, but nothing happened. The woman's voice again. He opened his eyes wearily. He was aware of being cold and wet, and suddenly realized that water was not striking him. And it was not dark, not entirely. There was a dim suffusing of light, and by it, he saw a robot's face. He recognized it. Giscard, he whispered. And with that, he remembered the storm and the flight. And Giscard had reached him first. He had found him before the other robots had. Bailey thought contentedly. I knew he would. He let his eyes close again and felt himself moving rapidly, but with the slight yet definite unevenness that meant he was being carried by someone who was walking. Then a stop and a slow adjustment until he was resting on something quite warm and comfortable. He knew it was the seat of a car, covered perhaps with toweling, but did not question how he knew. Then there was the sensation of smooth motion through the air and the feeling of soft, absorbent fabric over his face and hands, the tearing open of his blouse, cold air upon his chest, and then the drying and blotting again. After that, the sensations crowded in upon him. He was in an establishment. There were flashes of walls, of illumination, of objects, miscellaneous shapes of furnishings, which he saw now and then when he opened his eyes. He felt his clothes being stripped off methodically and made a few feeble and useless attempts to cooperate. Then he felt warm water and vigorous scrubbing. It went on and on, and he didn't want it to stop. At one point, a thought occurred to him, and he seized the arm that was holding him. Giscard! Giscard! He heard Giscard's voice. I am here, sir. Giscard! Is Daniil safe? He is quite safe, sir. Good. Bailey closed his eyes again and made no effort whatever in connection with the drying. He felt himself turned over and over in the stream of dry air, and then he was being dressed again in something like a warm robe. Luxury. Nothing like this had happened to him since he was an infant, 
and he was suddenly sorry for the babies for whom everything was done and who were not sufficiently conscious of it to enjoy it. Or did they? Was the hidden memory of that infant luxury a determinant of adult behavior? Was his own feeling now just an expression of the delight of being an infant again? And he had heard a woman's voice. Mother? No. That couldn't possibly be. Mama? He was sitting in a chair now. He could sense as much and could also feel, somehow, that the short, happy period of renewed infancy was coming to an end. He had to return to the sad world of self-consciousness and self-help. But there had been a woman's voice. What woman? Bailey opened his eyes. Glodiah? 67. It was a question, a surprised question, but deep within himself he was not really surprised. Thinking back, he had, of course, recognized her voice. He looked around. Giscard was standing in his alcove, but he ignored him. First things first. He said, Where's Daniil? Glodiah said, He has cleaned and dried himself in the robot's quarters, and he has dry clothing. He is surrounded by my household staff, and they have their instructions. I can tell you that no outsider will approach within fifty meters of my establishment in any direction without our all knowing it at once. Giscard is cleaned and dried as well. Yes, I can see that, said Bailey. He was not concerned with Giscard, only with Daniil. He was relieved that Gladia seemed to accept the necessity of guarding Daniil, and that he would not have to face the complications of explaining the matter. Yet there was one breach in the wall of security, and a note of querulousness entered in his voice as he said, Why did you leave him, Gladia? With you gone, there was no human being in the house to stop the approach of a band of outside robots. Daniil could have been taken by force. Nonsense said Glodiah with spirit. We were not gone long, and Dr. Fastolf had been informed. Many of his robots had joined mine, and he could be on the spot in minutes if needed. And I'd like to see any band of outside robots withstand him. Have you seen Daniil since you returned, Glodiah? Of course. He's safe, I tell you. Thank you. Bailey relaxed and closed his eyes. Oddly enough, he thought, it wasn't so bad. Of course it wasn't. He had survived, hadn't he? When he thought that, something inside himself grinned and was happy. He had survived, hadn't he? He opened his eyes and said, How did you find me, Glodiah? It was Giscard. They had come here, both of them, and Giscard explained the situation to me quickly. I set right about securing Daniil, but he wouldn't budge until I had promised to order Giscard out after you. He was very eloquent. His responses with respect to you are very intense, Elijah. Daniil remained behind, of course. It made him very unhappy, but Giscard insisted that I order him to stay at the very top of my voice. You must have given Giscard some mighty strict orders. Then we got in touch with Dr. Fastolf, and after that, we took my personal airfoil. Bailey shook his head wearily. You should not have come along, Gladiah. Your place was here, making sure Daniil was safe. Gladiah's face twisted into scorn. And leave you dying in the storm, for all we knew, or being taken up by Dr. Fastolf's enemies. I have a little holograph of myself letting that happen. No, Elijah, I might have been needed to keep the other robots away from you if they had gotten to you first. I may not be much good in most ways, but any Solarian can handle a mob of robots, let me tell you. We're used to it. But how did you find me? It wasn't so terribly hard. Actually, your airfoil wasn't far away, so that we could have walked it. Except for the storm. We... Bailey said, You mean we had almost made it to Fastolf's? Yes, said Gladiah. Either your airfoil and being damaged wasn't damaged sufficiently to force you to a standstill sooner, or Giscard's skill kept it going for longer than the Vandals had anticipated, which is a good thing. If you'd come down closer to the Institute, 
They might have gotten you all. Anyway, we took my airfoil to where yours had come down. Giscard knew where it was, of course, and we got out. And you got all wet, didn't you, Glodaya? Not a bit, she replied. I had a large rain shade and a light sphere, too. My shoes got muddy and my feet got a little damp because I didn't have time to spray on latex, but there's no harm in that. Anyway, we were back at your airfoil less than half an hour after Giscard and Daniil had left you, and, of course, you weren't there. Well, I had tried, began Bailey. Yes, we know. I thought they, the others, had taken you away because Giscard said you were being followed. But Giscard found your handkerchief about 50 meters from the airfoil, and he said that you must have wandered off in that direction. Giscard said it was an illogical thing to do, but that human beings were often illogical, so that we should search for you. So we looked, both of us, using the light sphere, but it was he who found you. He said he saw the infrared glimmer of your body heat at the base of the tree, and we brought you back. Bailey said, with a spark of annoyance, Why was my leaving an illogical thing to do? He didn't say, Elisha. Do you wish to ask him? She gestured toward Giscard. Bailey said, Giscard, what's this? Giscard's impassivity was disrupted at once, and his eyes focused on Bailey. He said, I felt that you had exposed yourself to the storm unnecessarily. If you had waited, we would have brought you here sooner. The other robots might have gotten to me first. They did, but you had sent them away, sir. How do you know that? There were many robotic footprints around the doors on either side, sir. But there was no sign of dampness within the airfoil, as there would have been if wet arms had reached in to lift you out. I judged you would not have gotten out of the airfoil of your own accord in order to join them, sir. And, having sent them away, you need not have feared they would return very quickly, since it was Daniil they were after, by your own estimate of the situation, and not you. In addition, you might have been certain that I would have been back quickly. Bailey muttered, I reasoned precisely in that manner, but I felt that confusing the issue might help further. I did what seemed best to me, and you did find me, even so. Yes, sir. Bailey said, but Why bring me here? If we were close to Glodaya's establishment, we were just as close, perhaps closer to Dr. Fastolf's. Not quite, sir. This residence was somewhat closer, and I judged, from the urgency of your orders, that every moment counted in securing Daniil's safety. Daniil concurred in this, though he was most reluctant to leave you. Once he was here, I felt you would want to be here too, so that you could, if you desired, assure yourself of his safety firsthand. Bailey nodded and said grumpily, he was still annoyed at that remark concerning his illogicality, you did well, Giscard. Glodaya said, Is it important that you see Dr. Fastolf, Elijah? I can have him summoned here, or you can view him trimensionally. Bailey leaned back in his chair again. He had leisure to realize that his thought processes were blunted and that he was very tired. It would do him no good to face Fastolf now. He said, No, I'll see him tomorrow after breakfast time enough. And then I think I'll be seeing this man, Kelton Amadiro, the head of the Robotics Institute, and a high official, what do you call him, the chairman. He will be there too, I suppose. You look terribly tired, Elijah, said Glodaya. Of course, we don't have those microorganisms, those germs and viruses that you have on Earth, and you've been cleaned out, so you won't get any of the diseases they have all over your planet. But you're clearly tired. Bailey thought, After all that, no cold, no flu, no pneumonia? There was something to being on a spacer world at that. He said, I admit I'm tired, but that can be cured by a bit of rest. Are you hungry? It's dinner time. Bailey made a face. I don't feel like eating. I'm not sure that's wise. You don't want a heavy meal, perhaps, but how about some hot soup? It will do you good. Bailey felt the urge to smile. She might be Solarian, but given the proper circumstances, she sounded exactly like an Earth woman. 
He suspected that this would be true of Aurorans as well. There are some things that differences in culture don't touch. He said, Do you have soup available? I don't want to be a problem. How can you be a problem? I have a staff, not a large one, as on Solaria, but enough to prepare any reasonable item of food on short order. Now you just sit there and tell me what kind of soup you would like. It will all be taken care of. Bailey couldn't resist. Chicken soup? Of course. Then, innocently, just what I would have suggested, and with lumps of chicken so that it will be substantial. The bowl was put before him with surprising speed. He said, Aren't you going to eat, Gladia? I've eaten already, while you were being bathed and treated. Treated? Only routine biochemical adjustment, Elijah. You had been rather psychic damaged, and we wanted no repercussions. Do eat. Bailey lifted an experimental spoonful to his lips. It was not bad chicken soup, though it had the queer tendency of a roaring food to be rather spicier than Bailey would prefer. Or perhaps it was prepared with different spices than those he was used to. He remembered his mother suddenly, a sharp thrust of memory that made her appear younger than he himself was right now, he remembered her standing over him when he rebelled at eating his nice soup. She would say to him, Come, Lige, this is real chicken and very expensive. Even the spacers don't have anything better. They didn't. He called to her in his mind across the years. They don't, Mom. Really? If he could trust memory and allow for the power of youthful taste buds, his mother's chicken soup, when it wasn't dulled by repetition, was far superior. He sipped again and again, and when he finished, he muttered in a shame-faced way, Would there be a little more? As much as you want, Elijah. Just a little more. Glodiah said to him as he was finishing, Elijah, this meeting tomorrow morning, yes, Glodiah. Does it mean that your investigation is over? Do you know what happened to Jander? Bailey said judiciously, I have an idea as to what might have happened to Jander. I don't think I can necessarily persuade anyone that I am right. Then why are you having the conference? It's not my idea, Glodiah. It's Master Roboticist Amadiro's idea. He objects to the investigation, and he's going to try to have me sent back to Earth. Is he the one who tampered with your airfoil and tried to have his robots take Daniil? I think he is. Well, can't he be tried and convicted and punished for that? He certainly could, said Bailey feelingly, except for the very small problem that I can't prove it. And he can do all that and get away with it, and stop the investigation too. I'm afraid he has a good chance of being able to do so. As he himself says, people who don't expect justice don't have to suffer disappointment. But he mustn't. You mustn't let him. You've got to complete your investigation and find out the truth. Bailey sighed. What if I can't find out the truth? Or what if I can but can't make people listen to me? You can find out the truth. And you can make people listen to you. You have a touching faith in me, Gladia. Still, if the Auroran World Legislature wants to send me back and orders the investigation ended, there's nothing I'm going to be able to do about it. Surely you won't be willing to go back with nothing accomplished? Of course I won't. It's worse than just accomplishing nothing, Gladia. I'll go back with my career ruined and with Earth's future destroyed. Then don't let them do that, Elijah. And he said, Jehoshaphat, Gladiah, I'm going to try not to, but I can't lift a planet with my bare hands. You can't ask me for miracles. Gladiah nodded, and eyes downcast, put her fist to her mouth, sitting there motionlessly, as though in thought. It took a while for Bailey to realize that she was weeping soundlessly. 68. Bailey stood up quickly and walked around the table to her. He noted, absently and with some annoyance, that his legs were trembling and that there was a tick in the muscle of his right thigh. 
Gladaya, he said urgently. Don't cry. Don't bother, Elisha, she whispered. It will pass. He stood helplessly at her side, reaching out to her, yet hesitating. I'm not touching you, he said. I don't think I'd better do so, but... Oh, touch me. Touch me. I'm not all that fond of my body, and I won't catch anything from you. I'm not what I used to be. So Bailey reached out and touched her elbow and stroked it very slightly and clumsily with his fingertips. I'll do what I can tomorrow, Gladiah, he said. I'll give it my very best try. She rose at that, turned toward him and said, Oh, Elijah. Automatically, scarcely knowing what he was doing, Bailey held out his arms. And just as automatically, she walked into them, and he was holding her while her head cradled against his chest. He held her as lightly as he could, waiting for her to realize that she was embracing an Earthman. She had undoubtedly embraced a humaniform robot, but he had been no Earthman. She sniffed loudly and spoke while her mouth was half obscured in Bailey's shirt. She said, It isn't fair. It's because I'm a Solarian. No one really cares what happened to Jander, and they would if I were an Auroran. It just boils down to prejudice and politics. Bailey thought, Spacers are people. This is exactly what Jesse would say in a similar situation. And if it were Graminus who was holding Gladia, he'd say exactly what I'll say. If I knew what I would say. And then he said, That's not entirely so. I'm sure Dr. Fastolf cares what happened to Jander. No, he doesn't. No, really. He just wants to have his way in the legislature. And that Amadero wants to have his way, and either one would trade Jander for his way. I promise you, Gladia, I won't trade Jander for anything. No? If they tell you that you can go back to Earth with your career saved and no penalty for your world, provided you forget all about Jander, what would you do? There's no use setting up hypothetical situations that can't possibly come to pass. They're not going to give me anything in return for abandoning Jander. They're just going to try to send me back with nothing at all except ruin for me and my world. But if they were to let me, I would get the man who destroyed Jander and see to it that he was adequately punished. What do you mean, if they were to let you? Make them let you. Bailey smiled bitterly. If you think Aurorans pay no attention to you because you're a Solarian, imagine how little you would get if you were from Earth as I am. He held her closer, forgetting he was from Earth, even as he said the word. But I'll try, Gladia. It's no use raising hopes, but I don't have a completely empty hand. I'll try. His voice trailed off. You keep saying you'll try, but how? She pushed away from him a bit to look up into his face. Bailey said, bewildered, Why, I may. Find the murderer? Whatever. Gladiah, please, uh, I must sit down. He reached out for the table, leaning on it. She said, What is it, Elijah? I've had a difficult day, obviously, and I haven't quite recovered, I think. You'd better go to bed, then. To tell the truth, Gladiah, I would like to. She released him, her face full of concern and with no further room in it for tears. She lifted her arm and made a rapid motion, and he was, it seemed to him, surrounded by robots at once. And when he was in bed eventually, and the last robot had left him, he found himself staring up at darkness. He could not tell whether it was still raining outside or whether some feeble lightning flashes were still making their last sleepy sparks, but he knew he heard no thunder. He drew a deep breath and thought, Now what is it I have promised Gladiah? What will happen tomorrow?
Last act. Failure. And as Bailey drifted into the borderland of sleep, he thought of that unbelievable flash of illumination that had come before sleep. 69. Twice before it had happened. Once the night before when, as now, he was falling asleep, and once earlier this evening when he had slipped into unconsciousness beneath the tree in the storm. Each time, something had occurred to him, some enlightenment that had unmystified the problem as the lightning had undarkened the night. And it had stayed with him as briefly as the lightning had. What was it? Would it come to him again? This time, he tried consciously to seize it, to catch the elusive truth. Or was it the elusive illusion? Was it the slipping away of conscious reason and the coming of attractive nonsense that one couldn't analyze properly in the absence of a properly thinking brain? The search for whatever it was, however, slid slowly away. It would no more come on call than a unicorn would in a world in which unicorns did not exist. It was easier to think of Glodaya and of how she had felt. There had been the direct touch of the silkiness of her blouse, but beneath it were the small and delicate arms, the smooth back. Would he have dared to kiss her if his legs had not begun to buckle beneath him, or would that have been going too far? He heard his breath exhale in a soft snore, and, as always, that embarrassed him. He flogged himself awake and thought of Glodaya again. Before he left, surely, but not if he could gain nothing for her and re... Would that be payment for services rent? He heard the soft snore again and cared less this time. Glodaya... He had never thought he would see her again, let alone touch her, let alone hold her. Hold her. And he had no way of telling at what point he passed from thought to dream. He was holding her again, as before, but there was no blouse, and her skin was warm and soft, and his hand moved slowly down the slope of shoulder blade and down the hidden ridges of her ribs. There was a total aura of reality about it. All of his senses were engaged. He smelled her hair, and his lips tasted the faint, faint salt of her skin. And now, somehow, they were no longer standing. Had they lain down? Or were they lying down from the start? And what had happened to the light? He felt the mattress beneath him and the cover over him. Darkness. And she was still in his arms, and her body was bare. He was shocked awake. Glodaya? Rising inflection, disbelieving. Shh, Elisha. She placed the fingers of one hand gently on his lips. Don't say anything. She might as well have asked him to stop the current of his blood. He said, What are you doing? She said, Don't you know what I'm doing? I'm in bed with you. But why? Because I want to. Her body moved against his. She pinched the top of his night garment, and the seam that held it together fell apart. Don't move, Elijah. You're tired, and I don't want you to wear yourself out further. Elijah felt a warmth stirring within him. He decided not to protect Gladiah against herself. He said, I'm not that tired, Gladiah. No, she said sharply. Rest. I want you to rest. Don't move. Her mouth was on his as though intent on forcing him to keep quiet. He relaxed, and the small thought flitted past him that he was following orders, 
that he was tired and was willing to be done to rather than to do, and, tinged with shame, it occurred to him that it rather diluted his guilt. I couldn't help it, he heard himself say. She made me. Gee, Josephat, how cowardly, how unbearably demeaning. But those thoughts washed away, too. Somehow there was soft music in the air, and the temperature had risen a bit. The cover had vanished, and so had his nightclothes. He felt his head moved into the cradle of her arms and pressed against softness. With a detached surprise, he knew from her position that the softness was her left breast and that it was centered, contrastingly, with its nipple hard against his lips. Softly she was singing to the music, a sleepily joyful tune he did not recognize. She rocked gently back and forth, and her fingertips grazed his chin and neck. He relaxed, content to do nothing, to let her initiate and carry through every activity. When she moved his arms, he did not resist and let them rest wherever she placed them. He did not help, and when he did respond with heightened excitement and climax, it was only out of helplessness to do otherwise. She seemed tireless, and he did not want her to stop. Aside from the sensuality of sexual response, he felt again what he had felt earlier, the total luxury of the infant's passivity. And finally, he could respond no more, and it seemed she could do no more, and she lay with her head in the hollow where his left shoulder met his chest, and her left arm lay across his ribs, her fingers stroking the short, curling hairs tenderly. He seemed to hear her murmuring, Thank you, thank you. For what, he wondered. He was scarcely conscious of her now, for this utterly soft end of a hard day was as soporific as the fabled Nepenthe, and he could feel himself slipping away as though his fingertips were relaxing from the edge of the cliff of harsh reality in order that he might drop, drop, through the soft clouds of gathering sleep into the slowly swaying ocean of dreams. And as he did so, what had not come on call came of itself. For the third time, the curtain was lifted, and all the events since he had left Earth shuffled once more into hard focus. Again, it was all clear. He struggled to speak, to hear the words he needed to hear, to fix them and make them part of his thought processes. But though he clutched at them with every tendril of his mind, they slipped past and through and were gone. So that, in this respect, Bailey's second day on Aurora ended very much as his first had. Chapter 17 The Chairman 70. When Bailey opened his eyes, it was to find sunlight streaming through the window, and he welcomed it. To his still sleepy surprise, he welcomed it. It meant the storm was over, and it was as though the storm had never happened. Sunlight, when viewed only as an alternative to the smooth, soft, warm, controlled light of the cities, could only be considered harsh and uncertain, but compare it with the storm and it was the promise of peace itself. Everything, Bailey thought, is relative, and he knew he would never think of sunshine as entirely evil again. Partner Elijah, Daniil was standing at the side of the bed, a little behind him stood Giscard. Bailey's long face dissolved in a rare smile of pure pleasure. He held out his hands, one to each. Jehoshaphat, men! And he was totally unaware at the moment of any inappropriateness in the word. 
When I last saw you two together, I wasn't in the least sure I would ever see either of you again. Surely, said Daniil softly, none of us would have been harmed under any circumstances. With the sunlight coming in, I see that, said Bailey. But last night I felt as though the storm would kill me, and I was certain you were in deadly danger, Daniil. It even seemed possible that Giscard might be damaged in some way, trying to defend me against overwhelming odds. <laughs> Melodramatic, I admit. But I wasn't quite myself, you know. We were aware of that, sir, said Giscard. That was what made it difficult for us to leave you, despite your urgent order. We trust that this is not a source of displeasure for you at present. Not at all, Giscard. And, said Daniil, we also know that you have been well cared for since we left you. It was only then that Bailey remembered the events of the night before. Gladiah. He looked about in sudden astonishment. She was not anywhere in the room. Had he imagined? No, of course not. That would be impossible. And then he looked at Daniil with a frown, as though suspecting his remark to bear a libidinous character. But no, that would be impossible too. A robot, however humaniform, would not be designed to take lubricious delight in innuendo. He said, Quite well cared for, but what I need at the moment is to be shown to the personal. We are here, sir, said Giscard, to direct you and help you through the morning. Miss Gladia felt you would be more comfortable with us than with any of her own staff, and she stressed that we were to leave nothing wanting for your comfort. Bailey looked doubtful. How far did she instruct you to go? I feel pretty well now, so I don't have to have anyone wash and dry me. I can take care of myself. She does understand that, I hope. You need fear no embarrassment, partner Elijah, said Daniil with the small smile that, it seemed to Bailey, came at those moments when, in a human being, it might be judged that a feeling of affection would have arisen. We are merely to see to your comfort. If at any time you are most comfortable in privacy, we will wait at some distance. In that case, Daniil, we're all set. Bailey scrambled out of bed. It pleased him to see that he felt quite steady on his legs. The night's rest and the treatment when he was brought back, whatever it might have been, had done marvels. And Gladiah, too. 71. Still nude and just damp enough from his shower to feel thoroughly fresh, Bailey, having brushed his hair, studied the result critically. It seemed natural that he would have breakfast with Gladia, and he wasn't certain how he might be received. It might be best, perhaps, to take the attitude that nothing had happened, and to be guided by her attitude. And somehow, he thought, it might help if he looked reasonably good, provided that was within the realm of the possible. He made a dissatisfied face at his reflection in the mirror. Daniil, he called. Yes, partner Elijah. Speaking through and around toothpaste, Bailey said, Those new clothes you are wearing, it seems. Not mine originally, partner Elijah. They had been friend genders. Bailey's eyebrows climbed. Oh, she let you have genders? Miss Gladiah did not wish me to be unclothed while waiting for my storm-drenched items to be washed and to dry. Those are ready now, but Miss Gladiah says I may keep these. When did she say that? This morning, partner Elijah. Well, she's awake then? Indeed, and you will be joining her at breakfast when you are ready. Bailey's lips tightened. It was odd that at the moment... He was more concerned with having to face Glodaya than, a little later on, the chairman. The matter of the chairman was, after all, in the lap of the fates. He had decided on his strategy, and it would either work or it would not work. As for Glodaya, he simply had no strategy. Well, he would have to face her. He said, with as careful an air of indifference as he might manage, and how is Miss Gladiah this morning? Daniil said, She seems well. Cheerful, depressed? Daniil hesitated. It is difficult to judge the inner attitude of a human being, 
There is nothing in her behavior to indicate internal turmoil. Bailey cast a quick eye on Daniil, and again he wondered if he were referring to the events of last night. And again he dismissed the possibility. Nor did it do any good to study Daniil's face. One could not stare at a robot to guess thoughts from expression, for there were no thoughts in the human sense. He stepped out into the bedroom and looked at the clothes that had been laid out for him, considering them thoughtfully and wondering if he could put them on without error and without requiring robotic help. The storm and the night were over, and he wanted to assume the mantle of adulthood and independence once again. He said, What is this? He held up a long sash covered with an intricately colored arabesque. It is a pajama sash, said Daniil. It is purely ornamental. It passes over the left shoulder and is tied at the right side of the waist. It is traditionally worn at breakfast on some spacer worlds, but is not very popular on Aurora. Then why should I wear it? Miss Glodaya thought it would become you, partner Elijah. The method of tying is rather intricate, and I will be glad to help you. Gee, Hussaphat, thought Bailey ruefully. She wants me to be pretty. What does she have in mind? Don't think about it. Bailey said, Never mind, I'll manage with a simple bow knot. But listen, Daniil, after breakfast, I will be going over to Fastolf's, where I will meet with him, with Amadero, and with the chairman of the legislature. I don't know if there will be any others present. Yes, partner Elijah, I am aware of that. I don't think there will be others present. Well then, said Bailey, beginning to put on his undergarments and doing it slowly so as to make no mistake and thus find it unnecessary to appeal for help to Daniil. Tell me about the chairman. I know from my reading that he is the nearest thing to an executive officer that there is on Aurora, but I gathered from that same reading that the position is purely honorary. He has no power, I take it. Daniil said, I am afraid, partner Elijah. Giscard interrupted, Sir, I am more aware of the political situation on Aurora than friend Daniil is. I have been in operation for much longer. Would you be willing to have me answer the question? Well, why, certainly, Giscard. Go ahead. When the government of Aurora was first set up, sir, began Giscard in a didactic way, as though an information reel within him were methodically spinning. It was intended that the executive officer fulfill only ceremonial duties. He was to greet dignitaries from other worlds, open all meetings of the legislature, preside over its deliberations, and vote only to break a tie. After the river controversy, however, yes, I read about that, said Bailey. It had been a particularly dull episode in Aurora history in which impenetrable arguments over the proper division of hydroelectric power had led to the nearest approach to civil war the planet had ever seen. You needn't go into details. No, sir, said Giscard. After the river controversy, however, there was a general determination never to allow controversy to endanger Aurora society again. It has become customary, therefore, to settle all disputes in a private and peaceable manner outside the legislature. When the legislators finally vote, it is in an agreed-upon fashion, so that there is always a large majority on one side or the other. The key figure in the settlement of disputes is the chairman of the legislature. He is held to be above the struggle, and his power, which although nil in theory is considerable in practice, only holds as long as he is seen to be so. The chairman, therefore, jealously guards his objectivity, and as long as he succeeds in this, it is he who usually makes the decision that settles any controversy in one direction or another. Bailey said, You mean that the chairman will listen to me, to Fastolf and to Amadiro, and then come to a decision? Possibly. On the other hand, sir, he may remain uncertain and require further testimony, further thought, or both. And if the chairman does come to a decision, will Amadero bow to it if it is against him, or will Fastolf bow if it is against him? That is not an absolute necessity. There are almost always some who will not accept the chairman's decision, and both Dr. Amadero and Dr. Fastolf are headstrong and obstinate individuals. 
if one may judge from their actions. Most of the legislators, however, will go along with the chairman's decision, whatever that might be. Dr. Fastolf or Dr. Amadiro, whichever it may be who will be decided against by the chairman, will then be sure to find himself in a small minority when the vote is taken. How sure, Gisgard? Almost sure. The chairman's term of office is ordinarily 30 years, with the opportunity for a re-election by the legislature for another 30 years. If, however, a vote were to go against the chairman's recommendation, the chairman would be forced to resign forthwith, and there would be a governmental crisis while the legislature tried to find another chairman under conditions of bitter dispute. Few legislators are willing to risk that, and the chance of getting a majority to vote against the chairman, when that is the consequence, is almost nil. Then, said Bailey ruefully, everything depends on this morning's conference. That is very likely. Thank you, Giscard. Gloomily, Bailey arranged and rearranged his line of thought. It seemed hopeful to him, but he did not have any idea what Amadiro might say or what the chairman might be like. It was Amadiro who had initiated the meeting, and he must feel confident, sure of himself. It was then that Bailey remembered that once again, when he was falling asleep, with Glodaya in his arms, he had seen, or thought he had seen, or imagined he had seen, the meaning of all the events on Aurora. Everything had seemed clear, obvious, certain. And once more, for the third time, it was gone as though it had never been. And with that thought, his hopes seemed to go too. 72. Daniil led Bailey into the room where breakfast was being served. It seemed more intimate than an ordinary dining room. It was small and plain, with no more in the way of furnishings than a table and two chairs. And when Daniil retired, he did not move into a niche. In fact, there were no niches. And for a moment, Bailey found himself alone, entirely alone, in the room. That he was not really alone, he was certain. There would be robots on instant call. Still, it was a room for two. A no-robots room. A room, Bailey hesitated at the thought, for lovers. On the table, there were two stacks of pancake-like objects that did not smell like pancakes, but smelled good. Two containers of what looked like melted butter, but might not be, flanked them. There was a pod of the hot drink, which Bailey had tried and had not liked very much, that substituted for coffee. Glodaya walked in, dressed in rather prim fashion and with her hair glistening as though freshly conditioned. She paused a moment, her face wearing a half-smile. Elijah? Bailey, caught a little by surprise at the sudden appearance, jumped to his feet. Uh, how are you, Glodaya? He stuttered a bit. She ignored that. She seemed cheerful, carefree. She said, If you're worried about Daniil not being in sight, don't be. He's completely safe, and he'll stay so. As for us... She came to him, standing close, and put a hand slowly to his cheek, as once, long ago, she had done in Solaria. She laughed lightly. That was all I did then, Elijah. Do you remember? Elijah nodded silently. Did you sleep well, Elijah? Oh, sit down, dear. He sat down. Very well. Thank you, Glodaya. He hesitated before deciding not to return the endearment in kind. She said, Don't thank me. I've had my best night's sleep in weeks, and I wouldn't have if I hadn't gotten out of bed after I was sure you were sleeping soundly. If I had stayed as I wanted to, I would have been annoying you before the night was over, and you would not have gotten your rest. He recognized the need for gallantry. There are some things more important than r rest, Gladiah, he said but with such formality that she laughed again. Poor Elijah, she said. 
You're embarrassed. The fact that she recognized that embarrassed him even more. Bailey had been prepared for contrition, disgust, shame, affected indifference, tears, everything but the frankly erotic attitude she had assumed. She said, Well, don't suffer so. You're hungry. You hardly ate last night. Get some calories inside you and you'll feel more carnal. Bailey looked doubtfully at the pancakes that weren't. Glodiah said, Oh, you've probably never seen these. They're Solarian delicacies, pachinkas. I had to reprogram my chef before he could make them properly. In the first place, you have to use imported Solarian grain. It won't work with the Auroran varieties. And they're stuffed. Actually, there are a thousand stuffings you can use, but this is my favorite, and I know you'll like it too. I won't tell you what's in it, except for chestnut puree and a touch of honey, but try it and tell me what you think. You can eat it with your fingers, but be careful how you bite into it. She picked one up, holding it daintily between the thumb and middle finger of each hand, then took a small bite, slowly, and licked at the golden semi-liquid filling that flowed out. Bailey imitated her action. The pachinka was hard to the touch and not too hot to hold. He put one end cautiously in his mouth and found it resisted biting. He put more muscle into it and the pachinka cracked and he found the contents flowing over his hands. The bite was too large and too forceful, said Gladiah, rushing to him with a napkin. Now, lick at it. No one eats a pachinka neatly. There's no such thing. You're supposed to wallow in it. Ideally, you're supposed to eat it in the nude, then take a shower. Bailey tried a hesitant lick, and his expression was clear enough. You like it, don't you? said Glodaya. Mmm. It's delicious, said Bailey, and he bit away at it slowly and gently. It wasn't too sweet and it seemed to soften and melt in the mouth. It scarcely required swallowing. He ate three pachinkas, and it was only shame that kept him from asking for more. He licked at his fingers without urging and eschewed the use of napkins, for he wanted none of it to be wasted on an inanimate object. Dip your fingers and hands in the cleanser, Elijah. And she showed him. The melted butter was a finger bowl, obviously. Bailey did as he was shown and then dried his hands. He sniffed at them, and there was no odor whatever. She said, Are you embarrassed about last night, Elisha? Is that all you feel? What did one say, Bailey wondered. Finally, he nodded. I'm afraid I am, Gladia. It's not all I feel by twenty kilometers or more, but I am embarrassed. Stop and think. I'm an Earthman, and you know that, but for the time being you're repressing it, and Earthman is only a meaningless disyllabic sound to you. Last night you were sorry for me, concerned over my problem with the storm, feeling toward me as you would toward a child, and Sympathizing with me, perhaps, out of the vulnerability produced in you by your own loss, you came to me. But that feeling will pass. I'm surprised it hasn't passed already. And then you will remember that I am an Earthman, and you will feel ashamed, demeaned, and dirtied. You will hate me for what I have done for you, and I don't want to be hated. I don't want to be hated, Gladiah. If he looked as unhappy as he felt, he looked unhappy indeed. She must have thought so, for she reached out to him and stroked his hand. I won't hate you, Elijah. Why should I? You did nothing to me that I can object to. I did it to you, and I'll be glad for the rest of my life that I did. You freed me by a touch two years ago, Elijah, and last night you freed me again. I needed to know, two years ago, that I could feel desire, and last night I needed to know that I could feel desire again after Jander. Elijah, stay with me. He would be... He cut her off earnestly. How can that be, Gladiah? I must go back to my own world. 
I have duties and goals there, and you cannot come with me. You could not live the kind of life that is lived on earth. You would die of earthly diseases if the crowds and enclosure did not kill you first. Surely you understand. I understand about earth, said Glediah with a sigh. But surely you needn't leave immediately. Before the morning is over, I may be ordered off the planet by the chairman. You won't be, said Glediah energetically. You won't let yourself be. And if you are, we can go to another space or world. There are dozens we can choose from. Does Earth mean so much to you that you wouldn't live on a spacer world? Bailey said, I could be evasive, Glodiah, and point out that no other spacer world would let me make my home there permanently, and you know that's so. The greater truth is, though, that even if some spacer world would accept me, Earth means so much to me that I would have to return, even if it meant leaving you and never visiting Aurora again, never seeing me again? If I could see you again, I would, Bailey said, wishing. Over and over again, believe me. But what's the use of saying so? You know I'm not likely to be invited back, and you know I can't return without an invitation. Gladiah said in a low voice, I don't want to believe that, Elisha. Bailey said, Gladiah, don't make yourself unhappy. Something wonderful happened between us, but there are other wonderful things that will happen to you too, many of them of all kinds, but not the same wonderful thing. Look forward to the others. She was silent. Gladiah, he said urgently, need anyone know what has happened between us? She looked up at him, a pained expression on her face. Are you that ashamed? Of what happened? Certainly not. But even though I am not ashamed, there could be consequences that would be discomforting. The matter would be talked about. Thanks to that hateful hyperwave drama, which included a distorted view of our relationship, we are news. The Earth Man and the Solarian Woman. If there is the slightest reason to suspect that there is... love between us... It will get back to Earth at the speed of hyperspatial drive. Glodiah lifted her eyebrows with a touch of hauteur. And Earth will consider you demeaned. You will have indulged in sex with someone beneath your station. No, of course not, said Bailey uneasily. For he knew that that would certainly be the view of billions of Earth people. Has it occurred to you that my wife would hear of it? I'm married. And if she does, what of it? Bailey took a deep breath. You don't understand. Earth ways are not spacer ways. We have had times in our history when sexual mores were fairly loose, at least in some places and for some classes. This is not one of those times. Earthmen live crowded together, and it takes a Puritan ethic to keep the family system stable under such conditions. Everyone has one partner, you mean, and no other? No, said Bailey. To be honest, that's not so, but care is taken to keep irregularities sufficiently quiet so that everyone can... can uh, pretend they don't know. Well, yes, but in this case, it will all be so public that no one could pretend not to know. And your wife will be angry with you and will strike you. No, she won't strike me but she will be shamed, which is worse. I will be shamed as well, and so will my son. My social position will suffer, and... Gladiah, if you don't understand, you don't understand, but tell me that you will not speak freely of this thing as Aurorans do. He was conscious of making a rather miserable show of himself. Gladiah said thoughtfully, I do not mean to tease you, Elijah. You have been kind to me and I would not be unkind to you. But she threw her arms up hopelessly. Your earth ways are so nonsensical. Undoubtedly. Yet I must live with them, as you have lived with Solarian ways. Yes. Her expression darkened with memory. Then, 
Forgive me, Elijah. Really and honestly, I apologize. I want what I can't have, and I take it out on you. That's all right. No, it's not all right. Please, Elijah, I must explain something to you. I don't think you understand what happened last night. Will you be all the more embarrassed if I do? Bailey wondered how Jessie would feel and what she would do if she could hear this conversation. Bailey was quite aware that his mind should be on the confrontation with the chairman that was looming immediately up ahead and not on his own personal marital dilemma. He should be thinking of Earth's danger and not of his wife's, but in actual fact, he was thinking of Jesse. He said, I'll probably be embarrassed, but explain it anyway. Gladiah moved her chair, refraining from calling one of her robotic staff to do it for her. He waited for her nervously, not offering to move it himself. She put her chair immediately next to his, facing it in the other direction, so that she was looking at him directly when she sat down. And as she did so, she put out her small hand and placed it in his, and he felt his own hand press it. You see, she said, I no longer fear contact. I'm no longer at the stage where all I can do is brush your cheek for an instant. That may be, but this does not affect you, Gladiah, does it, as that bare touch did then? She nodded. No, it doesn't affect me that way. But I like it anyway. I think that's an advance, actually. To be turned inside out just by a single moment of touch shows how abnormally I had lived and for how long. Now it is better. May I tell you how? What I have just said is actually prologue. Tell me. Oh, I wish we were in bed and it was dark. I could talk more freely. We are sitting up and it is light, Gladia. But I am listening. Yes. On Solaria, Elisha, there was no sex to speak of. You know that. Yes, I do. I experienced none in any real sense. On a few occasions, only a few, my husband approached me out of duty. I won't even describe how that was, but you will believe me when I tell you that, looking back on it, it was worse than none. I believe you. But I knew about sex. I read about it. I discussed it with other women sometimes, all of whom pretended it was a hateful duty that Solarians must undergo. If they had children to the limit of their quota, they always said they were delighted they would never have to deal with sex again. Did you believe them? Of course I did. I had never heard anything else, and the few non-Solarian accounts I read were denounced as false distortions. I believed that, too. My husband found some books I had, called them pornography, and had them destroyed. Then, too, you know, people can make themselves believe anything. I think Solarian women believed what they said and really did despise sex. They certainly sounded sincere enough, and it made me feel there was something terribly wrong with me because I had a kind of curiosity about it and odd feelings I could not understand. You did not at that time use robots for relief in any way? No, it didn't occur to me, or any inanimate object... There were occasional whispers of such things, but with such horror or pretended horror that I would never dream of doing anything like that. Of course, I had dreams and sometimes something that, as I look back on it, must have been incipient orgasms would wake me. I never understood them, of course, or dared talk of it. I was bitterly ashamed of it, in fact. Worse, I was frightened of the pleasure they brought me, and then, of course, I came to Aurora. You told me of that. Sex with Aurorans was unsatisfactory. Yes. It made me think that Solarians were right after all. Sex was not like my dreams at all. It was not until gender that I understood. It is not sex that they have on Aurora. It is 
It is um, choreography. Every step of it is dictated by fashion, from the method of approach to the moment of departure. There is nothing unexpected, nothing spontaneous. On Solaria, since there was so little sex, nothing was given or taken. And on Aurora, sex was so stylized that, in the end, nothing was given or taken either. Do you understand? I'm not sure, Gladiah. Never having experienced sex with an Auroran woman, or for that matter, never having been an Auroran man, but it's not necessary to explain. I have a dim notion of what you mean. You're terribly embarrassed, aren't you? Not to the point of being unable to listen. But then I met Jander and learned to use him. He was not an Auroran man. His only aim, his only possible aim, was to please me. He gave, and I took. And for the first time, I experienced sex as it should be experienced. Do you understand that? Can you imagine what it must be like suddenly to know that you are not mad or distorted or perverted or even simply wrong, but to know that you are a woman and have a satisfying sex partner? I think I can imagine that. And then, after so short a time, to have it all taken away from me, I thought, I thought that that was the end. I was doomed. I was never again, through centuries of life, to have a good sexual relationship again. Not to have had it to start with, and then never to have had it at all, was bad enough but to get it against all expectation and to have it, then suddenly to lose it and go back to nothing, that was unbearable. You see how important, therefore, last night was. But why me, Gladiah? Why not someone else? No, Elijah. It had to be you. We came and found you, Giscard and I, and you were helpless, truly helpless, you were not unconscious, but you did not rule your body. You had to be lifted and carried and placed in the car. I was there when you were warmed and treated, bathed and dried, helpless throughout. The robots did it all with marvelous efficiency, intent on caring for you and preventing harm from coming to you, but totally without actual feeling. I, on the other hand, watched and I felt. Bailey bent his head, gritting his teeth at the thought of his public helplessness. He had luxuriated in it when it had happened, but now he could only feel the disgrace of being observed under such conditions. She went on. I wanted to do it all for you. I resented the robots for reserving for themselves the right to be kind to you and to give. And as I thought of myself doing it, I felt a growing sexual excitement, something I hadn't felt since Jander's death. And it occurred to me then that in my only successful sex, what I had done was to take. Jander gave whatever I wished, but he never took. He was incapable of taking since his only pleasure lay in pleasing me, and it never occurred to me to give because I was brought up with robots and knew they couldn't take. And as I watched, it came to me that I knew only half of sex, and I desperately wanted to experience the other half. But then at the dinner table with me afterward, when you were eating your hot soup, you seemed recovered. You seemed strong. You were strong enough to console me and because I had had that feeling for you when you were being cared for, I no longer feared your being from earth, and I was willing to move into your embrace. I wanted it. But even as you held me, I felt a sense of loss, for I was taking again and not giving. And you said to me, Gladiah, please, I must sit down. Oh, Elisha, 
It was the most wonderful thing you could have said to me. Bailey felt himself flush. It embarrassed me hideously at the time. Such a confession of weakness. It was just what I wanted. It drove me wild with desire. I forced you to bed and came to you, and for the first time in my life I gave. I took nothing. And the spell of Jander passed, for I knew that he had not been enough either. It must be possible to take and give both. Elijah, stay with me. Bailey shook his head. Gladiah, if I tore my heart in two, it wouldn't change the facts. I cannot remain on Aurora. I must return to Earth. You cannot come to Earth. Elijah, what if I can come to Earth? Why do you say such a foolish thing? Even if you could, I would age quickly and soon be useless to you. In twenty years, thirty at the most, I will be an old man, probably dead, while you will stay as you are for centuries. But that is what I mean, Elijah. On earth I will catch your infections, and I will grow old quickly too. You wouldn't want that. Besides, old age isn't an infection. You will merely grow sick very quickly and die. Gladiah, you can find another man. An Auroran? She said it with contempt. You can teach. Now that you know how to take and to give, teach them how to do both as well. If I teach, will they learn? Some will. Surely some will. You have so much time to find the one who will. There is... No, he thought. It is not wise to mention Gramionis now, but perhaps if he comes to her less politely and with a little more determination. She seemed thoughtful. Is it possible? Then, looking at Bailey with her gray-blue eyes moist, Oh, Elijah, do you remember anything at all of what happened last night? I must admit, said Bailey a little sadly, that some of it is distressingly hazy. If you remembered, you would not want to leave me. I don't want to leave you as it is, Gladiah. It is just that I must. And afterward, she said, you seemed so quietly happy, so rested. I lay nestled on your shoulder and felt your heart beat rapidly at first, then more and more slowly except when you sat up so suddenly. Do you remember that? Bailey started and leaned a little away from her, gazing into her eyes wildly. No, I don't remember that. What do you mean? What did I do? I told you, you sat up suddenly. Yes, but what else? His heart was beating rapidly now, as rapidly as it must have in the wake of last night's sex. Three times, something that had seemed the truth had come to him, but the first two times he had been entirely alone. The third time, last night, however, Gladiah had been with him. He had had a witness. Gladiah said, well, Nothing else, really. I said, What is it, Elijah? But you paid no attention to me. You said, I have it. I have it. You didn't speak clearly, and your eyes were unfocused. It was a little frightening. Is that all I said? Jehoshaphat, Gladiah, didn't I say anything more? Gladiah frowned. I don't remember, but then you lay back, and I said, Don't be frightened, Elisha. Don't be frightened. You're safe now. And I stroked you, and you settled back and fell asleep <laughs> and snored. I never heard anyone snore before, but that's what it must have been from the descriptions. The thought clearly amused her. Bailey said, Listen to me, Gladiah. What did I say? I have it, I have it. Did I say what it was I had? She frowned again. No. I don't remember it. Wait, you did say one thing in a very low voice. You said, He was there first. 
He was there first. That's what I said? Yes, I, I took it for granted that you meant Giscard was there before the other robots, that you were trying to overcome your fears of being taken away, that you were reliving that time in the storm. Yes, that's why I stroked you and said, Don't be frightened, Elijah, you're safe now, till you relaxed. He was there first. He was there first. I won't forget it now. Gladiah, thanks for last night. Thanks for talking to me now. Gladiah said, Is there something important about you saying that Giscard found you first? He did, you know that. It can't be that, Gladiah. It must be something I don't know, but manage to discover only when my mind is totally relaxed. But what does it mean, then? I'm not sure. But if that's what I said, it must mean something. And I have an hour or so to figure it out. He stood up. I must leave now. He had taken a few steps toward the door, but Gladiah flew to him and put her arms around him. Wait, Elisha. Bailey hesitated, then lowered his head to kiss her. For a long moment, they clung together. Will I see you again, Elisha? Bailey said sadly, I can't say. I hope so. And he went off to find Daniil and Giscard so that he could make the necessary preparations for the confrontation about to come. 73. Bailey's sadness persisted as he walked across the long lawn to Fastolf's establishment. The robots walked on either side. Daniil seemed at his ease, but Giscard, faithful to his programming and apparently unable to relax it, maintained his close watch on the surroundings. Bailey said, What is the name of the chairman of the legislature, Daniil? I cannot say, partner Elijah. On the occasions when he has been referred to in my hearing, he has been referred to only as the chairman. He is addressed as Mr. Chairman. Giscard said, His name is Rutelen Hordor, sir, but it is never mentioned officially. The title alone is used. That serves to impress continuity on the government. Human holders of the position have individually fixed terms, but the chairman always exists. And this particular individual chairman, how old is he? Quite old, sir. 331, said Giscard, who typically had statistics on tap. In good health? I know nothing to the contrary, sir. Any outstanding personal characteristics it might be well for me to be prepared for? That seemed to stop Giscard. He said, after a pause, That is difficult for me to say, sir. He is in his second term. He is considered an efficient chairman who works hard and gets results. Well, is he short-tempered, patient, domineering, understanding? Giscard said, You must judge such things for yourself, sir. Daniil said, Partner Elijah, the chairman is above partisanship. He is just and even-handed by definition. I'm sure of that, muttered Bailey. But definitions are abstract, as is the chairman, while individual chairmen with names are concrete and may have minds to match. He shook his head. His own mind, he would swear, had a strong measure of concrete itself. Having three times thought of something and three times lost it, he was now presented with his own comment at the time of having the thought, and it still didn't help. He was there first. Who was there first? When? Bailey had no answer. 74. Bailey found Fastolf waiting for him at the door of his establishment, with a robot behind him who seemed most unrobotically restless, as though unable to perform his proper function of greeting a visitor and upset by the fact. But then one was always reading human motivations and responses into robots. What was more likely true was no upsetness, no feeling of any kind, merely a slight oscillation of positronic potentials resulting from the fact that his orders were to greet and inspect all visitors, and he could not quite perform the task without pushing past Fastolf, 
which he also could not do in the absence of overriding necessity. So he made false starts, one after the other, and that made him seem restless. Bailey found himself staring at the robot absently, and only with difficulty managing to bring his eyes back to Fastolf. He was thinking of robots, but he didn't know why. I'm glad to see you again, Dr. Fastolf, he said, and thrust his hand forward. After his encounter with Gladaya, it was rather difficult to remember that spacers were reluctant to make physical contact with an Earthman. Fastolf hesitated a moment, and then, as manners triumphed over prudence, he took the hand offered him, held it lightly and briefly, and let it go. He said, I am even more delighted to see you, Mr. Bailey. I was quite alarmed over your experience last evening. It was not a particularly bad storm, but to an Earthman it must have seemed overwhelming. You know about what happened then. Daniel and Giscard had brought me fully up to date in that respect. I would have felt better if they had come here directly and eventually brought you here with them, but their decision was based on the fact that Gladiah's establishment was closer to the breakdown point of the airfoil and that your orders had been extremely intense and had placed Daniil's safety ahead of your own. They did not misinterpret you? They did not. I forced them to leave me. Was that wise? Fastolf led the way indoors and pointed to a chair. Bailey sat down. It seemed the proper thing to do. We were being pursued. So Giscard reported. He also reported that Bailey intervened. Dr. Fastolf, please, I have very little time and I have questions that I must ask you. Go ahead, please, said Fastolf at once, with his usual air of unfailing politeness. It has been suggested that you place your work on brain function above everything else, that you... Let me finish, Mr. Bailey, that I will let nothing stand in my way, that I am totally ruthless, oblivious to any consideration of immorality or evil would stop at nothing, would excuse everything, all in the name of the importance of my work. Yes. Who told you this, Mr. Bailey? asked Fastolf. Does it matter? Perhaps not. Besides, it's not difficult to guess. It was my daughter Vasilia. I'm sure of that. Bailey said, Perhaps what I want to know is whether this estimate of your character is correct. Fastolf smiled sadly. Do you expect an honest answer from me about my own character? <laughs> In some ways, the accusations against me are true. I do consider my work the most important matter there is, and I do have the impulse to sacrifice anything and everything to it. I would ignore conventional notions of evil and immorality if these got in my way. The thing is, however, that I don't. I can't bring myself to. And in particular, if I have been accused of killing Jander because that would in some way advance my study of the human brain, I deny it. It is not so. I did not kill Jander. Bailey said, You suggested I submit to a psychic probe to get some information that I can't reach otherwise out of my brain. Has it occurred to you that if you submitted to a psychic probe, your innocence could be demonstrated? Fastolf nodded his head thoughtfully. I imagine Vasilia suggested that my failure to offer to submit to one was proof of my guilt. Not so. A psychic probe is dangerous, and I am as nervous about submitting myself to one as you are. Still, I would have done so, despite my fears, were it not for the fact that is what my opponents would most like to have me do. They would argue against any evidence to my innocence, and the psychic probe is not delicate enough an instrument to demonstrate innocence beyond argument. But what they would get by use of the probe is information about the theory and design of humaniform robots. That is what they are after, and that is what I am not going to give them. Bailey said, Very well. Thank you, Dr. Fastolf. Fastolf said, You are welcome. And now, if I may get back to what I was saying... Giscard reported that after you were left alone in the airfoil, you were accosted by strange robots. At least you spoke of strange robots, rather disjointedly, after you were found unconscious and exposed to the storm. 
The strange robots did accost me, Dr. Fastolf. I managed to deflect them and send them away, but I thought it wise to leave the airfoil rather than await their return. I may not have been thinking clearly when I reached that decision. Gisgard said I was not. Fastolf smiled. Gisgard has a simplistic view of the universe. Have you any idea whose robots they were? Bailey moved about restlessly and seemed to find no way of adjusting himself to the seat in a comfortable manner. He said, Has the chairman arrived yet? No, but he will be here momentarily. So will Amadero, the head of the Institute, whom the robots told me you met yesterday. I am not sure that was wise. You irritated him. I had to see him, Dr. Fastolf, and he did not seem irritated. Now, there's no guide with Amadero. As a result of what he calls your slanders and your unbearable sullying of professional reputation, he has forced the chairman's hand. In what way? It is the chairman's job to encourage the meeting of contending parties and to work for a compromise. If Amadero wishes to meet with me, the chairman could not, by definition, discourage it, much less forbid it. He must hold the meeting, and if Amadero can find enough evidence against you, and it is easy to find evidence against an Earthman, that will end the investigation. Perhaps, Dr. Fastolf, you should not have called on an Earthman to help, considering how vulnerable we are. Perhaps not, Mr. Bailey, but I could think of nothing else to do. I still can't, so I must leave it up to you to persuade the chairman to our point of view, if you can. The responsibility is mine, said Bailey glumly. Entirely yours, said Fastolf smoothly. Bailey said, Are we four to be the only ones present? Fastolf said, Actually, we three, the chairman, Amadero, and myself. We are the two principals and the compromising agent, so to speak. You will be there as a fourth party, Mr. Bailey, only on sufferance. The chairman can order you to leave at will, so I hope you will not do anything to upset him. I'll try not to, Dr. Fastolf. For instance, Mr. Bailey, do not offer him your hand, if you will forgive my rudeness. Bailey felt himself grow warm with retroactive embarrassment at his earlier gesture. I will not. And be unfailingly polite. Make no angry accusations. Do not insist on statements for which there is no support. You mean don't try to stampede anyone into betraying himself? Amadero, for instance. Yes, do not do so. You will be committing slander, and it will be counterproductive. Therefore, be polite. If the politeness masks an attack, we won't quarrel with that. And try not to speak unless you are spoken to. Bailey said, How is it, Dr. Fastolf, that you are so full of careful advice now, and yet you never warned me about the dangers of slander earlier? The fault is indeed mine, said Dr. Fastolf. It was a matter of such basic knowledge to me that it never occurred to me that it had to be explained. Bailey grunted. Yes, I thought so. Fastolf raised his head suddenly. I hear an airfoil outside. More than that, I can hear the steps of one of my staff heading for the entrance. I presume the chairman and Amadero are at hand. Together? asked Bailey. Undoubtedly. You see, Amadero suggested my establishment as the meeting place, thus granting me the advantage of home ground. He will therefore have the chance of offering, out of apparent politeness, to call for the chairman and bring him here. After all, they must both come here. This will give him a few minutes to talk privately with the chairman and push his point of view. Oh, that is scarcely fair, said Bailey. Could you have stopped that? I didn't want to. Amadero takes a calculated risk. He may say something that will irritate the chairman. Is the chairman particularly irritable by nature? No, no more so than any chairman in the fifth decade of his term of office. Still, the necessity of strict adherence to protocol, the further necessity of never taking sides, and the actuality of arbitrary power all combine toward making a certain irritability inevitable. And Amadero is not always wise. 
His jovial smile, his white teeth, his exuding bonhomie can be extremely irritating when those upon whom he lavishes it are not in a good mood, for some reason. But I must go meet them, Mr. Bailey, and supply what I hope will be a more substantial version of charm. Please stay here, and don't move from that chair. Bailey could do nothing but wait now. He thought irrelevantly that he had been on Aurora for just a bit short of fifty standard hours. Chapter 18 Again the Chairman 75. The chairman was short, surprisingly short. Amadero towered over him by nearly thirty centimeters. However, since most of his shortness was in his thighs, the chairman, when all were seated, was not noticeably inferior in height to the others. Indeed, he was thick-set, with a massive chest and shoulders, and looked almost overpowering under those conditions. His head was large, too, but his face was lined and marked by age. Nor were its wrinkles the kindly type carved by laughter. They were impressed into his cheeks and forehead, one felt, by the exercise of power. His hair was white and sparse, and he was bald in the spot where the hairs would have met in a whorl. His voice suited him, deep and decisive. Age had robbed it of some of its timbre, perhaps, and lent it a bit of harshness, but in a chairman, Bailey thought, that might help rather than hinder. Fastolf went through the full ritual of greeting, exchanged stroking remarks without meaning, and offered food and drink. Through all of this, no mention was made of the outsider, and no notice was taken of him. It was only when the preliminaries were finished and when all were seated that Bailey, a little farther from the center than the others, was introduced. He said, Mr. Chairman, without holding out his hand. Then, with an offhand nod, he said, And, of course, I have met Dr. Amadero. Amadero's smile did not waver at the touch of insolence in Bailey's voice. The chairman who had not acknowledged Bailey's greeting, placed his hands on each knee, fingers spread apart, and said, Let us get started, and let us see if we can't make this as brief and as productive as possible. Let me stress first that I wish to get past this matter of the misbehavior or possible misbehavior of an earthman and strike instantly to the heart of the matter. Nor in dealing with the heart of the matter are we speaking of this overblown matter of the robot. Disrupting the activity of a robot is a matter for the civil courts. It can result in a judgment of the infringement of property rights and the inflicting of a penalty of costs, but nothing more than that. What's more, if it should be proved that Dr. Fastolf had rendered the robot gender penal inoperable, it is a robot who, after all, he helped design, whose construction he supervised, and the ownership of whom he held at the time of the inoperability. No penalty is likely to apply, since a person may do what he likes with his own. What is really at issue is the matter of the exploration and settlement of the galaxy. Whether we of Aurora carry it through alone, whether we do it in collaboration with the other spacer worlds, or whether we leave it to Earth, Dr. Amadero and the globalists favor having Aurora shoulder the burden alone. Dr. Fastolf wishes to leave it to Earth. If we can settle this matter then the affair of the robot can be left to the civil courts, and the question of the Earthman's behavior will probably become moot, and we can simply get rid of him. Therefore, let me begin by asking whether Dr. Amadero is prepared to accept Dr. Fastolf's position in order to achieve unity of decision or whether Dr. Fastolf is prepared to accept Dr. Amadero's position with the same end in view. He paused and waited. Amadero said, 
I am sorry, Mr. Chairman, but I must insist that Earthmen be confined to their planet and that the galaxy be settled by Aurorans only. I would be willing to compromise, however, to the extent of allowing other spacer worlds to share in the settlement, if that would prevent needless strife among us. I see, said the chairman. Will you, Dr. Fastolf, in view of this statement, abandon your position? Fastolf said, Dr. Amadero's compromise has scarcely anything of substance in it, Mr. Chairman. I am willing to offer a compromise of greater significance. Why should not the worlds of the galaxy be thrown open to spacers and Earth people alike? The galaxy is large and there would be room for both. I would be willing to accept such an arrangement. No doubt, said Amadero quickly, for it is no compromise. The over eight billion population of Earth is more than half again the population of all the spacer worlds combined. Earth's people are short-lived and are used to replacing their losses quickly. They lack our regard for individual human life. They will swarm over the new worlds at any cost, multiplying like insects, and will preempt the galaxy even while we are making a bare beginning. To offer Earth a supposedly equal chance at the galaxy is to give them the galaxy, and that is not equality. Earth people must be confined to Earth. And what have you to say to that, Dr. Fastolf? asked the chairman. Fastolf sighed. My views are on record. I'm sure I don't need to repeat them. Dr. Amadero plans to use humaniform robots to build the settled worlds that human aurorans will then enter, ready-made, yet he doesn't even have humaniform robots. He cannot construct them, and the project would not work even if he did have them. No compromise is possible unless Dr. Amadero consents to the principle that Earth people may at least share in the task of the settlement of new worlds. Then no compromise is possible, said Amadero. The chairman looked displeased. I'm afraid that one of you two must give in. I do not intend Aurora to be torn apart in an emotional orgy on a question this important. He looked at Amadiro blankly, his expression carefully signifying neither favor nor disfavor. You intend to use the inoperability of the robot gender as an argument against Fastolf's view, do you not? I do, said Amadiro. A purely emotional argument. You are going to claim that Fastolf is trying to destroy your view by falsely making humaniform robots appear less useful than they, in effect, are. That is exactly what he is trying to do, slander, put in Fastolf in a low voice. Not if I can prove it, which I can, said Amadiro. The argument may be an emotional one, but it will be effective. You see that, Mr. Chairman, don't you? My view will surely win, but left to itself it will be messy. I would suggest that you persuade Dr. Fastolf to accept inevitable defeat and spare Aurora the enormous sadness of a spectacle that will weaken our position among the spacer worlds and shake our own belief in ourselves. How can you prove that Dr. Fastolf rendered the robot inoperative? He himself admits he is the only human being who could have done so. You know this. I know, said the chairman. But I wanted to hear you say this, not to your constituency, not to the media, but to me, in private. And you have done so. He turned to Fastolf. And what do you say, Dr. Fastolf? Are you the only man who could have destroyed the robot? Without leaving physical marks, I am, as far as I know. I don't believe that Dr. Amadero has the skill in robotics to do so, and I am constantly amazed that, after having founded his robotics institute, he is so eager to proclaim his own incapacity, even with all his associates at his back, and to do so publicly. He smiled at Amadero, not entirely without malice. The chairman sighed. No, Dr. Fastolf, no rhetorical tricks now. Let us dispense with sarcasm and clever thrusts. What is your defense? 
Why, only that I did no harm to gender. I do not say anyone did. It was chance, the uncertainty principle at work on the positronic pathways. It can happen every so often. Let Dr. Amadero merely admit that it was chance, that no one be accused without evidence, and we can then argue the competing proposals about settlement on their own merits. No, said Amadero. The chance of accidental destruction is too small to be considered, far smaller than the chance that Dr. Fastolf is responsible, so much smaller that to ignore Dr. Fastolf's guilt is irresponsible. I will not back down, and I will win. Mr. Chairman, you know I will win, and it seems to me that the only rational step to be taken is to force Dr. Fastolf to accept his defeat in the interest of global unity. Fastolf said quickly, And that brings me to the matter of the investigation I have asked Mr. Bailey of Earth to undertake. And Amadiro said, just as quickly, A move I opposed when it was first suggested. The Earthman may be a clever investigator, but he is unfamiliar with Aurora and can accomplish nothing here. Nothing, that is, except to strew slander and to hold Aurora up to the spacer worlds in an undignified and ridiculous light. There have been satirical pieces on the matter in half a dozen important spacer hyperwave news programs on as many different worlds. Recordings of these have been sent to your office. And have been brought to my attention, said the chairman. And there has been murmuring here on Aurora, Amadero drove on. It would be to my selfish interest to allow the investigation to continue. It is costing fast off support among the populace and votes among the legislators. The longer it continues, the more certain I am of victory, but it is damaging Aurora, and I do not wish to add to my certainty at the cost of harm to my world. I suggest, with respect, that you end the investigation, Mr. Chairman, and persuade Dr. Fastolf to submit gracefully now to what he will eventually have to accept at much greater cost. The chairman said, I agree that to have permitted Dr. Fastolf to set up this investigation may have been unwise. I say may. I admit I am tempted to end it, and yet the Earthman... He gave no indication of knowing that Bailey was in the room. Has already been here for some time. He paused, as though to give Fastolf a chance for corroboration, and Fastolf took it, saying, This is the third day of his investigation, Mr. Chairman. In that case, said the chairman, before I end that investigation, it would be fair, I believe, to ask if there have been any significant findings so far. He paused again. Fastolf glanced quickly at Bailey and made a small motion of his head. Bailey said in a low voice, I do not wish, Mr. Chairman, to obtrude, unasked, any observations. Am I being asked a question? The chairman frowned. Without looking at Bailey, he said, I am asking Mr. Bailey of Earth to tell us whether he has any findings of significance. Bailey took a deep breath. This was it. 76. Mr. Chairman, he began, Yesterday afternoon I was interrogating Dr. Amadero, who was most cooperative and useful to me, when my staff and I left, your staff, asked the chairman. I was accompanied by two robots on all phases of my investigation, Mr. Chairman, said Bailey. Robots who belong to Dr. Fastolf, asked Amadero. I ask this for the record. For the record, they do, said Bailey. One is Daniil Oliva, a humaniform robot, and the other is Giscard Reventlov, an older, non-humaniform robot. Thank you said the chairman. Continue. When we left the Institute grounds, we found that the airfoil we used had been tampered with. Tampered with? asked the chairman, startled. By whom? We don't know, but it happened on Institute grounds. We were there by invitation, so it was known by the Institute personnel that we would be there. Moreover, no one else would be likely to be there without the invitation and knowledge of the Institute staff. 
If it were at all thinkable, it would be necessary to conclude that the tampering could only have been done by someone on the Institute staff, and that would in any case be impossible, except at the direction of Dr. Amadero himself, which would also be unthinkable. Amadero said, well, You seem to think a great deal about the unthinkable. Has the aerofoil been examined by a qualified technician to see if it has indeed been tampered with? Might there not have been a natural failing? asked Amadero. No, sir, said Bailey. But Gisgard, who is qualified to drive an airfoil and who has frequently driven that particular one, maintains that it was tampered with. And he is one of Dr. Fastolf's staff, and is programmed by him and receives his daily orders from him, said Amadero. Are you suggesting, began Fastolf, I am suggesting nothing, Amadero held up his hand in a benign gesture. I am merely making a statement for the record. The chairman stirred. Well, Mr. Bailey of Earth, please continue. Bailey said, When the airfoil broke down, there were others in pursuit. Others? asked the chairman. Other robots. They arrived, and by that time my robots were gone. One moment, said Amadero. What was your condition at the time, Mr. Bailey? I was not entirely well. Not entirely well. You are an earthman, and unaccustomed to life except in the artificial setting of your cities. You are uneasy in the open. Is that not so, Mr. Bailey? asked Amadero. Yes, sir. And there was a severe thunderstorm in progress last evening, as I'm sure the chairman recalls. Would it not be accurate to say that you were quite ill? Semi-conscious, if not worse? I was quite ill, said Bailey, reluctantly. Then how is it your robots were gone? asked the chairman sharply. Should they not have been with you in your illness? I ordered them away, Mr. Chairman. Why? I thought it best, said Bailey, and I will explain, if I may be allowed to continue. Continue. We were indeed being pursued, for the pursuing robots arrived shortly after my robots had left. The pursuers asked me where my robots were, and I told them I had sent them away. It was only after that that they asked if I were ill. I said I wasn't ill, and they left me in order to continue a search for my robots. In search of Daniel and Giscard, asked the chairman. Yes, Mr. Chairman. It was clear to me that they were under intense orders to find the robots. In what way was that clear? Although I was obviously ill, they asked about the robots before they asked about me. Then later they abandoned me in my illness to search for my robots. They must have received enormously intense orders to find those robots, or it would not have been possible for them to disregard a patently ill human being. As a matter of fact, I had anticipated this search for my robots, and that was why I had sent them away. I felt it all important to keep them out of unauthorized hands. Amadero said, Mr. Chairman, may I continue to question Mr. Bailey on this point in order to show the worthlessness of this statement? You may. Amadero said, Mr. Bailey, you were alone after your robots had left, were you not? Yes, sir. Therefore, you have no recording of events. You are not yourself equipped to record them. You have no recording device? No to all three, sir. And you were ill? Yes, sir. Distraught? Possibly too ill to remember clearly? No, sir, I remember quite clearly. You would think so, I suppose, but you may well have been delirious and hallucinating. Under those conditions, it seems clear that what the robots said, or indeed whether robots appeared at all, would seem highly dubious. The chairman said thoughtfully, I agree. Mr. Bailey of Earth, assuming that what you remember, or claim to remember, is accurate, what is your interpretation of the events you are describing? I hesitate to give you my thoughts on the matter, Mr. Chairman, said Bailey, lest I slander the worthy Dr. Amadero. Since you speak at my request, and since your remarks are confined to this room, the chairman looked around, the wall niches were empty of robots. There is no question of slander, unless it seems to me you speak with malice. 
In that case, Mr. Chairman, said Bailey, I thought it possible that Dr. Amadiro detained me in his office by discussing matters with me at greater length than was perhaps necessary, so that there would be time for the damaging of my machine, then detained me further in order that I might leave after the thunderstorm had begun, thus making sure that I would be ill in transit. He had studied Earth's social conditions, as he told me several times, so he would know what my reaction to the storm might be. It seemed to me that it was his plan to send his robots after us and, when they came upon our stalled airfoil, to have them take us all back to the Institute grounds, presumably so that I might be treated for my illness, but actually so that he might have Dr. Fastolf's robots. Amadiro laughed gently. What motive am I supposed to have for all this? You see, Mr. Chairman, that this is supposition joined to supposition and would be judged slander in any court on Aurora. The chairman said severely, Has Mr. Bailey of Earth anything to support these hypotheses? A line of reasoning, Mr. Chairman. The chairman stood up, at once losing some of his presence, since he scarcely unfolded to a greater than sitting height. Let me take a short walk so that I might consider what I have heard so far. I will be right back. He left for the personal. Fastolf leaned in the direction of Bailey, and Bailey met him halfway. Amadiro looked on in casual unconcern, as though it scarcely mattered to him what they might have to say to each other. Fastolf whispered, have you anything better to say? Bailey said, I think so, if I get the proper chance to say it. But the chairman does not seem to be sympathetic. He is not. So far you have merely made things worse, and I would not be surprised if when he comes back he calls these proceedings to a halt. Bailey shook his head and stared at his shoes. 77. Bailey was still staring at his shoes when the chairman returned, reseated himself, and turned a hard and rather baleful glance at the Earthman. He said, Mr. Bailey of Earth? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I think you are wasting my time, but I do not want it said that I did not give either side a full hearing, even when it seemed to be wasting my time. Can you offer me a motive that would account for Dr. Amadiro acting in the mad way in which you accuse him of acting? Mr. Chairman, said Bailey, in a tone approaching desperation, there is indeed a motive, a very good one. It rests on the fact that Dr. Amadiro's plan for settling the galaxy will come to nothing if he and his institute cannot produce humaniform robots. So far he has produced none and can produce none. Ask him if he is willing to have a legislative committee examine his institute for any indication that successful humaniform robots are being produced or designed. If he is willing to maintain that successful humaniforms are on the assembly lines, or even on the drawing boards, or even an adequate theoretical formulation, and if he is prepared to demonstrate that fact to a qualified committee, I will say nothing more and admit that my investigation has achieved nothing. He held his breath. The chairman looked at Amadiro, whose smile had faded. Amadiro said, I will admit that we have no humaniform robots in prospect at the moment. Then I will continue, said Bailey, resuming his interrupted breathing with something very much like a gasp. Dr. Amadiro can, of course, find all the information he needs for his project if he turns to Dr. Fastolf, who has the information in his head, but Dr. Fastolf will not cooperate in this matter. No, I will not, murmured Fastolf, under any conditions. But, Mr. Chairman, Bailey continued, Dr. Fastolf is not the only individual who has the secret of the design and construction of humaniform robots. No, said the chairman. Who else would know? Dr. Fastolf himself looks astonished at your comment, Mr. Bailey. For the first time, he did not add, of Earth. I am indeed astonished, said Fastolf. To my knowledge, I am certainly the only one. I don't know what Mr. Bailey means. Amadiro said with a small curling of the lip, I suspect Mr. Bailey doesn't know either. Bailey felt hemmed in. 
He looked from one to the other and felt that not one of them, not one, was on his side. He said, Isn't it true that any humaniform robot would know? Not consciously, perhaps, not in such a way as to be able to give instructions in the matter, but the information would surely be there within him, wouldn't it? If a humaniform robot was properly questioned, his answers and responses would betray his design and construction. Eventually, given enough time and given questions properly framed, a humaniform robot would yield information that would make it possible to plan the design of other humaniform robots. To put it briefly, no machine can be of secret design if the machine itself is available for sufficiently intense study. Fastolf seemed struck. I see what you mean, Mr. Bailey, and you are right. I had never thought of that. With respect, Dr. Fastolf, said Bailey, I must tell you that, like all Aurorans, you have a peculiarly individualistic pride. You are entirely too satisfied with being the best roboticist, the only roboticist who can construct humaniforms, so you blind yourself to the obvious. The chairman relaxed into a smile. He has you there, Dr. Fastolf. I have wondered why you were so eager to maintain that you were the only one with the know-how to destroy gender when that so weakened your political case. I see clearly now that you would rather have your political case go down than your uniqueness. Fastolf chafed visibly. As for Amadero, he frowned and said, Has this anything to do with the problem under discussion? Yes, it does, said Bailey, his confidence rising. You cannot force any information from Dr. Fastolf directly. Your robots cannot be ordered to do him harm, to torture him into revealing his secrets, for instance. You can't harm him directly yourself against the protection of Dr. Fastolf by his staff. However, you can isolate a robot and have it taken by other robots when the human being present is too ill to take the necessary action to prevent you. All the events of yesterday afternoon were part of a quickly improvised plan to get your hands on Daniil. You saw your opportunity as soon as I insisted on seeing you at the Institute. If I had not sent my robots away, if I had not been just well enough to insist I was well and to send your robots in the wrong direction, you would have had him. And eventually, you might have worked out the secret of humaniform robots by some long-sustained analysis of Daniil's behavior and responses. Amadiro said, Mr. Chairman, I protest. I have never heard slander so viciously expressed. This is all based on the fancies of an ill man. We don't know, and perhaps can't ever know, whether the airfoil was really damaged, and if it was, by whom, whether robots really pursued the airfoil and really spoke to Mr. Bailey or not. He is merely piling inference on inference, all based on dubious testimony concerning events of which he is the only witness, and that at a time when he was half mad with fear and may have been hallucinating. None of this can stand up for one moment in a courtroom. This is not a courtroom, Dr. Amadero, said the chairman, and it is my duty to listen to everything that may be germane to a question under dispute. This is not germane, Mr. Chairman. It is a cobweb, yet it hangs together somehow. I do not seem to catch Mr. Bailey in a clear-cut illogicality. If one admits what he claims to have experienced, then his conclusions make a kind of sense. Do you deny all this, Dr. Amadiro? The airfoil damage, the pursuit, the intention to appropriate the humaniform robot? I do. Absolutely none of it is true, said Amadiro. It had been a noticeable while since he had smiled. The Earthman can produce a recording of our entire conversation, and no doubt he will point out that I was delaying him by speaking at length, by inviting him to tour the Institute, by inviting him to have dinner, but all that can equally well be interpreted as my stretching a point to be courteous and hospitable. I was misled by a certain sympathy I have for Earthmen, perhaps, and that's all there is to that. I deny his inferences, and nothing of what he says can stand up against my denial. My reputation is not such that a mere speculation can persuade anyone that I am the kind of devious plotter this Earthman says I am. 
The chairman scratched at his chin thoughtfully and said, Certainly I am not of a mind to accuse you on the basis of what the Earthman has said so far. Mr. Bailey, if this is all you have, it is interesting but insufficient. Is there anything more you have to say of substance? I warn you that if not... I have now spent all the time on this that I can afford to. 78. Bailey said, There is but one more subject I wish to bring up, Mr. Chairman. You have perhaps heard of Glodaya Del Mar, or Glodaya Solaria. She calls herself simply Glodaya. Yes, Mr. Bailey, said the chairman with a testy edge to his voice. I have heard of her, I have seen the hyperwave show in which you and she play such remarkable parts. She was associated with the robot Jander for many months. In fact, towards the end, he was her husband. The chairman's unfavorable stare at Bailey became a hard glare. Her what? Husband, Mr. Chairman. Fastolf, who half rose, sat down again looking perturbed. The chairman said harshly, That is illegal. Worse, it is ridiculous. A robot could not impregnate her. There could be no children. The status of a husband or of a wife is never granted without some statement as to willingness to have a child, if permitted. Even an earthman, I should think, would know that. Bailey said, I am aware of this, Mr. Chairman. So, I am certain, was Glodaya. She did not use the word husband in its legal sense, but in an emotional one. She considered Jander the equivalent of a husband. She felt toward him as though he were a husband. The chairman turned to Fastolf. Did you know of this, Dr. Fastolf? He was a robot on your staff. Fastolf, clearly embarrassed, said, well, I knew she was fond of him. I suspected she made use of him sexually. I knew nothing of this illegal charade, however, until Mr. Bailey told me of it. Bailey said, She was a Solarian. Her concept of husband was not a Roran. Obviously not, said the chairman. But she did have enough of a sense of reality to keep it to herself, Mr. Chairman. She never told of this charade, as Dr. Fastolf calls it, to any Auroran. She told me the day before yesterday because she wanted to urge me on in the investigation of something that meant so much to her. Yet even so, I imagine she would not have used the word if she had not known I was an Earthman and would understand it in her sense and not in an Auroran's. Very well, said the chairman. I'll grant her a bare minimum of good sense for a Solarian. Is that the one more subject you wanted to bring up? Yes, Mr. Chairman. In that case, it is totally irrelevant and can play no part in our deliberations. Mr. Chairman, there is one question I must still ask. One question. A dozen words, sir, and then I will be through. He said it as earnestly as he could, for everything depended on this. The chairman hesitated. Agreed. One last question. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Bailey would have liked to bark out the words, but he refrained. Nor did he raise his voice, nor did he even point his finger. Everything depended on this. Everything had led up to this, and yet he remembered Fastolf's warning and said it almost casually. How is it that Dr. Amadiro knew that Jander was Glodaya's husband? What? The chairman's white and bushy eyebrows raised themselves in surprise. Who said he knew anything of this? Asked a direct question, Bailey could continue. Ask him, Mr. Chairman. And he merely nodded in the direction of Amadiro, who had risen from his seat and was staring at Bailey in obvious horror. 79. Bailey said again, very softly, reluctant to draw attention away from Amadiro, Ask him, Mr. Chairman. He seems upset. The chairman said, What is this, Dr. Amadiro? Did you know anything about the robot as supposed husband of this Solarian woman? 
Amadiro stuttered, then pressed his lips together for a moment and tried again. The paleness which had struck him had vanished and was replaced by a dull flush. He said, I am caught by surprise at this meaningless accusation, Mr. Chairman. I do not know what it is all about. May I explain, Mr. Chairman, very briefly, said Bailey. Would he be cut off? You had better, said the chairman grimly. If you have any explanation, I would certainly like to hear it. Mr. Chairman, said Bailey, I had a conversation with Dr. Amadero yesterday afternoon. Because it was his intention to keep me until the storm broke, he spoke more lengthily than he intended and apparently more carelessly. In referring to Glodaya, he casually referred to the robot Jander as her husband. I am curious as to how he knew that fact. Is this true, Dr. Amadiro? asked the chairman. Amadiro was still standing, bearing almost the appearance of a prisoner before a judge. He said, Whether it is true or not has no bearing on the question under discussion. Perhaps not, said the chairman. But I was astonished at your reaction to the question when it was put. It occurs to me that there is a meaning to this that Mr. Bailey and you both understand and that I do not. I therefore want to understand also. Did you or did you not know of this impossible relationship between gender and the Solarian woman? Amadero said in a choking voice, I could not possibly have. That is no answer, said the chairman. That is an equivocation. You are making a judgment when I am asking you to hand me a memory. Did you or did you not make the statement imputed to you? Before he answers, said Bailey, feeling more certain of his ground now that the chairman was governed by moral outrage, it is only fair to Dr. Amadero for me to remind him that Giscard, a robot who was also present at the meeting, can, if asked to do so, repeat the entire conversation, word for word, using the voice and intonation of both parties. In short, the conversation is recorded. Amadero burst into a kind of rage. Mr. Chairman, the robot Giscard was designed, constructed, and programmed by Dr. Fastolf, who announces himself to be the best roboticist who exists and who is bitterly opposed to me. Can we trust a recording produced by such a robot? Bailey said, Perhaps you ought to hear the recording and come to your own decision, Mr. Chairman. Perhaps I ought, said the chairman. I am not here, Dr. Amadiro, to have my decisions made for me. But let us put that aside for a moment. Regardless of what the recording says, Dr. Amadiro, do you wish to state for the record that you did not know that the Salarian woman considered her robot to be her husband, and that you never refer to him as her husband? Please remember, as you both being legislators should, that although no robot is present, this entire conversation is being recorded in my own device. He tapped a small bulge at his breast pocket. Flatly then, Dr. Amadiro, yes or no? Amadiro said with an edge of desperation in his voice, Mr. Chairman, I honestly cannot remember what I said in casual conversation. If I did mention the word, and I don't admit I did, it may have been the result of some other casual conversation in which someone mentioned the fact that Gladiah acted as lovestruck toward her robot, as though he were her husband. The chairman said, And with whom did you have this other casual conversation? Who made this statement to you? At the moment, I cannot say. Bailey said, Mr. Chairman, if Dr. Amadero will be so kind as to list anyone and everyone who might have used the word to him, we can question every one of them to discover which one can remember making such a remark. Amadero said, I hope, Mr. Chairman, you will consider the effect on the morale of the Institute if anything of this sort is done. The chairman said, I hope you will consider it too, Dr. Amadero and come up with a better answer to our question so that we are not forced to extremes. One moment, Mr. Chairman, 
said Bailey as obsequiously as he could manage. There remains a question. Again? Another one? The chairman looked at Bailey without favor. What is it? Why is Dr. Amadero struggling so to avoid admitting he knew of Jander's relation to Glidaya? He says it is irrelevant. In that case, why not say he knew of the relationship and be done with it? I say it is relevant and that Dr. Amadero knows that his admission could be used to demonstrate criminal activity on his part. Amadero thundered. I resent the expression and I demand an apology. Fastolf smiled thinly and Bailey's lips pressed together grimly. He had forced Amadero over the edge. The chairman turned an almost alarming red and said with passion, You demand? You demand? To whom do you demand? I am the chairman. I hear all views before deciding what to suggest as best to be done. Let me hear what the Earthman has to say about his interpretation of your action. If he is slandering you, he shall be punished, you may be sure, and I will take the broadest view of the slander statutes too, you may be sure. But you, Amadiro, may make no demands upon me. Go on, Earthman. Say what you have to say, but be extraordinarily careful. Bailey said, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Actually, there is one Auroran to whom Glodaya did tell the secret of her relationship with Jander. The chairman interrupted. Well, who is that? Do not play your hyperwave tricks on me. Bailey said, I have no intention of anything but a straightforward statement, Mr. Chairman. The one Auroran is, of course, Jander himself. He may have been a robot, but he is an inhabitant of Aurora and might be viewed as an Auroran. Glodaya must surely, in her passion, have addressed him as my husband. Since Dr. Amadero has admitted he might possibly have heard from someone else some statement to the effect of Jander's husbandly relationship to Glodaya, isn't it logical to suppose that he heard of the matter from Jander? Would Dr. Amadero be willing, right now, to state for the record that he never spoke to Jander during the period when Jander formed part of Glodaya's staff. Twice Amadero's mouth opened as though he would speak. Twice he did not utter a sound. Well, said the chairman, did you speak to Jander during that period, Dr. Amadero? There was still no answer. Bailey said softly, if he did, it is entirely relevant to the matter at hand. I'm beginning to see that it must be Mr. Bailey. Well, Dr. Amadero, once again, yes or no? And Amadero burst forth. What evidence does this Earthman have against me in this matter? Does he have a recording of any conversations I have had with Jander? Does he have witnesses who are willing to say they have seen me with Jander? What does he have anything at all besides mere self-serving statements? The chairman turned to look at Bailey, and Bailey said, Mr. Chairman, if I have nothing at all, then Dr. Amadero should not hesitate to deny, for the record, any contact with Jander. But he does not do so. As it happens, in the course of my investigation, I spoke to Dr. Vasilia Eliana, the daughter of Dr. Fastolf. I spoke also to a young Aurora named Centirix Gramianus, in the recordings of both interviews, it will be plain that Dr. Vasilia encouraged Gramianus to pay court to Glodaya. You may question Dr. Vasilia as to her purpose in so doing and as to whether this course of action had been suggested to her by Dr. Amadiro. It also appears that it was Gramianus's custom to take long walks with Glodaya, which both enjoyed, and on which they were not accompanied by the robot Jander. You might check on this if you wish, sir. The chairman said dryly, I may do so, but if all is as you say, what does this show? Bailey said, I have stated that, failing Dr. Fastolf himself, the secret of the humaniform robot could be obtained only from Daniil. Before Jander's death, it could, with equal facility, have been obtained from Jander. Whereas Daniil was part of Dr. Fastolf's establishment and could not easily be reached, Jander was part of Glodaya's establishment, 
and she was not as sophisticated as Dr. Fastolf in seeing to a robot's protection. Isn't it likely that Dr. Amadiro took the occasion of Glodaya's periodic absences from her establishment, when she was walking with Graminus, to converse with Jander, perhaps by trimensional viewing, to study his responses, to subject him to various tests, and then to erase any sign of his visit with Jander, so that he could never inform Glodaya of it? It may be that he came close to finding what he wanted to know before the attempt ended when Jander went out of action. His concentration then shifted to Daniil. He felt, perhaps, that he had only a few tests and observations left to make, and so he set up the trap of yesterday evening, as I said earlier in my... my testimony. The chairman said, in what was almost a whisper, Now it all hangs together. I am almost forced to believe. Plus one final point, and then I will truly have nothing more to say, said Bailey. In his examination and testing of Jander, it is entirely possible that Dr. Amadero accidentally, and without any deliberate intention whatever, immobilized Jander and thus committed roboticide. And Amadero, maddened, shouted, No! Never! Nothing I did to that robot could possibly have immobilized him! Fastolf interposed. I agree. Mr. Chairman, I too think that Dr. Amadero did not immobilize Jander. However, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Amadero's statement just now would seem an implicit admission that he was working with Jander, and that Mr. Bailey's analysis of the situation is essentially accurate. The chairman nodded. I am forced to agree with you, Dr. Fastolf. Dr. Amadero, you may insist on a formal denial of all this, and that may force me into a full-fledged investigation, which could do you a great deal of damage, however it turned out. And I rather suspect at this stage it is likely to turn out to your great disadvantage. My suggestion is that you do not force this, that you do not cripple your own position in the legislature, and, perhaps, cripple Aurora's ability to continue along a smooth political course. As I see it, before the matter of Jander's immobilization came up, Dr. Fastolf had a majority of the legislators, not a large majority, admittedly, on his side in the matter of galactic settlement. You would have swung enough legislators to your side by pushing the matter of Dr. Fastolf's supposed responsibility for Jander's immobilization, and thus have gained the majority. But now Dr. Fastolf, if he wishes, can turn the tables by accusing you of the immobilization, and, moreover, of having tried to hang a false accusation upon your opponent as well, and you would lose. If I do not interfere, then it may be that you, Dr. Amadiro, and you, Dr. Fastolf, actuated by stubbornness or even vindictiveness, will both marshal your forces and accuse each other of all sorts of things. Our political forces and public opinion, too, will be hopelessly divided, even fragmented, to our infinite harm. I believe that, in that case, Fastolf's victory, while inevitable, would be a very costly one, so that it would be my task as the chairman to swing the votes in his direction to begin with, and to place pressure upon you and your faction, Dr. Amadiro, to accept Fastolf's victory with as much grace as you can manage, and to do it right now, for the good of Aurora. Fastolf said, I am not interested in a crushing victory, Mr. Chairman. I propose again a compromise whereby Aurora, the other spacer worlds, and Earth, too, all have the freedom of settlement in the galaxy. In return, I will be glad to join the Robotic Institute, put my knowledge of humaniform robots at its disposal, and thus facilitate Dr. Amadero's plan. In return for his solemn agreement to abandon all thought of retaliation against Earth at any time in the future, and to put this into treaty form, 
with ourselves and Earth as signatories. The chairman nodded. A wise and statesmanlike suggestion. May I have your acceptance of this, Dr. Amadero? Amadero now sat down. His face was a study in defeat. He said, I have not wanted personal power or the satisfaction of victory. I wanted what I know to be best for Aurora, and I am convinced that this plan of Dr. Fastolf's means an end to Aurora some day. However, I recognize that I am now helpless against the work of this Earthman. He shot a quick, venomous glance toward Bailey. And I am forced to accept Dr. Fastolf's suggestion, though I will ask for permission to address the legislature on the subject and to state, for the record, my fears of the consequences. We will, of course, allow that, said the chairman. And if you'll be guided by me, Dr. Fastolf, you'll get this Earthman off our world as fast as possible. He has won your viewpoint for you, but it will not be a very popular one if Aurorans have too long a time to brood over it as an earthly victory over Aurorans. You are quite right, Mr. Chairman, and Mr. Bailey will be gone quickly with my thanks, and I trust with yours as well. Well, said the chairman, not with the best of grace. Since his ingenuity has saved us from a bruising political battle, he has my thanks. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Chapter 19 Again Bailey 80 Bailey watched them leave from a distance. Though Amadero and the chairman had come together, they now left separately. Fastolf came back from seeing them off, making no attempt to hide his intense relief. Ah, Mr. Bailey, he said, you will have lunch with me, and then, as soon after that as possible, you will leave for Earth again. His robotic staff was clearly in action with that in mind. Bailey nodded and said sardonically, The chairman managed to thank me, but it seemed to stick in his throat. Fastolf said, You have no idea how you have been honored. The chairman rarely thanks anyone, but then no one ever thanks the chairman. It is always left to history to praise chairman, and this one has served for over 40 years. He has grown cranky and ill-tempered, as chairmen always do in their final decades. However, Mr. Bailey, once again I thank you, and through me Aurora will thank you. You will live to see Earthmen move outward into space, even in your short lifetime, and we will help you with our technology. How you have managed to untie this knot of ours, Mr. Bailey, in two and a half days, less, I can't imagine. You are a wonder. But come, you will want to wash and freshen up. I know I do. For the first time since the chairman arrived, Bailey had time to think of something besides his next sentence. He still didn't know what it was that had come to him three times, first on the point of sleep, then on the point of unconsciousness, and finally in post-coital relaxation. He was there first. It was still meaningless, yet he had made his point to the chairman and carried all before him without it. Could it have any meaning at all, then, if it was a part of a mechanism that didn't fit and didn't seem needed? Was it nonsense? It chafed at the corner of his mind, and he came to lunch a victor without the proper sensation of victory. Somehow, he felt as though he had missed the point. For one thing, would the chairman stick to his resolve? Amadero had lost the battle, but he didn't seem the kind of person who would give up altogether under any circumstances. Give him credit, and assume he meant what he said, that he was driven not by personal vainglory, but by his concept of Auroran patriotism, if that were so, he could not give up. Bailey felt it necessary to warn Fastolf. Dr. Fastolf, he said, I don't think it's over. Dr. Amadero will continue to fight to exclude Earth. Fastolf nodded as the dishes were served. I know he will. I expect him to. However, I have no fear as long as the matter of Jander's immobilization is set to rest. With that aside, I'm sure I can always outmaneuver him in the legislature. 
Fear not, Mr. Bailey. Earth will move along. Nor need you fear personal danger from a vengeful Amadero. You will be off this planet and on your way back to Earth before sunset. And Daniil will escort you, of course. What's more, the report we'll send with you will ensure once more a healthy promotion for you. I am eager to go, said Bailey. But I hope I will have time to say my goodbyes. I would like to... Uh, to see Glodaya once more, and I would like to say goodbye to Giscard, who may have saved my life last night. No question of that, Mr. Bailey. But please, eat, won't you? Bailey went through the motions of eating, but didn't enjoy it. Like the confrontation with the chairman and the victory that ensued, the food was oddly flavorless. He should not have won. The chairman should have cut him off. Amadero, if necessary, should have made a flat denial. It would have been accepted over the word or the reasoning of an earthman. But Fastolf was jubilant. He said, I had feared the worst, Mr. Bailey. I feared the meeting with the chairman was premature and that nothing you could say would help the situation. Yet you managed it so well. I was lost in admiration listening to you. At any moment I expected Amadero to demand that his word be taken against an earthman who, after all, was in a constant state of semi-madness at finding himself on a strange planet in the open. Bailey said frigidly, With all respect, Dr. Fastolf, I was not in a constant state of semi-madness. Last night was exceptional, but it was the only time I lost control. For the rest of my stay on Aurora I may have been uncomfortable from time to time, but I was always in my perfect mind. Some of the anger he had suppressed at considerable cost to himself in the confrontation with the chairman was expressing itself now. Only during the storm, sir, except, of course, recollecting, for a moment or two on the approaching spaceship, he was not conscious of the manner in which the thought, the memory, the interpretation, came to him, or at what speed. One moment it did not exist. The next moment... It was full-blown in his mind, as though it had been there all the time and needed only the bursting of a soap-bubble veil to show it. Gee, Hosafat, he said in an awed whisper. Then, with his fist coming down on the table and rattling the dishes, Gee, Hosafat! What is it, Mr. Bailey? asked Fastolf, startled. Bailey stared at him and heard the question only belatedly. Nothing, Dr. Fastolf. I was just thinking of Dr. Amadero's infernal gall and doing the damage to Jander and then laboring to fix the blame on you and arranging to have me go half mad in the storm last night and then using that as a way of casting doubt on my statements. I was just momentarily angry. Well, no need to be, Mr. Bailey. And actually, it is quite impossible for Amadero to have immobilized Jander. It remains purely a chance event. To be sure, it is possible that Amadero's investigation may have increased the odds of such a chance event taking place, but I would not argue the matter. Bailey heard the statement with half of one ear. What he had just said to Fastolf was fiction, and what Fastolf was saying didn't matter. It was, as the chairman would have said, irrelevant. In fact, everything that had happened, everything that Bailey had explained, was irrelevant but nothing had to be changed because of that, except one thing after a while. Gee, Josephat, he whispered in the silence of his mind and turned suddenly to the lunch, eating with gusto and with joy. 81. Once again, Bailey crossed the lawn between Fastolf's establishment and Glodaya's. He would be seeing Glodaya for the fourth time in three days, and his heart seemed to compress into a hard knot in his chest. Now for the last time. Giscard was with him, but at a distance, more intent than ever on the surroundings. Surely with the chairman in full possession of the facts, there should be a relaxation of any concern for Bailey's safety, if there ever had been any by rights, when it was Daniil who had been in danger. Presumably, Giscard had not yet been re-instructed in the matter. Only once did he approach Bailey, and that was when the latter called out, Giscard, where's Daniil? Swiftly, Giscard covered the ground between them, 
as though reluctant to speak in anything but a quiet tone. Daniel is on his way to the spaceport, sir, in the company of several others of the staff, in order to make arrangements for your transportation to Earth. When you are taken to the spaceport, he will meet you there and be on the ship with you, taking his final leave of you at Earth. Good news. I treasure every day of companionship with Daniel. And you, Giscard, uh, will you accompany us? No, sir. I am instructed to remain on Aurora. However, Daniel will serve you well, even in my absence. I am sure of that, Giscard, but I will miss you. Thank you, sir, said Giscard, and retreated as rapidly as he had come. Bailey gazed after him speculatively for a moment or so. No. First things first. He had to see Glidaya. 82. She advanced to greet him, and what a world of change had taken place in two days. She was not joyous, she was not dancing, she was not bubbling. There was still the grave look of one who had suffered a shock and a loss, but the troubled aura around her was gone. There was a kind of serenity now, as though she had grown aware of the fact that life continued after all, and might even, on occasion, be sweet. She managed a smile, warm and friendly, as she advanced to him and held out her hand. Oh, take it, take it, Elijah, she said when he hesitated. It's ridiculous for you to hang back and pretend you don't want to touch me after last night. You see, I still remember it, and I haven't come to regret it. Quite the contrary. Bailey performed the unusual operation, for him, of smiling in return. I remember it too, Gladiah, and I don't regret it either. I would even like to do it again, but I've come to say goodbye. A shade fell across her face. Then you'll be going back to Earth. Yet the report I got by way of the robot network that always operates between Fastolf's establishment and my own is that all went well. You can't have failed. I did not fail. Dr. Fastolf has, in fact, won completely. I don't believe there will be any suggestion at all that he was in any way involved in Jander's death. Because of what you had to say, Elijah. I believe so. I knew it. There was a tinge of self-satisfaction to that. I knew you would do it when I told them to get you on the case. But then why are you being sent home? Precisely because the case is solved. If I remain here longer, I will be a foreign irritant in the body politic, apparently. She looked at him dubiously for a moment and said, I'm not sure what you mean by that. It sounds like an earth expression to me, but never mind. Were you able to find out who killed Jander? That is the important part. Bailey looked around. Giscard was standing in one niche, one of Glodaya's robots in another. Glodaya interpreted the look without trouble. She said, Now, Elijah, you must learn to stop worrying about robots. You don't worry about the presence of the chair, do you? Or of these drapes? Bailey nodded. Well then, Glodaya, I'm sorry. I'm terribly sorry but I had to tell them of the fact that Jander was your husband. Her eyes opened wide, and he hastened on. I had to. It was essential to the case, but I promise it won't affect your status on Aurora. As briefly as he might, he summarized the events of the confrontation and concluded, So, you see, no one killed Jander. The immobilization was the result of a chance change in his positronic pathways, though the probabilities of that chance change may have been enhanced by what had been going on. And I never knew, she moaned. I never knew. I connived at this Amadero's foul plan, and he is the one responsible just as much as though he had deliberately hacked away at him with a sledgehammer. Gladaya, said Bailey earnestly. That is uncharitable. He had no intention of doing harm to Jander, and what he was doing was, in his own eyes, for the good of Aurora. As it is, he is punished. He is defeated. His plans are in shambles, and the Robotics Institute will come under the domination of Dr. Fastolf. 
you yourself could not work out a more suitable punishment, no matter how you tried. She said, I'll think about that. But what do I do with Santirix Grimianus, this good-looking young lackey whose job it was to lure me away? No wonder he appeared to cling to hope despite my repeated refusal. Well, he'll come here again and I will have the pleasure of... Bailey shook his head violently. Gladiah, no. I have interviewed him and I assure you he had no knowledge of what was going on. He was as much deceived as you were. In fact, you have it reversed. He was not persistent because it was important to lure you away. He was useful to Amadiro because he was so persistent. And that persistence was out of regard for you. Out of love, if the word means on Aurora what it means on Earth. On Aurora, it is choreography. Jander was a robot, and you are an Earthman. It is different with the Aurorans. So you have explained. But Gladiah... You learned from Jander to take. You learned from me, not that I meant it, to give. If you benefit by learning, is it not only right and fair that you should teach in your turn? Gramianus is sufficiently attracted to you to be willing to learn. He already defies a roaring convention by persisting in the face of your refusal. He will defy more. You can teach him to give and take and you will learn to do both in alternation or together, in company with him. Glodiah looked searchingly into his eyes. Elisha, are you trying to get rid of me? Slowly, Bailey nodded. Yes, Glodiah, I am. It's your happiness I want at this moment, more than I have ever wanted anything for myself or for Earth. I can't give you happiness, but if Grimianus can give it to you, I will be as happy, almost as happy, as if it were I myself who were making the gift. Gladiah, he may surprise you with how eagerly he will break through the choreography when you show him how, and the word will somehow spread so that others will come to swoon at your feet, and Grimianus may find it possible to teach other women Gladiah, it may be that you will revolutionize Aurora and sex before you are through. You will have three centuries in which to do so. Gladiah stared at him and then broke into a laugh. You are teasing. You are being deliberately foolish. I wouldn't have thought it of you, Elijah. You always look so long-faced and grave. Jehoshaphat. And with the last word... She tried to imitate his somber baritone. Bailey said, Perhaps I am teasing a little, but I mean it in essence. Promise me that you will give Grimianus his chance. She came closer to him, and without hesitation, he put his arm around her. She placed her finger on his lips, and he made a small kissing motion. She said softly, wouldn't you rather have me for yourself, Elijah? He said, just as softly, and unable to become unaware of the robots in the room. Yes, I would, Gladiah. I am ashamed to say that at this moment I would be content to have the earth fall to pieces if I could have you. But I can't. In a few hours I'll be off Aurora and there's no way you will be allowed to go with me nor do I think I will ever be allowed to come back to Aurora, nor is it possible that you will ever visit Earth. I will never see you again, Gladiah, but I will never forget you either. I will die in a few decades, and when I do, you will be as young as you are now. So we would have to say goodbye soon, whatever we could imagine is happening. She put her head against his chest. Oh, Elijah, twice you came into my life, each time for just a few hours. Twice you've done so much for me and then said goodbye. The first time all I could do was touch your face. But what a difference that made. The second time I did so much more and again what a difference that made. I'll never forget you, Elijah. 
if I live more centuries than I can count. Bailey said, Then let it not be the kind of memory that cuts you off from happiness. Accept Gramianus and make him happy. Let him make you happy as well. And remember, there is nothing to prevent you from sending me letters. The hyperpost between Aurora and Earth exists. I will, Elijah. And you will write to me as well. I will, Glidaya. Then there was silence, and reluctantly, they moved apart. She remained standing in the middle of the room, and when he went to the door and turned back, she was still standing there with a little smile. His lips shaped, Goodbye. And then, because there was no sound, he could not have done it with sound, he added, My love. And her lips moved too. Goodbye, my dearest love. And he turned and walked out, and knew he would never see her in tangible form, never touch her again. 83. It was a while before Elijah could bring himself to consider the task that still lay before him. He had walked in silence perhaps half the distance back to Fastolf's establishment before he stopped and lifted his arm. The observant Giscard was at his side in a moment. Bailey said, How much time before I must leave for the spaceport, Giscard? Three hours and ten minutes, sir. Bailey thought a moment. I would like to walk over to that tree there and sit down with my back against the trunk and spend some time there alone. With you, of course, but away from other human beings. In the open, sir? The robot's voice was unable to express surprise and shock, but somehow Bailey had the feeling that if Giscard were human, those words would express those feelings. Yes, said Bailey. I have to think, and... After last night, a calm day like this, sunny, cloudless, mild, scarcely seems dangerous. I'll go indoors if I get agoraphobic. I promise. So, will you join me? Yes, sir. Good. Bailey led the way. They reached the tree, and Bailey touched the trunk gingerly and then stared at his finger, which remained perfectly clean. Reassured that leaning against the trunk would not dirty him, he inspected the ground and then sat down carefully and rested his back against the tree. It was not nearly as comfortable as the back of a chair would have been, but there was a feeling of peace, oddly enough, that perhaps he would not have had inside a room. Giscard remained standing, and Bailey said, Won't you sit down too? I am as comfortable standing, sir. I know that, Giscard, but I will think better if I don't have to look up at you. I could not guard you against possible harm as sufficiently if I were seated, sir. I know that too, Giscard, but there is no reasonable danger at the moment. My mission is over. The case is solved. Dr. Fastolf's position is secure. You can risk being seated, and I order you to sit down. Giscard at once sat down, facing Bailey but his eyes continued to wander in this direction and that, and were ever alert. Bailey looked at the sky, through the leaves of the tree, green against blue, listened to the susurration of insects and to the sudden call of a bird, noted a disturbance of grass nearby that might have meant a small animal passing by, and again thought how oddly peaceful it all was and how different this peacefulness was from the clamor of the city. This was a quiet peace, an unhurried peace, a removed peace. For the first time, Bailey caught a faint suggestion of how it might be to prefer outside to the city. He caught himself being thankful to his experiences on Aurora, to the storm most of all, for he knew now that he would be able to leave Earth and face the conditions of whatever new world he might settle on, he and Ben, and perhaps Jesse. He said, Last night, in the darkness of the storm, 
I wondered if I might have seen Aurora's satellite were not for the clouds. It has a satellite, if I recall my reading correctly. Two, actually, sir. The larger is Tithonus, but it is still so small that it appears only as a moderately bright star. The smaller is not visible at all to the unaided eye and is simply called Tithonus II when it is referred to at all. Thank you. And thank you, Giscard, for rescuing me last night. He looked at the robot. I don't know the proper way of thanking you. It is not necessary to thank me at all. I was merely following the dictates of the first law. I had no choice in the matter. Nevertheless, I may even owe you my life, and it is important that you know I understand this. And now, Giscard, what ought I to do? Concerning what matter, sir? My mission is over. Dr. Fastolf's views are secure. Earth's future may be assured. It would seem I have nothing more to do, and yet there is the matter of gender. I do not understand, sir. Well, it seems settled that he died by a chance shift of positronic potential in his brain. But Fastolf admits the chance of that is infinitesimally small. Even with Amadiro's activities, the chance, though possibly greater, would remain infinitesimally small. At least, so Fastolf thinks. It continues to seem to me, then, that Jander's death was one of deliberate roboticide. Yet I don't dare raise this point now. I don't want to unsettle matters that have been brought to such a satisfactory conclusion. I don't want to put Fastolf in jeopardy again. I don't want to make Glodaya unhappy. I don't know what to do. I can't talk to a human being about this, so I'm talking to you, Giscard. Yes, sir. I can always order you to erase whatever I have said and to remember it no more. Yes, sir. In your opinion, what ought I to do? Giscard said, If there is a roboticide, sir, there must be someone capable of committing the act. Only Dr. Fastolf is capable of committing it, and he says he did not do it. Yes, we started with that situation. I believe Dr. Fastolf, and am quite certain he did not do it. Then how could there have been a roboticide, sir? Suppose that someone else knew as much about robots as Dr. Fastolf does, Giscard. Bailey drew up his knees and clasped his hands around them. He did not look at Giscard and seemed lost in thought. Who might that be, sir? asked Giscard. And finally, Bailey reached the crucial point. He said, You, Giscard. 84. If Giscard had been human, he might have simply stared, silent and stunned, or he might have raged angrily, or shrunk back in terror, or had any of a dozen responses. Because he was a robot, he showed no sign of any emotion whatever and simply said, Why do you say so, sir? Bailey said, I am quite certain, Giscard, that you know exactly how I have come to this conclusion, but you will do me a favor if you allow me in this quiet place and in this bit of time before I must leave, to explain the matter for my own benefit. I would like to hear myself talk about it, and I would like you to correct me where I am wrong. By all means, sir. I suppose my initial mistake was to suppose that you are a less complicated and more primitive robot than Daniil is, simply because you look less human. A human being will always suppose that the more human a robot is, the more advanced, complicated, and intelligent he will be. To be sure, a robot like you is easily designed, and one like Daniil is a great problem for men like Amadiro and can be handled only by a robotics genius such as Fastolf. However, the difficulty in designing Daniil lies, I suspect, in reproducing all the human aspects, such as facial expression, intonation of voice, gestures and movements that are extraordinarily intricate but have nothing really to do with complexity of mind. Am I right? Quite right, sir. So I automatically underestimated you, as does everyone. Yet you gave yourself away even before we landed on Aurora. You remember, perhaps, that during the landing I was overcome by an agoraphobic spasm and was for a moment 
even more helpless than I was last night in the storm. I do, sir. At the time, Daniil was in the cabin with me, while you were outside the door. I was falling into a kind of catatonic state, noiselessly, and he was, perhaps, not looking at me, and so knew nothing of it. You were outside the cabin, and yet it was you who dashed in and turned off the viewer I was holding. You got there first, ahead of Daniil, though his reflexes are as fast as yours, I'm sure, as he demonstrated when he prevented Dr. Fastolf from striking me. Surely it cannot be that Dr. Fastolf was striking you. He wasn't. He was merely demonstrating Daniil's reflexes. And yet, as I say, in the cabin, you got there first. I was scarcely in condition to observe that fact, but I have been trained to observe, and I am not put entirely out of action, even by agoraphobic terror, as I showed last night. I did notice you were there first, though I tended to forget the fact. There is, of course, only one logical solution. Bailey paused, as though expecting Giscard to agree, but the robot said nothing. In later years, this was what Bailey pictured first when thinking of his stay on Aurora. Not the storm, not even Glidaya. It was, rather, the quiet time under the tree, with the green leaves against the blue sky, the mild breeze, the soft sound of animals, and Giscard opposite him, with faintly glowing eyes. Bailey said, It would seem that you could somehow detect my state of mind, and even through the closed door, tell that I was having a seizure of some sort. Or, to put it briefly, and perhaps simplistically, you can read minds. Yes, sir, said Giscard quietly. And you can somehow influence minds, too. I believe you noted that I had detected this and you obscured it in my mind so that I somehow did not remember or did not see the significance if I did casually recall the situation. Yet you did not do that entirely efficiently, perhaps because your powers are limited. Giscard said, Sir, the first law is paramount. I had to come to your rescue although I quite realized that would give me away, and I had to obscure your mind minimally in order not to damage it in any way. Bailey nodded. You have your difficulties, I see. Obscured minimally. So I did remember it when my mind was sufficiently relaxed and could think by free association. Just before I lost consciousness in the storm, I knew you would find me first, as you had on the ship, you may have found me by infrared radiation, but every mammal and bird was radiating as well, and that might be confusing. But you could also detect mental activity, even if I were unconscious, and that would help you to find me. It certainly helped, said Giscard. When I did remember, close to sleep or unconsciousness, I would forget again when fully conscious. Last night, however, I remembered for the third time, and I was not alone— Glodaya was with me and could repeat what I had said, which was, he was there first. And even then I could not remember the meaning until a chance remark of Dr. Fastolf's led to a thought that worked its way past the obscuration. Then, once it dawned on me, I remembered other things. Thus, when I was wondering if I were really landing on Aurora, you assured me that our destination was Aurora before I actually asked. I presume you allow no one to know of your mind-reading ability. That is true, sir. Why is that? My mind-reading gives me a unique ability to obey the first law, sir, so I value its existence. I can prevent harm to human beings far more efficiently. It seemed to me, however, that neither Dr. Fastolf nor any other human being would long tolerate a mind-reading robot, so I keep the ability secret. Dr. Fastolf loves to tell the legend of the mind-reading robot who was destroyed by Seuss and Calvin, and I would not want him to duplicate Dr. Calvin's feet. Yes, he told the legend to me. I suspect that he knows, subliminally, that you read minds, or he wouldn't harp on the legend so. And it is dangerous for him to do so, as far as you are concerned, I should think. Certainly it helped put the matter in my mind. 
I do what I can to neutralize the danger without unduly tampering with Dr. Fastolf's mind. Dr. Fastolf invariably stresses the legendary and impossible nature of the story when he tells it. Yes, I remember that too. But if Fastolf does not know you can read minds, it must be that you were not designed originally with these powers. How then do you come to have them? No, don't tell me, Giscard. Let me suggest something. Miss Vassilia was particularly fascinated with you when she was a young woman first becoming interested in robotics. She told me that she had experimented by programming you under Fastolf's distant supervision. Could it be that, at one time, quite by accident, she did something that gave you the power? Is that correct? That is correct, sir. And do you know what that something is? Yes, sir. Are you the only mind-reading robot that exists? So far, yes, sir. There will be others. If I asked you what it was that Dr. Vassilia did to you to give you such powers, or if Dr. Fastolf did, would you tell us by virtue of the second law? No, sir, for it is my judgment that it would do you harm to know, and my refusal to tell you under the first law would take precedence. The problem would not arise, however, for I would know that someone was going to ask the question and give the order, and I would remove the impulse to do so from the mind before it could be done. Yes, said Bailey. Evening before last, as we were walking from Gladias to Fastolf's, I asked Daniil if he had had any contact with Jander during the latter's stay with Gladia, and he answered quite simply that he had not. I then turned to ask you the same question, and... Somehow I never did. You quashed the impulse for me to do so, I take it. Yes, sir. Because if I had asked, you would have had to say that you knew him well at that time, and you were not prepared to have me know that. I was not, sir. But during this period of contact with Jander, you knew he was being tested by Amadiro because, I presume, you could read Jander's mind or detect his positronic potentials. Yes, sir. The same ability covers both robotic and human mental activity. Robots are far easier to understand. You disapproved of Amadiro's activities because you agreed with Fastolf on the matter of settling the galaxy. Yes, sir. Why did you not stop Amadiro? Why did you not remove from his mind the impulse to test Jander? Giscard said, Sir, I do not lightly tamper with minds. Amadiro's resolve was so deep and complex that, to remove it, I would have had to do much, and his mind is an advanced and important one that I would be reluctant to damage. I let the matter continue for a great while, during which I pondered on which action would best fulfill my first law needs. Finally, I decided on the proper manner to correct the situation. It was not an easy decision." You decided to immobilize Jander before Amadiro could work out the method for designing a true humaniform robot. You knew how to do so, since you had, over the years, gained a perfect understanding of Fastolf's theories from Fastolf's mind. Is that right? Exactly, sir. So that Fastolf was not the only one, after all, expert enough to immobilize Jander. In a sense, he was, sir. My own ability is merely the reflection or the extension of his. But it will do. Did you not see that this immobilization would place Fastolf in great danger, that he would be the natural suspect? Did you plan on admitting your action and revealing your abilities if that were necessary to save him? Giscard said, I did indeed see that Dr. Fastolf would be in a painful situation, but I did not intend to admit my guilt. I had hoped to utilize the situation as a wedge for getting you to Aurora. Getting me here? Was that your idea? Bailey felt rather stupefied. Yes, sir. With your permission, I would like to explain. Bailey said, Please do. Giscard said, I knew of you from Miss Gladia and from Dr. Fastolf, not only from what they said, but from what was in their minds. I learned of the situation on Earth, Earthmen, it was clear, live behind walls, which they find difficult to escape from. But it was just as clear to me that Aurorans live behind walls, too. 
Aurorans live behind walls made of robots who shield them from all the vicissitudes of life, and who, in Amadiro's plans, would build up shielded societies to wall up Aurorans settling new worlds. Aurorans also live behind walls made up of their own extended lives, which forces them to overvalue individuality and keeps them from pooling their scientific resources. Nor do they indulge in the rough and tumble of controversy, but, through their chairman, demand a short-circuiting of all uncertainty and that decisions on solutions be reached before problems are aired. They could not be bothered with actually thrashing out best solutions. What they wanted were quiet solutions. The Earthman's walls are crude and literal, so that their existence is obtrusive and obvious, and there are always some who long to escape. The Aurorans' walls are immaterial and aren't even seen as walls, so that none can even conceive of escaping. It seemed to me then that it must be Earthmen and not Aurorans or any other spacers who must settle the galaxy and establish what will someday become a galactic empire. All this was Dr. Fastolf's reasoning, and I agreed with it. Dr. Fastolf was, however, satisfied with the reasoning, while I, given my own abilities, could not be. I had to examine the mind of at least one Earthman directly, in order that I might check my conclusions, and you were the Earthman I thought I could bring to Aurora. The immobilization of gender served both to stop Amadiro and to be the occasion for your visit. I pushed Miss Glodaya very slightly to have her suggest your coming to Dr. Fastolf. I pushed him in turn, very slightly, to have him suggest it to the chairman, and I pushed the chairman, very slightly, to have him agree. Once you arrived, I studied you and was pleased with what I found. Giscard stopped speaking and became robotically impassive again. Bailey frowned. It occurs to me that I have earned no credit in what I have done here. You must have seen to it that I found my way to the truth. No, sir. On the contrary, I placed barriers in your way. Reasonable ones, of course. I refused to let you recognize my abilities, even though I was forced to give myself away. I made sure that you felt dejection and despair at odd times. I encouraged you to risk the open in order to study your responses yet you found your way through and over all these obstacles, and I was pleased. I found that you longed for the walls of your city, but recognized that you must learn to do without them. I found that you suffered from the view of Aurora from space and from your exposure to the storm, but that neither prevented you from thinking nor drove you from your problem. I found that you accept your shortcomings and your brief life, and that you do not dodge controversy. Bailey said, How do you know I am representative of Earth people generally? I know you are not, but from your mind, I know that there are some like you, and we will build with those. I will see to it, and now that I know clearly the path that must be followed, I will prepare other robots like myself, and they will see to it too. Bailey said suddenly, You mean that mind-reading robots will come to Earth? No. I do not, and you are right to be alarmed. Involving robots directly will mean the construction of the very walls that are dooming Aurora and the spacer worlds to paralysis. Earthmen will have to settle the galaxy without robots of any kind. It will mean difficulties, dangers, and harm without measure, events that robots would labor to prevent if they were present. But in the end, human beings will be better off for having worked on their own, and perhaps someday some long-away day in the future. Robots can intervene once more. Who can tell? Bailey said curiously, Do you see the future? No, sir. But studying minds as I do, I can tell dimly that there are laws that govern human behavior as the three laws of robotics govern robotic behavior. And with these it may be that the future will be dealt with after a fashion some day. The human laws are far more complicated than the laws of robotics are, and I do not have any idea as to how they may be organized. They may be statistical in nature, so that they might not be fruitfully expressed except when dealing with huge populations. They may be very loosely binding, so that they might not make sense 
unless those huge populations are unaware of the operation of those laws. Tell me, Giscard, is this what Dr. Fastolf refers to as the future science of psychohistory? Yes, sir. I have gently inserted it into his mind in order that the process of working it out begin. It will be needed some day, now that the existence of the spacer worlds as a long-lived roboticized culture is coming to an end and a new wave of human expansion by short-lived human beings without robots will be beginning. And now... Giscard rose to his feet. I think, sir, that we must go to Dr. Fastolf's establishment and prepare for your leave-taking. All that we have said here will not be repeated, of course. It is strictly confidential, I assure you, said Bailey. Indeed, said Giscard calmly. But you need not fear the responsibility of having to remain silent. I will allow you to remember but you will never have the urge to repeat the matter, not the slightest. Bailey lifted his eyebrows in resignation over that and said, One thing, though, Giscard, before you clamp down on me, will you see to it that Gladiah is not disturbed on this planet, that she is not treated unkindly because she is a Solarian and has accepted a robot as her husband, and, and that she will accept the offers of Gramianus? I heard your final conversation with Miss Gladiah, sir, and I understand. It will be taken care of. Now, sir, may I take my leave of you while no other is watching? Giscard thrust out his hand in the most human gesture Bailey had ever seen him make. Bailey took it. The fingers were hard and cool in his grip. Goodbye, friend Giscard. Giscard said, Goodbye, friend Elijah. And remember that, although people apply the phrase to Aurora, it is, from this point on, Earth itself that is the true world of the dawn. This concludes The Robots of Dawn by Isaac Asimov.